Okay, so good morning, everybody. We are uh, beginning our uh, session of the last day. Uh, uh, so today we have here Gilles Marnas. Uh, Gilles Marnas is a professor at the University of Poitiers. Uh, he has written on uh, Hegel extensively, uh, most recently, Le Négatif au Travail, Hegel et la raison en devenir. Uh, and he's going to speak on Hegel on substance. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Gregor, for your uh, introduction. And I, I would like to thank warmly uh, all the organizers of this uh, conference, which is for me as, uh, as uh, pleasant as it is uh, instructive. Uh, and uh, the problem is that uh, uh, from the beginning of the conference, um, um, probably all the important things on the couple uh, Spinoza, Hegel, and the couple uh, substance subject was already said and very well said on how not to repeat. So I will only add a few uh, silly and undefensible uh, assumptions. So it will be my, my task <laughs> this, uh, this morning. Um, so, I, I would say that in introduction that uh, uh, the notion of substance, so often used in a Hegelian discourse, does not actually make a really good impression. In its opposition to subjectivity, it appears as a moment of contradiction, that of the unresolved conflict between unconditionality and relativity. However, the situation in no way diminishes the richness and interest of the concept of substance, which is a necessary step on the road to reconciliation. Here, moreover, it is partly through the notion of substance that Hegel comments on his relationship to the metaphysical tradition, especially to Spinoza, and specifies in what sense he intends both to preserve and to go beyond Spinozism. One of the features of Hegelianism, as we know, is that it does not simply expel the concepts it criticizes. Its relationship to substance is neither simply hostile nor simply condescending. Rather, Hegel seeks the originality of his own thought, and in particular of the concept of subjectivity, by situating it in relation to the inescapable otherness of substance. The question, in my view, is on the one hand, what kind of reality substance denotes, and in particular, how it differs in Hegel from related terms such as thing, phenomenon, or cause, etc., and on the other hand, what specific complaints Hegel has about it. My hypothesis, very simple, will be as follows. Substance denotes a moment of objectivity. It corresponds to that which possesses a constituted identity and has a power over its environment. At the same time, however, since it is not determined by an internal goal, it is not free, so that its relation to the otherness is inadequate. My talk will focus on three, quest three main questions. First, in the most general terms, what distinguishes substance from immediacy and subjectivity? Secondly, what does substance mean in the internal economy of the doctrine of essence? Thirdly, and necessary very quickly, what is Hegel's position or, re or originality in relation to his predecessors? So, first part of my talk, substance versus immediacy and subjectivity. The, I would say that the meaning of substance in Hegel's writings is multifaceted, depending on the place and systematical context in which the term appears. This is not a specific situation since in Hegel, the terms that structure systematic discourse must be understood in each of their uses from the point of view of the moment 
to which they belong. Substance, then, can be understood more or less broadly. In the least specific sense, it is synonymous with true reality in general. Then, in a more precise sense, I would say that it denotes objective and relative reality as opposed, on the one hand, to immediacy, and on the other hand, to subjectivity. And that is because in the science of logic, substantiality, substantiality comes under the doctrine of essence and not under the doctrine of being or the doctrine of concept. Finally, and finally, if we narrow the field of observation even further within actuality, Wirklichkeit, as the third section of the doctrine of essence, the relation of substan substantiality is opposed to the relation of causality and the relation of, recipro of reciprocal action. And so in the first part of my paper, I propose to consider the first two uses of the term. First, so in order to consider a first use, substance as true reality, let us read a well-known quotation from the autograph introduction to the lessons on the philosophy of history. You have normally a handout. Uh, I read, by the speculative knowledge, it's proved that reason is the substance as the infinite power, itself the infinite stuff of all natural and spiritual life, as the infinite form, the activity of this, its content. It is the substance, namely that, by which and in which all reality has its being and existence. So there, there's no need to go into a detailed ex the exegesis of this statement. But what is interesting for my purpose is that here, the notion of substance is taken as equivalent to true reality, the reality that philosophy as such, if we follow, for example, Plato and Aristotle, sets out to identify and bring to light. Substance here is what gives actual reality its being and subsistence, in short, its objectivity. It is what makes the real not an, appear, not an appearance of reality, not something either superficial or merely constructed by the observer. And uh, secondly, so in order uh, to consider a second use, substance as finite objectivity, let's turn to one of the best known quotations about the concept of substance found at the beginning of the preface to the phenomenology. The interest of this quotation lies in the extremely general nature of its use of the term, which here is not related, in my view, to any particular moment of the system of science. I, I read, according, to, that's very, very null, of course, according to my insight, which only has to be justified by the presentation of the system itself, everything depends on understanding and expressing the true, not as substance, but just as much as subject. The living substance is furthermore the being, which is real in truth only insofar as it is the movement of putting oneself together or the mediation of becoming different with oneself, not an original unity as such or immediate as such is the truth. So these, uh, these formulations are very difficult to understand, but I would, see, I would say that this passage presents three concepts that, in a certain, way, in a certain sense, negate each other. At the first extreme, immediacy, which can be understood, in my view, as what is unexplained and unfounded. At the other extreme, subjectivity, which can be understood, in my view, as that which is self-determining self and self-legitimating, that which has a free relationship with itself and otherness. 
and finally substance, which is posited as the second moment of the cycle and which we must define. So what then does this median position of substance imply for Hegel? Let us consider a quote from the Nuremberg period, uh, quotation three, active substance as originary being turns against the contingent as other and is the cause that operates on the other. So a, a very simple formulation, but which must be explored. Here we see that substance refers to otherness and more precisely to accidentality here, the contingent as other uh, uh, in the quote. This, this, does not, this does not necessarily mean that otherness is really external to substance. Accidentality can be an internal aspect of substance. But in this conception we see emerging, substance is not completely unified. Moreover, substance exerts an action on otherness, it is an operative cause. Substance is thus power. But the otherness to which substance refers is not free. According to the quote, it is contingent. In a word, it is reduced to a simple instrument of substance. Between substance and its accidentality, I would say there is no relationship of integration and recognition, substance does not relate to otherness as to itself, and this is the abstraction of the substance. Finally, we saw in this first part of my talk two meanings of the substance. First, the substance as true reality in general, and secondly, the substance as a finite reality with which differs from simple immediacy as well as from subjectivity in the sense that it has a power, uh, it has um, a relation to otherness, but to an other which is not itself. And so at now I go to the second part of my, of my talk, substance in the doctrine of essence. And this is the part which, which be, which will be the, the, the most long of my talk. So uh, I now would propose to highlight the originality of substance in the precise sense that it acquires as a moment in the doctrine of essence. As we know, sub substance or substantiality is more specifically included in actuality, Wirklichkeit. But in it, it is only one moment among others. In my view, this means that substance as a logical category expresses the general features of actuality, once again in the sense of the doctrine of essence, but also specifies it. This gives rise to at least two tasks for the commentator. First, to identify the global determinations of Wirklichkeit and in particular what distinguishes it from the other great moments of the doctrine of essence. Thus, if we follow the plan of the logic of encyclopedia to understand the opposition of Wirklichkeit to essence as ground of existence and to appearance. Secondly, to understand what in the context of Wirklichkeit substance opposes to the other internal specifications of Wirklichkeit. In the logic of Encyclopedia, Hegel, as we know, contrasts the relationship of substantiality with the relationship of causality and the relationship of reciprocal action. It is this distinction that we must grasp. Given the extraordinary richness and complexity of Hegel's text, my analysis can only be rudimentary. So, so I will make some choices and uh, uh, a global, simply global interpretation. My aim is to identify the main distinctions that give a positive and precise meaning and determinate meaning 
to the relation of substantia substantiality. So let's begin by grasping the general characteristics of Wirklichkeit and thus what contrasts it with the first two spheres of the doctrine of essence. As an epinome of essence as ground of existence, I will consider its final moment, the thing. Let's examine the concept of thing as it appears in the encyclopedia logic. In my view, there is namely much to be learned from considering the distinction between thing and substance. In the systematic development of the, of the text, as we know, the thing is successively defined as a carrier of properties, as a compound of matters, and finally, as matter endowed with form. But what is the problem with the thing? What is its deficiency in the economy, in the economy of doctrine of essence? I would say that in, that in all three cases, um, the science of logic text examines the thing as an isolated entity. This is the point. It is namely not a thing in relation to its environment to anything other than itself. On the contrary, I would say, the thing as such focuses on itself, i.e. on its properties, materials, and forms. So, while it gives an account of its determinations in the sense that it presents an essence that is expressed in them, it is indifferent to the exterior, not influenced by it, but also unable of acting over the exterior. In this sense, from the point of view of the overall economy of the doctrine of essence, the thing as such is abstractly immediate. Let's now consider the second part uh, of the doctrine of essence, the, phenomen, the phenomenon or appearance in German, the Erscheinung. What we need to understand here is not just the phenomenon itself, but the relationship between the in itself and the phenomenon. A useful formulation for understanding this relationship, I would say, is found in an edition of the Encyclopedia, quote eight, the hereby set apparition does not stand on its own feet and has its being not in itself but in another. So, in the previous moment, uh, we were dealing with the mediation of the thing by itself, which accounting for its inner determinations. From now on, the mediating relationship associates a mediating term with a multiplicity of mediated terms that are external to it. The mediating term, the in itself, open itself up to the real multiplicity, exerts its power of determination over this multiplicity and is in turn influenced by it. Unfortunately, in the sphere of appearance, the mediating principle alone is not sufficient to account for what is mediated. It is not a sufficient cause. So the, interve so the intervention of something other and or favorable circumstances are required for it to act. An extra logical example given by Hegel in an edition is that of a magnetic force exerting effects on iron, but this precisely insofar as it is solicited by it. Finally, let's turn to the third and final moment uh, of, uh, of the doctrine of essence, Wirklichkeit. In what way, is wirkli in what way Wirklichkeit does Wirklichkeit escape from the inadequacies encountered in the thing and in the appearance? And what is the specificity of substance or substantiality within Wirklichkeit in general? Regarding the first point, the general features of Wirklichkeit, we can say that, I would say that reality is Wirklich when the mediating term 
uh, in Hegel's vocabulary, this Zara is not just a mediation on its own behalf, but also for the objectivity in the sense of the plurality of external things. What's more, the Zara acts by itself. It does not need an external solicitation of favorable conditions and thus reveals itself fully in its activity. So, so it is the way I, I read paragraph 142, which is extremely important and of course very difficult to, to interpret. Actuality, Wirklichkeit, is the unity of essence and existence, or of what is inner and what is outer, by the utterance of the actual, the actual itself, so that the actual remind still something essential in this utterance, manifestation, yeah, manifestation would be better, perhaps, and is only something essential so far as it is in immediate external existence. The Wirkliche does not remind confined within itself, but external, externalizes itself. It objectifies itself by producing itself as an external existence that acts on its environment. This is, it seems to me, the difference between the thing and the Wirkliche. Moreover, unlike appearance, the mediating term, the Zara in Wirklichkeit, acts spontaneously and efficiently on its environment. The, the science of logic in the section of Wirklichkeit gives the example of light. I read quotation 10. The light of nature is neither something nor a thing, for its being is, is only its appearing, so manifestation is absolute actuality equal to itself. In other words, I comment, light unfolds of its own accord, irresistibly illuminating its external environment and is therefore neither an abstract thing nor an abstract appearance. What more precise analysis of Wirklichkeit does Hegel propose? Consider paragraphs 147, 149 of the Encyclopedia, which provide a rich analysis of the processes of Wirklichkeit as the relation of the Sache, as the thing in question, its conditions and its activity. And surprisingly, Hegel insists on the dis dissociation of the moment of effectivity. While paragraph 142 has something almost triumphant, emphasizing the superiority of Wirklichkeit over earlier moments in the doctrine of essence, paragraphs 147, 149 instead show that the moment of Wirklichkeit remain split. Quotation 11, the matter, Sache, is the whole in simple determinancy. But since the whole is external to itself in its form, it is also inwardly and in its content exter external to itself. And this externality belonging to the matter, Zara, is the restriction of its content. So I would say that the power, but also the deficiency of Wirklichkeit is in fact expressed by the notion of necessity in what distinguishes from freedom. Of course, what is necessary, according to Hegel, is internally mediated and therefore non-contingent. But necessity refers to dispersed and contingent circumstances, whereas free goal-directed activity of subjectivity takes place whatever the circumstances, necessary activity produces different results depending on the circumstances. And paragraph 100, 147 
emphasizes the finitude of necessity. Quotation 12, the concept of necessity is very difficult, precisely because it is the concept itself, but as inwardly broken forms and in passage. What is Wirklich has a defined it identity in itself, but also defines itself in opposition to what it is not, namely its condition. It is thus characterized by the contradiction, I would say, of identity and non-identity. Moreover, it acts spontaneously and effectively, but need nevertheless a condition to act. It is thus characterized by the contradiction of independence and dependence. Thirdly, while what is wirklich manifests itself in its activity, it is the condition that immediately appears. It is as, uh, Wirklichkeit is as characterized by the contradiction of the manifestation of self and the manifestation of another. Finally, the finitude of the process of Wirklichkeit lies in the fact that the Zara does not maintain a relationship of identification, but on the contrary, of opposition with otherness. So let, let us now turn uh, to the second task of my second part, the second task, understanding what in the economy of Wirklichkeit distinguishes the relationship of substantiality from the relationship of causality and the relationship of reciprocal action. This is where the question arises as to what connection can be found between the analysis of substantiality in the doctrine of essence and the Spinozist conception of substance, or rather, with Hegel's understanding of the Spinozist conception of substance. If we read the doctrine of essence in the logic of 1813, it is the moment, uh, as we said uh, uh, yesterday, the moment of the, uh, and, and on, on the, yes, and on, uh, sorry, <laughs> it is the moment of the absolute, i.e. before the relationship of substantiality that is accompanied by remarks on Spinoza. It could therefore be argued that it is the absolute and not the relationship of substantiality that refers to Spinozism. It could moreover be argued that Hegel's relation of uh, substantiality should be interpreted primarily in relation to the categories, to the category of substantiality as it, as it appears along with the categories of causality and reciprocal action in the transcendental analytic of the critic of pure reason. We must also add that in Hegel's analysis, substance is related to its accidents and not to its modes, which does not correspond to Spinoza's uh, vocabulary. To this, however, it will be objected that paragraph 151 in the moment of the uh, relation of substantiality in the encyclopedia is a combine in Leopold von Henning's edition of the philosophy of spirit by an addition that deals with Spinoza and that von Henning's choice seems legitimized by the fact that in the critical editions of the lessons on logic by Minor, um, Udo Ramal and Hans Christian Lucas, we do indeed read developments on Spinoza in connection with paragraph 151, or in connection with its equivalent in the 1817 edition of the Encyclopedia, paragraph 98. In the final analysis then, it seems to me legitimate to consider that Hegel conceived a, a at least partly the relation of substantiality uh, as linked to the Spinoza's conception of substance. Let's now return to reading the specificities of the relation of substantiality. Um, so uh, if we compare it with the relation of causality and the relation of reciprocal action. 
in the first place, we can say that substance as such is indeterminate. A cause, from a Hegelian point of view, has a determinate and exclusive nature. Rain is moistening but not coloring. Uh, for example, a pigment is coloring but not moistening, etc. In contrast, substantiality in itself is not determined. It has no distinctive content. Hegel refers to it as indeterminate equality with itself. Secondly, substantiality is not produced as such. This is what distinguishes the relation of substantiality from uh, the relation of reciprocal action. Substantiality, in a sense, is always already there. It is not a result, but a pure point of departure. This is, in my view, one of, this is one of the sources of Hegel's criticisms of Spinozism, namely that ethics treats substance as an absolute which is immediate and presented in an accepted definition, i.e. not in a founded proposition. Five minutes? Ten maximum. Okay. Really? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, uh, okay, so, so I, I will go to, to the end of the second part and uh, I will perhaps uh, sacrifice the third part. I'm sorry. I, I tried to... to <laughs> okay. So the fact that substance is a starting point and not a result can be associated with another of Hegel's criticisms of Spinozism, namely that ethics present an absolute which as substance is characterized by fixity, Starheit. Thirdly, the otherness to which substance relates, namely accidentality, although external, is superficial. It has only a phenomenal reality and is incapable of resisting the action of substance, nor do accidents have a power over each other. Hegel reads this point also in Spinoza's doctrine. Finally, substance acts on accidentality in the mode of power exerting an alternative, creative, and destructive effect. So, quotation 17, it is, a, it is an addition, the substance manifests itself through the actuality with its content into which it translates the possible as creating through the possibility into which it returns the actual as destroying power. So, and here we can make a link with uh, Spinozism. Um, um, the, the analysis of substance as a moment of Wirklichkeit in the doctrine of essence combines, I would say, the theme of Spinoza's God, whose power is his very essence, with the th theme of the God of the Hebrew religion, who creates the world and in the episode of the flood shows himself capable of destroying it. And we, we had yesterday an episode of flood. Substantiality expresses itself in the accidents to the point of removing all autonomy from them. It has a relationship of power, but I would say ultimately a relation of violence to accidents, whereas causality and reciprocal action produce determinate effects, substance deprives accidents of consistency. Moreover, the analysis of substance is marked not only by, let's say, Spinozist and biblical themes, but also by ori oriental ones. This is not incoherent if we remember that for Hegel, Judaism belongs to the Oriental world. As it well known, the lessons on the philosophy of history begin with the Eastern spirit, with its both rigid and in which all finitude vanishes. The Oriental spirit is a quotation, the one into which everything goes to disappear, but from, but from which nothing comes out. Ultimately, substance designates an entity that intervenes 
in an efficient way in the world and manifest itself fully in its action. But it is presupposed, indeterminate, and acts only formally on an accidental exteriority. As such, substantiality in the strict sense cannot be the last word in the doctrine of essence. There's a paradox here. While substance is in some way the banner of objectivity, it is far from the conclusive position of the doctrine of essence. So Hegel's attitude towards it is clearly marked by ambivalence, as is what uh, uh, very much said already. How then, so, so and it, it, it is the, the, uh, the end of my second part. How time do I have now? now? the discussion into the break this, this is our first talk today maybe a little bit five five or ten minutes so, so I, I must go to to the conclusion yes please yes <laughs> <laughs> it is very difficult for me but <laughs> no it's not a problem it's not a problem uh, I would like simply to consider a little bit Ari, uh, Hegel's conception of substance with the Aristotle Aristotle Swan and a Kantian one, and at least with a sp the Spinozist one. Not a problem. I go to the conclusion. I would say that the critical analysis of substance shows that Hegelianism is part of the Copernican revolution as it highlights the subordination of the thing to the self. And it is, of course, the passage from substance to subject. More precisely, Hegelian doctrine inherits Fichte's opposition between dogmatism and critical idealism. Fichte, as we know, denounces dogmatism, dogmatism, which explains experience on the basis of the not ego and turns it into a thing and identifies this, and uh, Fichte identifies this dogmatic realism with Spinozism. For Fichte, then, substantialism is the adversary par excellence. The same theme is found, in my view, in Hegel's assertion that the absolute is not only a substance, but also a subject. For Hegel, only the subject is truly grounded, and this is because it is self-founded, because it is not conditioned by its other, but rather operates its Aufhebung in the sense of an unifying integration. Beyond this precise point, Hegel's work is a kind of equation of substantialism and modern metaphysics. In his lessons on the history of philosophy, as we know, Hegel defines metaphysics as the tendency toward substance. So that the fight or the, yes, the, the debate, the debate against substance is largely conflated with the debate against dogmatic metaphysics. However, while Hegel takes up, I would say, Kant's struggle against the old metaphysics, his position is highly original for him. It is not a question of unilaterally repudiating substantialist thought but of criticizing it and recognizing its indispensable role in the advent of concrete subjectivity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you very much for your talk. So maybe we have time for one or two questions. Anyone? Yes, please. Thank you. Oh. Where's the microphone? It's very peak. Speak slowly. <laughs> slowly. Exactly. Okay. Uh, good. Thank you very much. Je vais essayer, mais on va pas comprendre ce que je dis. Okay. Uh, 
thank you very much. Uh, I particularly appreciated the distinction between substance and causality and reciprocal causality and your reference to Kant, who hasn't had much uh, uh, say in this uh, uh, seminar on this uh, Congress. Um, what I wanted to ask, though, uh, is something a little bit difficult, different, and that is, um, what role do you think the concept of substance plays later in the real philosophy? And in particular, I'm thinking of the Rechtsphilosophy and you know, ethical substance, um, because it seems that um, substance is not just a concept in the logic that we have to move through, but it actually plays a significant role later. And I wondered if you could comment very briefly on that. Yes, yes. So uh, very briefly, I would, I would answer that there are uh, substantial moments in the real philosophy. And then um, the substantiality implies um, a shortcoming, an, an abstraction. And when, I, I would say that when a moment, when, when uh, the notion of substance appear in the real philosophy, it has first we must uh, admit that it has a critical meaning. And it is very clear in the analysis of the Oriental spirit, for example. And, um, and something more interesting and perhaps uh, discutable, uh, the state is regularly characterized as a substance. It is understandable in the sense that um, the state has a power. But when it is characterized as a power, I would say that it, it means that state cannot be, in Hegel's view, the end of the processes. Because, so, it, it, yes, I would say, that, so, uh, it, 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 it means the, that the state exerts a contrast on the individual. Okay, thank you. We have five minutes for two more questions, okay? Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. And you can also speak slow. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Shil, for your nice uh, presentation. I also like that you try to uh, uh, interpret Hegel as a kind of synthesis of Kant and Spinoza, subject and, and substance. My, uh, my question is this. Uh, you, uh, in your explanation of the substance, you focused very much on its position in the logic of essence. Uh, but as all... Uh, uh, Stephen also pointed out too, apparently the concept of substance is very important also in other parts of the system. So my question would be, could you maybe outline, so to say, the place of the concept of substance in the logic of essence against the background of the task of the whole logic? So, I mean, we start with the logic of being. We get sorry, a, sorry? We start with the logic of being. We get a very external relationship, establishing determinacy, but in a very type of external relationship, which is, so to say, con continuously being made more intrinsic until, at the end, there is, so to say, a concept of full intrinsicity, so to say, substance, which is immediate, as it has to be determined. And then, so to say, the other determinations start uh, so, sorry, I, I do not understand. You think that substance appears no, in, in, I, I mean, other, in now, other parts of the logic? Uh, no, I was now starting to answer my own question. I will just reformulate your, my question to you. And can you outline the relevance of the concept of substance against the background of the task of the science of logic which has three parts, the logic of being, the logic of essence, and the logic of the concept. That's my question. I will not answer it myself. <laughs> Thank you. I would say that in a certain sense, substance is the epitome of the logic of essence. In a certain sense. Is the epitome, the, the epitome, epitome, in a certain sense. So, and uh, probably, probably the notion appears from time to time in the logic of being and logic of concept, but only uh, marginally. Okay, I'm not sure I understand your question. Not at all, probably. Not at all. <laughs> okay, last, 
question. Yes. You, um, that, that was great. I'm just sad that there was not enough time to hear all, all of that. But um, I, just, I just think that you, you, you highlighted uh, in a very great sense the problem of Hegel with Spinoza, and it just uh, brought it up a question for me. You just said, substance is related to its accidents, but not its most. And I think it's exactly this, because uh, here you just said, uh, Spinoza's substance is too star, rigid for Hegel. But I just thought, can we just change, like reverse it and say maybe this substance is too fluid so that it cannot be uh, solidified at all, so that it's such, such a fluid um, substance, Spinoza's I mean, that it cannot have accidents and it cannot just think itself not because it's not that too star, but just too fluid. Uh, substance is too fluid, according to you, in Hegel or in Spinoza? I will just say, like, after, after what you said about substance and its rela relation to its accidents in Hegel, and then you said, for Hegel, Spinoza's substance is too star. And I just thought that maybe, like, dialectically, we, we could just reverse it and just say that Spinoza's substance is too fluid too fluid that it cannot be solidified at all, and that's why it cannot think itself. Not because it's too star, star but, but just it's so fluid that it cannot have accidents, and it cannot think itself, and just we get lost in it. So, so if I rightly understand, so I would say that um, historically, Spinoza's substance is not at all rigid. Because it is, uh, I'm not a specialist of Spinoza, but, but it is rather a power, a, a dynamic power of, uh, of causation. So uh, the, the, the reading of Hegel must be totally, totally false, actually. But it is an heritage, an heritage of Mendelssohn, for example, and uh, of, many, of many others. I don't know if you are satisfied with this question. Oh, okay. <laughs> but we. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we'll start. Um, the first speaker of the second section, uh, second, <laughs> second session of the day is <laughs> uh, Giuseppe Paglialuna, no, yes, okay. Um, Giuseppe is um, a high school teacher at the Music Institu Institute in Val Camonica. After phil uh, philosophical studies at the University of Padua, he obtained a PhD in Human Sciences at the Guglielmo Marconi University of Rome. His thesis was focused on the thought of Schilling. His today's lecture is titled Diese Unruhe aber ist das Selbst, Spinoza and Hegel between time and eternity. Giuseppe, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, so my presentation is prompted by a suggestion regarding some fundamental questions of Hegel's philosophy and their direct or indirect, indirect relationship with that of Spinoza. And the first question concerns love. As is known, the meticulous systematic articulation of Spinozian epistemology culminates in the Amor Dei Intellectualis, that is, in the coincidence of the human mind with the idea of the latter in God. In the ethics, love is defined as a joy in conjunction with the idea of an external cause. This means that for Spinoza, the supreme condition of freedom and wisdom is characterized by what we could define as potentia existendi, and, and, and an all-enveloping self-satisfaction, acquiescentia, arising from the idea of God as an eternal cause. This cognitive stage, by virtue of which the mind is finally able to understand in a clear and instinct way, finally leads, a, leads to a um, health and serenity, to a bliss, in which the human mind laps the infinity of God, and by virtue of which the mind, exper the mind experiences a synthony with all reality since love of God means love, for na love of nature. This love that Spinoza speaks of is therefore aimed at all the individual entities of nature, but it is an intransitive love, since nature cannot reciprocate it. On a page of his Wilhelm Meister's apprenticeship, Goethe expresses 
expressed this condition very well, when he has one of his characters say, if I love you, what does that matter to you? So uh, intellectual love, the knowledge of things, as Remo Baudet says, is the attempt to overcome both the passivi passivity given by the passions and the imagination and the activity of conquest by an abstract reason that wants simply to enslave passions. It is the attempt to fit into a context in which all beings are recognized as having, having equal dignity. Hegel, for his part, in the preface to his Phenomenolo Phenomenology of Spirit, states that the time has now come for philosophy to lay aside the title of, the title of love of knowing and be actual knowing. So that while for Spinoza the high, highest possibility of knowledge on the part of humanity is somehow one with the potentia of love, love of, for God, of course, for Hegel, far from being the supreme condition, love is rather the premise, we could say, or in a Stendhalian way, the promise of truth. But, but if this is true, does this mean that there is no place for love in absolute knowledge, that it is not possible, so to speak, an amor spiritus? From a certain point of view, the answer is affirmative, since for Hegel, and this applies both to the theological writing and to the Hegel of the encyclopedia, for example, uh, I quote, in love, one finds life itself as a duplication of itself and as its unity, end of quote. Since it is precisely the feeling and findung of unity through which that being by oneself within the other, by sich selbst sein im anderen, that Hegel writes in sever several passages of, of his works is possible. In short, love can truly be seen as the first formulation of the Hegelian dialectical concept as a development or articulation of totality, which makes love itself probably the feeling of totality, of oneness. However, although love also plays an important role in Hegelian philosophy, it is, quote, uh, still incomplete nature, writes Hegel. Rather, love represents only a moment or a stage in that process of negation and reconciliation, versonung into unity. unity. One of its main limitations concerns uh, the inability to resolve objectivity. Love, in fact, whether it aims to contract into a restricted sphere in a locus amenos, or um, we could say, or whether it aims to extend itself more and more to include the wall of humanity, uh, runs away an inevitable, inevitable destiny, in the sense that in the first case allows an immeasurable field of objecti objectivi objectivity to exist outside itself, which comes to be configured as an unresolved opposite. While in the second, conversely, that is, uh, if love wanted to extend to the wall of humanity, it betrays its nature, which is the concreteness and determination of its existence, its impossibility of turning to abstraction. A thought, writes Hegel, cannot be loved. But this leads to the second great limit of love, namely the absence of the negative, understood, for instance, in the declination of the ne fatigue of the concept, mue un anstrenum des begriffs. Also for uh, this reason, as Hegel writes, uh, quite quote, Lover, lovers do not know of their union, uh, because they, uh, end of quote, because they do not know what love is. And moreover, love resists every intellectual construction, so much so that in the outlines of the philosophy of right, Hegel writes that love is therefore the most prodigious contradiction which the intellect cannot resolve. This implies that uh, the, absol the absolute knowledge can only be love as feeling, and also that in love as love, the spirit does not know itself entirely, and by not knowing itself, likewise, it does not reach perfect fulfillment. That is to say, it does not completely resolve the relationship between relation and opposition, between thought and being, necessity and freedom, union and non-union, and so on. Love, therefore, needs to be pushed towards further, further unifications. Even in this case, in Hegel we can see a reworking of the Spinozian formula sed intelligere, since truth, truth as wholeness, as does Ganze, 
can only correspond to dialectical movement and self-transparency of the idea, of which the feeling of thought certainly sublime represent only one stage. Now, if at the top of Hegel's epistemological pyramid there cannot be an amor spiritus, that is, if love cannot constitute the end of this path, this means not only that philosophical and scientific knowledge has a culmination, but beyond that, that uh, it means also that it, is, it no longer tends towards any truth, since, in, since it is itself the realized truth. But this implies a series of problems. For example, the question of truth as resultat. Can what resulted in turn be the moment at the end of other uh, of a subsequent result, such, a, such as, for example, 100 be the result of 80 plus 20 and the at the end of the result of 120. Because if it is the case, this is the case, the truth is never wall, never complete, and we risk falling into the trap of bad infinity, since it, its in, uh, wallness is incessantly pushed forward again. Or should we believe uh, those who understand this entirely um, and this wellness as the end of philosophy and its transformation into the history of philosophy and peda pedagogy, must we believe that philosophical activity has dried up to the point that it does not allow the emergence of a new philosophical initiative, even a radical one? Uh, no historian of philosophy, moreover, uh, at least I think, would reduce 20th century speculation to this form of philosophical servility. Uh, but the main problem that interests me, uh, correlated to that of the result and implicit in, in that of, lo of love, is that, the, uh, is that of the eternal and its relationship with time. Spinoza's amor dei intellectualis, in fact, is a knowledge subspecie eternitatis. Now, Spinoza has a simultaneously dualistic and monistic conception of time, apparently. He is a dualist because he admits a true eternal time and therefore probably beyond the temporal horizon and a fictitious temporality linked to the impressions and erroneous imaginations, imaginations of the mind. Uh, if the first time is that of eternity, the second is instead that of duration. The latter, however, exists only in appearance. Its condition of existence, in fact, falls entirely in the human mind that imagines it. Duration, therefore, does not have its own autonomous ontological status. When I think about the relationship between the eternal and duration, Dante's verse uh, inscribed on the entrance door to Inferno always comes to mind. E io eterno duro, and I eternal last. That of duration is the time of hell. Uh, for Spinoza, as can be read, uh, read as well as in his letter on the infinite, in, his, in the ethics, time, considered absolutely, i.e. as eternity, is, I quote, the very essence of God, as it implies his necessary existence. And therefore, to conceive things under the aspect of eternity, it is to conceive them as real by virtue of the essence of God. That is, insofar, insofar as they, their existence is implied by it. Uh, Pass 5, demonstration 30. Eternity is the infinite affirmation of, and self-position of God. Uh, is being causa sui, coincidence of essence and existence, and therefore existence eternally present in every presence and every present, extremely far from everything and still immanent to everything. Hegel, in his lectures on the history of philosophy, offers a clear interpretation of this Spinozian conception. He sees in Spinoza's eternal substance a sort of modern eleatism, a rigid and abstract universality incapable of saving individuality and modus in general from the abyss of substance, which would absorb or completely cancel it. Not a night yet, but perhaps an evening in which most ca of cows are gray. Said en passant, it is curious to know that Schelling, to whom this famous expression of Hegel alluded, 
also had a similar opinion on Spinoza. In his Munich lectures, in fact, Schelling man maintains that, Spin I quote, Spinoza's substance passes into the object which en with entire loss of itself, and therefore completely and without reserve. And only as such a subject, as object, it is, uh, is still encountered. That subject, however, is not blind, but an infinite position of itself. That is, it does not cease by becoming an object to be a subject." End of quote. And also Fichte, and therefore with him all the greatest exponents of German idealism, afford, he holds Spinoza in very high regard, and so, and so do Schelling and Hegel, of course. Uh, the Fichtean eye, in fact, is nothing other than a pure self-producing or self-creating activity. And it, it is identified by Fichte with Spinoza's substance. Uh, even Fichte, I was saying, addresses a single ob objection to Spinoza, namely that he has placed pure, pure consciousness beyond empirical consciousness, while it must be placed and recognized precisely in the latter. The I of each person is itself the only supreme substance says Fichte. But again, returning to the problem I mentioned early, how should Hegelian absolute knowledge be conceived? Since if it leads to a cognitive stasis, then it falls fall back into Spinoza's immobile and acosmic knowledge. But if it is dynamic, sick at simpliciter, it therefore ceases to be knowledge. In fact, if uh, Spinoza's eleatism leads to an eternal and immutable truth, just as the chain of necessary events, and if Hegel, for his part, intends to reject precisely this fixity, then all that remains is to ask ourselves what is ultimately, uh, ultimately the relationship between das Ganze, uh, between the world net of truth and time. In short, if absolute knowledge must not be uh, static, absolutely um, objective or geometric knowledge, does this perhaps mean that philosophy must rather be subspecie temporis? Hegel himself, after all, in a famous passage of his Outlines of the Philosophy of Right, writes that philosophy is our time comprehended in thoughts. Yet it was said earlier there that absolute knowledge is a realized truth, a knowledge in which subject and object find their versonung, and in which there is no longer any tension, that is, no love of knowing. At the top of Spinoza's ontology, inversely, we find love, which leads us to suspect the existence of a chiasmus between Hegelian and Spinozian philosophy. To put it in Hegel's words, in his system there is an undribbled restlessness, altungslose unruhe, which precipitates into a quiet result, Hurige's resultat, science of logic. While in Spinoza, exactly the opposite would happen. All this clearly depends on an improper understanding of the absolute knowledge itself. Here again, uh, among others, for example, states that uh, the end of the system, far from constituting its closure, on the contrary, represents the moment of maximum opening. But why? Because in it, Hegel established the need for externalization or alienation and transition and Teusserung und Übergang. And with this, he attests that the truth would be articulated in time, no longer beyond it. Once this immanence has been established, the determination of truth develops according to states that do not ignore subjectivity, but which are actually one with the history and development of the latter. This is precisely the unrest of life, Unruhe des Lebens, which is spoken of at the beginning of phenomenology. Spirit is indeed never at rest, writes Hegel. A, a restlessness which constitutes the essence of, of that absolute differentiation which is time. But it is consciousness itself, continues Hegel in the phenomenology, that is absolute dialectical unrest, absolute dialectische unruhe, so that consciousness and time seem to be inextricab inextricably linked to the point of mutually, mutually mirroring each other. 
only the totality of spirit, we read in the phenomenology, is in time. And the, the shapes, which are shapes of the totality of spirit, display themselves in a temporal section. For only the wall has true actuality, and therefore the form of pure freedom in face or another, a form which expresses itself as time." End quote. This restlessness uh, for which we can unite, as we can read in the lectures of, uh, on the history of philosophy, in mooring for this universal transience, and indeed uh, in the indignation uh, of the good spirit for such a spectacle, which cannot be compensate, compensated by any conciliatory result. However, at the same time, it reveals, it, uh, it reveals us our elevation, our being one or at home as spirit, with the truth itself. Concrete, current existence in all its liveliness is therefore saved or maintained in its totality, in an horizon in which even the life of a shepherd, of a farmer, has an infinite value, lectures on the history of philosophy. Uh, the final moment of Hegelian philosophical system is therefore certainly intensive on the one hand, in the sense that the result of, the, of an entire process is deposited in it, and it, it is finally available for its conceptualization. But uh, at the same time, it is, an, an, it is extensive, since in it the openness towards the future wanderings of truths is manifested. As we can see, although it does not lead to a a knowledge that is directly involves love, absolute knowledge, paradoxically, is more open than Spinoza's Amor Dei, since in it there is no static or geometric objectivity in which to be reflected, but a constantly evol evolving process. But now, uh, it is appropriate to focus in conclusion precisely on this aspect, since once uh, it has been demonstrated that the moment of completion of the system is in reality the moment of its mas maximum opening, it is also crucial to prevent the truth understood as externalization and transition from reproducing precisely at the peak of the system that bad infinity against which it fought in every single part. Furthermore, this problem is linked to another question which can be summarized by asking whether truth being inseparably connected with time is not thereby also refuted by time, and therefore whether these truths, as often happens to their thinkers, do not escape the unfortunate fate of being considered only sons of the authors of their time. The answer to these questions, in my opinion, is only one, which however is articulated on several levels. levels. Uh, let's by, let's, start, uh, let's uh, start by saying that for Hegel, uh, saying that truth unfolds in time does not mean at all that it is, it is temporary and therefore subject to time. Uh, I have collected here a series of passages in which Hegel reiterates this uh, peremptorily. Time does, uh, belongs only to the finite. Philosophy is timeless understanding, also with respect of time and things in general, according to their eternal determination, and so on, and so on. How then can truth, not changing over time, nevertheless be continually developing an ubergang? This happens because, as Kierigin writes, the sub sublation of every opposition does not mean arriving at a beatific and immobile unity, at a colors colorless absoluteness, but rather accepting the only permanent stable structure of becoming and what is finite, uh, I quote, what is not driven by any difference is differentiation. What is, in co what is constant and permanent, man, permanent is the transition." End of quote. Uh, sorry. Uh, this process is what Hegel in the science of logic called the vanishing of the vanishing itself. To say, it with, to say it with Spinoza, the concept of dog does not bark. That is to say, the idea, the spirit is above time, since what is such in every concept of time, the idea is the thought of what is the substance of time. In this sense, then, while expressing the truth of one's time and comprehending it in thoughts, simultaneously the spirit, to say it with Elderlin, is the world of all worlds, 
the all in all which always is, only presents itself in all time. Each new configuration of spirit in history, therefore, and this can also be applied to Hegel's own epoch, is only a limited configuration within the, within the cosmic realization of the Logos, we could say, passing through each every epoch and seeking in each of them only itself. In every historical era, it is the Logos which returns to itself, finding and comprehending itself in art, religion, and philosophy, and is manifesting uh, within time, their timeless content. Its task is, is to work on the, on the transformation into spiritual form of time, world, individual, and state, to develop itself so that it should come to the consciousness of itself within these realities. For this reason, in my view, the history of philosophy cannot be considered a gallery of opinions, since it, it is rather at the articulation or progression of a single truth I think, for example, of the beautiful images of the plant refuted by the flower in the phenomenology. In this way, uh, the unrest of time and life is assumed in the stillness of the spirit absolute, in which, however, eternity is nothing other than a becoming eternal of time, or, as Hegel says, a resolution of the finite into the eternal. Therefore, humanity, can in some way make itself universal, immortal, emerging above the tumultuous and conflictual horizon of universal history into the Syrian, even if supremely mobile and restless, either of eternal truth, of absolute spirit. I would like to conclude by a beautiful reflection by Thomas Mann, contained in a short essay from 1952. Uh, entitled Lob der Vergänglichkeit, known in English as Life Grows on the Soil of Time. Because when I happened to read it, it immediately brought to mind the Hegelian meditation on time that I tried, I hope not to clumsily, uh, to remember. What I believe, what I value most is transitoriness, Vergänglichkeit. But is not transitoriness, the perishableness of life, something very sad? No. It is the very soul of existence. It impacts, imparts value, dignity, interest to life. Transitoriness creates time, and time is the essence. To man, time is given like a piece of land, as it were, entrusted to him for faithful tilling, a space, a space in which to strive incessantly, achieve self-realization, move onward and upward, Yes, with the aid of time, man becomes capable of wresting the immortal from the mortal. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Giuseppe. Um, questions? Okay, Buana. Thank you for this very interesting talk. Um, love and truth, always a good topic. Uh, so. Um, I have two comments and two questions. So, and I'll talk uh, more about Hegel's concept of love. Um, so, it seems that Hegel uh, has a kind of two lines of argumentation on love. The first one is taking the other as one's equal um, into a kind of unification. It, it goes um, well with some kind of unification. Um, um, union. So take, let's take, for example, marriage. So formal sym symmetry between the parties involved would, in principle, support a demand for equality within, uh, within martial union. And um, however, he says such uh, equality is not actualized and thus remains abstract if it does not include a differentiation between individuals. Um, um, even if this then leads to discrepancies in resources, power, and uh, of course, um, division labor. So in principle, equality, but this equality manifests itself quite differently for men than, for example, for women. So this is one kind of conception of love, uh, mostly presented in the philosophy of right as uh, absolute uh, capacity or a power of uh, unification, and it's interesting that he compares that to the general concept in logic. So this is this is one um, thing, and the other, um, another, there is another line of argumentation where um, uh, love um, 
um, uh, means, uh, so one individual in love does not take as one's equal, but as opposed to oneself. And you, you, this is the quote you, you brought in the talk. So it is opposition and not fusion that makes love what it is, and it cannot be redeemed to any uh, sort of unity. So this is another one. So I, I'm interested, how do you stand on these two conceptions in Hegel? And of course, love and truth, um, one cannot but think of, but you, of course, so do you love as a procedure of truth, as a, a construction of a world from the perspective of the two. So I'm just interested, how do you, could you in any way connect it with your talk? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very beautiful question. Um, I don't know if I'm able to answer properly um, how I stand. Uh, I would say that uh, I don't know how I was... Um, um, well, maybe something that is um, a bit problematic, at least in my, in my view, um, is the, um, the problem of the negative in love. Uh, I don't know uh, what kind of re relationship Hegel had, but uh, in my experience at least, uh, negative is a part, an important part of love. And so it's, um, it's, it, it is an inside of love. So this, this maybe is a bit problematic to me to understand. So why for Hegel there is apparently at least, uh, there is this lack of negative negativity in, in love, and that is a, 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 a thing that I really am not able to reconcile, to understand, to um, re for the um, the other things. Um, yes, I would say that I I totally agree. Um, it is very complicated to. Uh, to follow to follow this uh, this path, uh, according to which at the end of, at at the peak of the system, um, l love can be present also only as a, a feeling because of this uh, um, this because of, of of all the problems I mentioned before, namely the problems of the objectivity and so on. And f honestly, I'm not able to answer to answer on how this is, um, on how this problem, this problem of objectivity affects uh, love uh, intended as marriage and intended as um, love union and sexual, um, the, the difference of sex and, and, and so on. So I have also problems with this, um, with this, this point in particular, but if I think to the the world structure of love in Hegel philosophy, uh, yeah, I I would say that I agree with your uh, observation, um, which are really insightful, and uh, of course also with the general Hegel Hegelian structure. I would say I, I sincerely very few things just to add. Quinjan and then Luca and then Gregor and then Brauko. So, uh, but 10 minutes, so please, everyone be brief. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I liked, uh, among others, uh, the way how you described the limits of the model of, um, of love um, uh, with uh, regard to the problem of speculation. Uh, my question is uh, maybe rather technical. And maybe it's also based on a misunderstanding. Um, so <laughs> um, I, I had the idea that you, that you are of the opinion that for Hegel, philosophical cognition is absolute knowledge. Philosophical, sorry? Philosophical cognition is absolute knowledge. Absolute is wisdom. You, d you try to describe philosophical knowledge as absolute wisdom. That's correct, right? Uh, Absolute knowledge as uh, the culmination, you mean? Uh, yes, yes. So, as so to say, the culminant, co yeah, point of culmination. Yeah, then, then I would uh, like to make a critical remark because I think that's not the case. I think philosophical cognition for Hegel is not 
absolutes wisdom. Um, although it sounds, of course, very deep and dark, and uh, it's a nice talk, but from a technical point of view, uh, I think it's important to see that it's not the case. Because what happens is absolute knowledge at the point of culmination of phenomenology of spirit is, so to say, the entrance ticket into philosophical cognition. So I would suggest to maybe deepen a bit this concept of philosophical cognition, and what you could do then is look at the idea chapter of the logic where the idea of cognition is developed by Hegel, and you will see that Hegel determines philosophical cognition, uh, starts the determination in terms of uh, uh, theoretical and practical cognition, concluding that philosophical cognition is neither theoretical nor practical cognition, so there is no practical philosophy, there is no theoretical <laughs> philosophy, there is only philosophy as knowledge of the absolute idea. So philosophical cognition is cognition under or in terms of the absolute idea. And then, um, so to say, uh, you find of course uh, 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 formulations with regard to uh, the cognition of the philosopher. Hegel talks for example of comprehending thought. But also that is not absolutist wisdom. So yeah. therefore I would suggest maybe to, in this point, be more precise. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right, I'm sorry. I, 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 I uh, needed to express it more clearly. I'm sorry, yes, you're right. Thank you so much. Um, no, I wanted to return to the point because I think that there is theoretical cognition and there is practical cognition and absolutist wisdom uh, contains uh, mm, theoretical and practical cognition. You told there is no theoretical cognition, there is no practical, no, there is. And they, and they find itself into the absolute. Uh, yeah. Okay. 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 No, I, I wanted to. Uh, it is the last day of the of the talk of the um, of the conference, uh, and I have to go away uh, before the end, and so I can say something crazy. And <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, it was uh, a provocation from the 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 the, the wonderful talk uh, I heard, and. Uh, I had the impression that we can uh, propose a sort of triangle, triangulation between Spinoza, Hegel, and perhaps Heidegger, too. <laughs> and this is crazy. <laughs> and and I, I was thinking about the, the, the relationship between time and eternity. Um, because the, the relationship between time and eternity and the relationship between finitude and infinity is, I think, the, the very uh, focus, the very topic of the relationship between uh, uh, Hegel and Spinoza. And it is the, the very focus of the relationship between Heidegger and Hegel. And so Heidegger and Spinoza, I, I would say, in the sense that the problem is uh, what is finitude and what is infinity? And th there is uh, this wonderful passage uh, in the um, Vorlesung von Heidegger über die uh, Phenomenologie des Geistes, where Heidegger says, okay, uh, Hegel is the philosophy of infinity and I am the philosopher of finitude. But what is infinity for Hegel? It is not possible that this infinity is what I think as finitude. He says, and I think that your, um, your idea with the Thomas Mann uh, quotation yeah. goes in this direction, but uh, uh, perhaps it's only crazy. I totally agree. Uh, oh, you are crazy too. Yeah. <laughs> I totally agree. Um, there is a, um, an interesting uh, photo of uh, Kojev, if I remember correctly, um, 
in uh, some pages of his um, meditations on Hegel's dialectics, which are, in my opinion, very close to Heidegger, to the, um, in, in particular, um, regarding the closure, so to speak, between um, Dasein and the time for death. And because yeah, I remember these pages in which Kojev says that um, death, it, it is necessary also for the existence. It is not written this, this way, but maybe we could uh, argue uh, that, um, or we could, we could interpret it, it in this way. Uh, death, death is necessary to infinity as well. So you have to die in order to, you, you, there must be death, there must be death in order to infinity to exist, because uh, without death, without death uh, finite cannot be finite uh, or truly finite. And if it's, uh, if it's finite cannot be truly finite, it cannot be also um, infinity as well. And yeah, in my opinion, there is, uh, I expressed it very badly, but in my opinion, there is this conjunction. This, and I, it's, a, it's a pity, it's a shame Heidegger didn't uh, analyze it, I, at least in my, um, in my opinion, it's a, a pity because, yeah, um, uh, that would be, it would have been so interesting to know how he would have um, replied to this, um, to this point. Cool. Um, I want to support the crazy totally and completely. Uh, not just as a crazy thought, but uh, I think, uh, especially, I, 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 thi I also think that this quote by Thomas Mann uh, ex expresses this idea really, really well. So I'm very, I'm very happy that, um, I'm, I, I, I want to thank you really uh, very much for your talk. I appreciate it very, uh, a thank lot you. and it was really beautiful. And this quote is magnificent. Um, so, to try to push the crazy a little bit <laughs> would be to say, yes, I think Heidegger is not an innocent figure here, and I, th I think Heidegger can help us, but can we do it even without Heidegger? Can we go to Spinoza and discuss Amor Dei in this way? And let, let, me, let me give an example. Uh, so Amor Dei, as we know, is a beautiful concept of our love of God is the God love of himself. But so my question would be this. Is there any other way for God to love himself but through our loving him? This would be my Heideggerian question or my Thomas Mannian question <laughs> posed to Spinoza. Yeah. Is there any other way for God to love himself if not through our love to him? The only thing I... I can think of it uh, uh, right now is a page of, um, if I remember correctly, Schelling, um, Freiheit Schrift, in which Schelling talks, r reflects things about uh, Spinoza's conception, and um, not only Spinoza's concep conception of love, um, Amor Dei, because yeah, um, l God can only love him in itself, and it's like um, circular love, and this love is only within the divinity. Uh, while for Schelling, uh, if I remember correctly, this uh, is the um, this could this could be called uh, because I don't remember the exact word. This could be called the bad love, because we spoke of about infinity, the bad love, the, the love which is self-centered. And um, Schelling um, tries to um, depict this image of God as, um, as love, as pure love, but love is intended here differently, not as love of itself, love, uh, love, of, God, love of God as uh, the love of itself, but uh, self-reflecting love. It's the love for the otherness as such. And this is the love that um, uh, permits freedom to exist, uh, for Schelling at least. And this, this is uh, 
this could be one path to follow in order to answer to this uh, intriguing question. Uh, but uh, can we do it without Heidegger? I don't know. It's also an intriguing question, but yeah, maybe we should analyze the different concept of truth all, all by Hegel, Heidegger, Spinoza, of course, because Heidegger, um, Heidegger analyzes uh, very deeply this concept and also Hegel's concept of truth um, differently from the problem of, um, of um, death in my opinion, and yeah, there's, that, that would be illuminating maybe, no? uh, right? The problem of uh, uh, Unverborgen, Unverborgenheit, I remember, yeah. Unverborgenheit and absolute knowledge, that, that, that would be interesting. Okay, uh, Rauko, real quick. Very, very <laughs> quick one. Uh, I was late, that was unpolite, and perhaps my question misses the point because everything was already said. But if I understood you correctly, you used the concept of love as an uh, interpretive filter to contrast the position of Spinoza on one hand and Hegel on the other hand. However, there is a curious passage in the logic of concept that goes in concretely, uh, a completely different direction. It, it's about das, das Allgemeine uh, and goes. Das Allgemeine is the Herr der freie Macht. Es ist äh, er selbst und greift über sein anderes über, aber nicht als ein gewaltsames, sondern das vielmehr in demselben ruhig und bei sich selbst ist. Wie es die, und nun kommt die, wie es die freie Macht genannt worden, so könnte es auch die freie Liebe und schrankenlose Seligkeit genannt werden, denn es ist ein Verhalten seiner zu dem Unterschiedenen als nur zu sich selbst. Also die freie Liebe, die freie Macht, die freie Liebe, die schrankenlose Seligkeit. Um, this is nonetheless, I would say, Spinoza. So we, we come to the point where precisely in the concept of love, yeah. we have so affinity, so intimacy almost between Spinoza and uh, Hegel. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, there is, it's true. Uh, I agree, I'm sorry. And thank you for your question, um, uh, for your observation. Um, there is also a passage, if I remember correctly, in the encyclopedia in which Hegel correlates um, uh, absolute, absolute, absolute idea, absolute knowing with amor dei intellectualis. And establish, Hegel establishes, it seems so at least, a perfect, almost, uh, almost uh, perfect correspondence between the Spinozian um, conception of truth. But um, still, I think um, there is, a, um, so to say, a reminder, uh, um, because also in the encyclopedia, always in the encyclopedia, Hegel's, Hegel says that, writes that, uh, mm, as I mentioned earlier, before, uh, Love is actually, is present, is not absent in the culmination of knowledge, in the absolute knowledge. But the problem is, does the absolute knowledge, is a cons uh, does the absolute knowledge is a cons consequence of love of God or love for the absolute? Or um, maybe the opposite occurs, that is, uh, love as a feeling, as the feeling of wholeness, can be appeared in his authenticity only after the uh, reaching of the absolute of the absolute idea, and so in this sense, maybe love depends on uh, absolute knowledge and not the opposite. And maybe uh, it is in this direction that we can read the pa that passage of the encyclopedia in which Hegel says uh, this absolute knowledge as feeling is love, and as um, knowing is spirit, uh, if I remember correctly. But yeah, th thank you very much. Thank you.
<clears throat> okay, uh, next speaker, please, Gregor. Gregor Moder is a is senior research associate in the philosophy department at the University of Ljubljana. He just concluded a research project on the theatricality of power. He was he co-founded uh, Aufhebung International uh, Hegelian Association and served as its first president. And he's the author of Hegel and Spinoza: Sp Substance and Negativity. Today he will talk on the <coughs> on the contingency. In Hegel and Spinoza. Gregor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, the controversial parts, obviously, in Spinoza, contingency in Spinoza, it's going to be a little crazy, all right? So, yes, it's obviously a controversial topic. Science and philosophy in general are not concerned with contingency, with chance, with luck. They are concerned with the necessity, with that which is necessary. And on top of this, Hegel and Spinoza, among philosophers, are Parmenidian thinkers in the sense that for them, contingency seems to be nothing but an illusion. They are also Parmenidian thinkers in the sense that we can detect in their respective system, systems the general principle of identity of being and thinking. I'm obviously speaking about a very, on a very general level. Let us take a closer look first at Hegel. The most obvious example of such an apparent identity uh, of being and thinking is the formulation from the preface to the philosophy of right. It's found elsewhere as well. What is rational is actual, and what is actual is rational. Now, is there a place for contingency in such a system? Uh, yes, it is, of course. As Bernard Mabie, author of, of a magisterial work on contingency in Hegel, uh, he writes uh, that it would be a mistake to read Hegel's sentence, this sentence, to mean a simple and immediate identity. According to Mabie, the mistake lies in confusing reality with actuality. Mabie points to a comment in the Encyclopedia Logic where Hegel discusses the identity of actual and rational and gives a bit more substance to it. Uh, not in the technical term of the word. So Hegel writes, but even for someone possessing an ordinary sensitivity, which means like even for an ordinary guy, <laughs> I suppose, a contingent concrete existence and its ophelic existence will not be deemed to deserve the emphatic designation of being actual. A contingent concrete existence has no greater value than something that is possible and which may just as well not exist as exist. And commenting on these lines, Bernard Mabie argues that contingency certainly has a specific form of reality in Hegel's system, the reality of something merely possible. But at the same time, that this reality is ultimately not the reality of the actual, of the Wirkliche. And in truth, Hegel does consistently quote Plato's system of ideas as a reference point to his phrasing of identity of rationality and actuality. And furthermore, Hegel consistently argued that the task of philosophy is precisely the operation that overcomes contingency and deals only with necessity. It thus seems that contingency has ultimately no ontological value for Hegel. But Bernard Marby puts us on the right path by insisting that Hegel perceived quite well that contingency, Zufälligkeit, is a real challenge to philosophy. That's basically the title of his book. Uh, and that it has always been, even for Plato and Aristoteles. Marby describes contingency as quote, unquote, I think it's just a beautiful description of contingency, the germ of death in the heart of our flesh, end of quote. This is a very interesting quote. 
And he sees the task of philosophy precisely as the task of giving an account uh, of contingency, is answering the challenge of contingency, which is no less than a challenge to the idea that God is good or that the world is rational. So a lot, quite a lot is at stake. And we can recognize in this the hint at the question of evil in the world and of what Leibniz calls theodicy. And we will come back to this in a moment. To make a much longer argument short and present it very schematically, my claim is that what interests Hegel is not a complete elimination of contingency, but rather what he calls overcoming, überwindung. So what does this mean? Hegel declares, the contingent is in general such as has the ground of its being not in, in itself, but in another. This is the form Gestalt, in which the actuality first presents itself to consciousness. This is almost like a Spinozist version of it. The contingent, however, is merely the actual in the one-sided form of the reflection into another, or the actual with the meaning of something merely possible. Again, a very Spinozistic description. Now, overcoming the contingent, this zufällige zu überwinden, so construed, is generally the task of knowing, on the one hand, as much as it is the domain of practice, on the other. It is a matter of not standing pat with the contingency of willing or arbitrary choice. End of quotation. So I'm really interested uh, in the second part of this quote. The task of Erkenen, of the process of knowledge, is to overcome the contingent while at the same time not to stubbornly stick to the arbitrary. I find it, this formulation really important because what Hegel means with Zufälligkeit, the contingency, is not to be confused with mere arbitrariness. Properly understood, the process of knowledge is the process of overcoming the contingency. It is not that one must first overcome contingency in order for the process of knowledge uh, to start in the proper meaning of the term, no. The, prop, the process of knowledge, this would be my claim, is nothing but the process of overcoming the contingency. I argue, therefore, that, that contingency in Hegel must be understood as a necessary part of the rela relationship between the contingent and the necessary. So there is a necessity of contingency itself in Hegel, because the process of knowledge is precisely the process of working with the contingency. Now, to take on uh, the question of theodicy, let us turn to Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of world history. There, the name for the process of working the contingency, for the process of over overcoming the contingency, is simply repetition. Julius Caesar had to be repeated, so to speak, in Octavian Caesar and in all other Caesars that followed, precisely in order so that the idea of the rule of one would establish itself as not merely something historically contingent, but rather as something necessary. In other words, contingency is not to be eliminated or discarded in the process of knowledge. It has to be sacrificed on the altar of the idea. An idea can only establish itself through this process of the overcoming of the contingency. And it is, for Hegel, a bloody process, as we, as, we, as we well know. So what this idea of repetition makes clear is another very intriguing aspect of the relationship between contingency and necessity in Hegel. Before Julius Caesar was repeated in Octavian, he was simply a contingent military leader who challenged the Republic. It was only in the repetition that he became a historical necessity, and what Hegel calls the world historical individual. In other words, becoming a necessity is a retroactive process. The point is not just that Caesar personally did not know what the future will bring when he crossed the Rubicon and submitted himself to the throw of the dice. It is the historical process itself which only retroactively receives its necessary shape. In other words, the grand claim that I want to make with respect to Hegel is that contingency is an integral part or a necessary part of the historical pro uh, process. 
Contingency is ingrained in the very fabric of that which is. So uh, in one word, contingency does have a place on the, on the ontological level. Maybe that's not that crazy. Maybe this is something that we all know. Uh, maybe this is something that has been well discussed within Hegelian scholarship. But what about Spinoza? This is, of course, the much harder nut to crack. Is it possible to claim that contingency has any ontological relevancy uh, when we know that the substance is eternal and that God could not have been different and so on and so on? So within the Hegelian field, of course, there is a great number of serious works written on the question of contingency, and of course Hegel himself wrote some of them, uh, but I was able to find only a handful of articles discussing uh, the topic in Spinoza. And even those are quite often part of actually Leibniz scholarship. Why is that so? It seems that Spinoza gives us a very good reason for this, which is, in nature there is nothing contingent. But all things have been determined from the necessity of the divine nature to exist and produce an effect in a certain way. Okay, case closed, we can go home, right? <laughs> so everything I will say from this point onwards is obviously going to be crazy. Uh, I know this, so please, and it's a thought that I'm entertaining and I'm inviting you to entertain it with me. Okay, so we know that this is going to be crazy. To make things even clearer, Spinoza declares in the first scolium to Proposition 33 that on the ontological level, he permits no contingency. Nothing is merely possible. Everything is completely determined by its causes. Everything is either necessary or impossible. I mean, he makes that point many times. However, as soon as Spinoza moves to the human capacity to understand nature and its phenomena, things get complicated. Spinoza writes, but a thing is called contingent only because of a defect of our knowledge. Uh, Spinoza situates con contingency in a defect of human knowledge. It is very clear what Spinoza is saying, I think, here. Uh, things only appear to us as contingent, whereas in truth, on the ontological level, they are not. Or in Spinoza's own words, for if we do not know the thing's essence involves a contradiction, or if we do know the very well that its essence does not involve a contradiction and nevertheless can affirm nothing certainly about its existence because the order of causes is hidden from us, it can never seem to us either necessary or impossible, and so this is the reason we call it contingent or possible. It's kind of a complicated phrase, but it's, I think, you know, very clear at the same time. So we call something contingent or possible only because the order of causes is hidden for us, from us. We simply do not know the causes, and therefore we claim that something is contingent. Uh, so things that are contingent or possible only for us, for our defective vision, while in themselves, or as they are conceived in the divine mind, they are always either necessary or impossible. Whether we phrase uh, this in terms of ontology versus epistemology, or in a Kantian sense as a question of the difference between the thing in itself and the thing for us, Spinoza goes at great length to assure us that contingency never touches the substance itself. To claim otherwise would be to commit an obvious heresy. And as I mentioned earlier, many commentators have analyzed the criticism of Spinoza's concept of contingency that Leibniz made, but as our dear friend Vittorio Morfino, and I'm very happy that he's here, as our dear friend Vittorio Morfino elegantly shows, the critique of Leibniz is not really pertinent to, to what Spinoza says. But the really interest, uh, interesting thing, uh, the reason why I, I quote Morfino is because Morfino points out that Spinoza denies contingency of particular things not only on the level of causal relationship, since particular things are always uh, fully determined, but also and perhaps especially in the sense that they are not essentially contingent or not contingent by definition. So there's different ideas of what contingency could mean. But ultimately, Morfino argues that one could nevertheless speak about a radical contingency of things in Spinoza. He does, there, I did find someone who does that, and, it's, 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 it's our, and I'm, I absolutely support the crazy. I think this is, this is clear. 
So Morfina, being very careful and cautious, suggests that this could be inferred from the way things are radically dependent, both in their essence and in their being, on the divine power. This does not mean that God can intervene at any point in a vertical act of free choice. Spinoza is, of course, very critical of the theological tradition that presupposes divine free will. Instead, what uh, Morfino calls radical contingency of things is, I quote, so this is from Morfino, radical contingency of things is precisely the fact that the essence and existence of each mode is given and can be thought of only within the complex web that is the ever-changing and never once for all given effect of divine self-production. So I take Morfino here to mean that the particular things are radically contingent to the extent that divine self-production produces an effect which is ever-changing and self-producing. Morfino stops short of claiming that it is God himself who in this self-production should be considered as ever-changing. And he elaborates a bit further and concludes his article with the following thought. Again, a quote from Morfino. Insofar as Proposition 25 holds that the very essence of things depends on God, Spinoza affirms the contingency of the form of things. And it is precisely the contingency of form that I propose to call radical contingency. Understanding cum tangere in the dual sense of having relationship, relationship to and occurring, happening. That is, Spinoza argues, and this is one of the most beautiful things I've read in Spinoza's scholarship, that is, Spinoza argues that the existence of all form, including that of man, is necessary only post festum. And this necessity has nothing essential about it, so the necessity has nothing essential about it, that is, it does not realize a pre-existing essence, but depends only on the complex relational web that produced its emergence, end of quote. So the, um, the important point for me is the idea of a post-festum necessity, a necessity which is only established post-festum, or an emergent but not pre-existing necessity. M Morfino, again, is very careful in making sure that he's only talking about the contingency of existing things. Nevertheless, by explaining the concept of necessity in this way, as a post festum uh, necessity, I think the genie has already been released from the bottle. As soon as we accept that, I mean, it changes how we perceive Spinoza's system in general, I think. Such a post festum necessity is precisely what I was discussing earlier, I think, with reference to Hegel as the logic of historical repetition. Uh, when I said that historical necessity of the rise of individual called Julius Caesar is a necessity only retroactively. This same point could be expressed in the following terms as well. It is not that Spinoza's God is simply that which is given, implying a passive quality of a thing in itself, but rather that Spinoza's God is that which we must conclude that was given, retaining in itself the quality of being pure activity. So it seems to me, and this is what I want to add on top of what Morfino said in his text, that with Spinoza, we come infinitely close to the Parmenidian identity of being and thought, but just as, as in the case of Hegel, we, we must conclude that such an identity can only be thought on the background of a strange retroactive temporality. Um, okay, and I'll give another example of crazy and bizarre thinker, uh, which kind of supports the crazy, and you will be surprised by who he is. It is none other than Pierre Macheret, really. In a text which is less known and even less debated by Pierre Macheret, it's called, the, the text is called um, Spinoza, End of History and the Rules of Reason. I kid you not, I prob you probably know it, but no one comments it. Um, okay, but before going there, let me discuss uh, specifically the question of divine providence, because I said, I mentioned earlier, that this is something that uh, connect, it's a kind of a fear rouge here. So let us take a look at Spinoza's criticism of divine providence. Discussing the question of whether contingency can be considered a cause, Aristotle 
famously discusses the example of stone falling and hitting someone. Uh, this is when uh, Aristotle discusses, uh, you know, aitia katasi mebekos, whether this could be possible. Uh, but this same example, this Aristotle's example, is picked up by Spinoza in order to dismiss the notion of divine providence. So Spinoza writes, is a, is a bit long example, but it's pretty fun, so let me read it. So Spinoza writes, for example, if a stone has fallen from a roof on someone's head and killed him, they, the followers of the doctrine of divine providence, will show in the following way that the stone fell in order to kill the man. For if it did not fall to that end, God willing it, how could so many circumstances have concurred by chance? For often many, cir uh, many circumstances do concur at once. Perhaps you will answer that it happened because the wind was blowing hard and the man was walking that way, but they will persist. Why was the wind blowing hard and at that time? Uh, why was the man walking that way at the same time? And if you answer again that the wind arose then because of the preceding day, while the weather was still calm, the sea began to toss, and, then the, that, and that the man had been invited by a friend, they will press on, for there is no end to the question which can be asked. But why was the sea tossing? <laughs> why was the man invited just at that time? And so they will not stop asking for the causes of causes until you take refuge in the will of God, that is, the sanctuary of ignorance. So it's a... It's a fun quote, right? Now, we can immediately notice that divine providence is a strange ally of Spinoza. It's a strange ally of Spinoza because just as Spinoza himself, divine providence also seeks to eliminate the notion of chance occurrence, okay? So it couldn't have been a chance God willed it, right? They are strange allies. Um, and Spinoza is critical of the idea of God acting out of free will, which is ultimately why he rejects divine providence to the cool. However, the only answer Spinoza offers us to this endless series of questions, why, which you know, in the end lead Leibniz to ask, but why is there being rather than nothing like a small child, right? <laughs> um, uh, what the only answer that Spinoza gives us is that God determined it so. Instead of God willed it so, Spinoza can only give us the answer, well, God determined it so. This is the only possible answer we can infer from Spinoza. It's, in other words, it seems to me that Spinoza does not even deny the legitimacy of cutting this endless series of questions and causes by taking a refuge in God. Spinoza seems to be satisfied with a much more limited claim that God is not the transient but imminent cause of any such chain whether we believe that such a chain has a beginning or not. And I want to note here that Hegel would actually be just as eager as Spinoza was in rejecting the doctrine of divine providence. Okay, so Hegel is also not like a naive adherent to the idea of divine providence. If one applied it to the of example of God pushing the stone and killing someone, this is what Hegel called the external teleology, and he ridiculed it with the same vigor as Spinoza ridiculed it. So, but what Hegel described as the inner purposiveness or of the process of knowledge is the idea that we might apply to Spinoza as well. Namely, that the necessity of that process is established only in the retrospect. So I have just one more page, that's four minutes, that's good? Okay, all right. Um, so now I want to mention the other heretic, the other crazy guy, Pierre Machret, surprisingly. Mashre be begins his, his crazy text where he discusses the question of rules of reason within Spinoza uh, by pointing out that in the political treatise, as well as in the theological political treatise, Spinoza assumes that he is speaking from a point of view of history which is already finished. However, at the same time, Mashre absolutely rejects that Spinoza is suggest su suggesting that philosophers should satisfy themselves merely with the pleasure of knowledge. This ultimately leads Mashre to write. I'll show you some crazy. Mashre says, it must be said then that in a sense, history is never finished. He puts it directly. But that history always pursues beyond its current forms a movement of production which, if it alters none of its essential conditions, indefinitely varies the forms in which the latter are realized. 
So Spinoza's realism, the idea of you know, speaking from the point of view of already finished history, Spinoza's realism leads him to consider an open history for which any present moment never has anything but the relative nature of an occasional manifestation and not that of an absolute expression. History is endless and without ends because it necessarily depends on causes which always act in it. Whatever the conjunctures that establish the concept of their, whatever the conjunctures that establish the context of their interventions. End of quote. So Machuridas arrives to an apparently contradictory claim that Spinoza discusses the openness of history or the open-endedness of historical process precisely through the adoption of the perspective of a supposedly already finished history. And the only way Machre, uh, the only way for, for Machre to think through this apparent contradiction is ultimately the Hegelian way, through a special version of the idea of the rules of reason. In Spinoza, Machre says, the idea of the rule of, rules of reason takes the meaning that behind all collective motivations, one must find, I quote, the necessary because strictly causal determination of the passions, end of quote. And furthermore, Machre argues in an Althusserian manner that the process of right, of law, justice, in political sense, is a process without the subject, a very clear Althusserian uh, phrase, which I take to mean that the historical political process is ultimately outside of the domain of particular individuals and their passions or affects. So Machre does not quite put this into words, but the apparent contradiction between the openness of history on the one hand and its already finished state in the analysis on the other hand is precisely what I phrased uh, in reference to Hegel as the problem of the retrospective, even retroactive temporality uh, of the actuality. And so even, um, even if Spinoza's metaphysics vehemently denies that contingency has an ontological dimension and rejects the idea of divine providence in the sense of external teleology as ludicrous, we could, I suggest, argue that Spinoza would perhaps not object entirely to Hegel's specific take on these two notions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gregor. I'm sure there are questions. Okay. Okay, Giovanna, Zana. Can you hear? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Gregor. And um, actually, I just want to. Uh, no, yeah. it's what? No, yeah. it's my fault. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm not convinced that. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm. I want to ask you if you can say a little bit more, because when you talk about Spinoza and you talk about this char characteristics of this post festum mm -hmm. uh, necessity of uh, contingency, that in this way we can understand contingency in this post festum, and you want to. And somehow put this in relation to Hegel, and then in relation to Hegel, then you talk about this historical acts, historical gesture, and but it seems to me there is something lacking there because one character, one one of the characteristics of the historical gestures is that, of, of course, in one moment you can say this is totally rational, but just because it's totally rational, it also contains the possibility to be to become irrational because in, in the story of development. So there is this thing that is rational in one moment on the point of view of the historical development for the point of view of the, of the spirit of the world, but then it, it can change. And I, I don't see this in Spinoza, so and also now you finish with this openness of history. So I just wanna, if you can say a little bit more about this. Right. Um, so again, I'd have to stress that this is you know, we're, I'm just entertaining a thought here. Um, and I think that both Spinoza and Morfino, which I quote, are careful enough, you know, to say that on the metaphysical level, you probably cannot 
discuss this because it doesn't make any sense because it would, you know, it just Spinoza wouldn't be Spinoza anymore. Uh, but the reason why, um, why Machere discusses history is because if he wants to discuss the political implications of Spinoza's metaphysics, he feels that he has to. Uh, and I suppose, you know, the general background of this question, if I can show my card, so to speak, the general background of this question is obviously Marx. Marx is someone who you can consider as an ally of Spinoza, and Marx is someone who was, of course, immensely important for Pierre Machere's work and thinking, but also someone who does think historically. And I think the ultimate problem for, uh, you know, any Spinozist, uh, sorry, any Marxist who would want to use, make use of Spinoza would be that Spinoza doesn't really have a good or any concept of history at all. Uh, that in a sense, Spinoza's uh, concepts, if we take them on a metaphysical level, are ahistoric. Um, Spinoza doesn't really have a good uh, theory of time even. Like he does talk about time, infinity, infinitude, he does, yes. But like in comparison to other thinkers who have devoted like volumes of thought on this, specifically on Marx and the historical developments, you know, Spinoza is clearly lacking. So I would say that this is uh, a kind of negotiation with Spinoza. You want to appreciate Spinoza's political treatise and Spinoza's uh, theological political treatise, but you also want to, you know, push or test his concepts as to, to what extent are they malleable to Marxism. Like this would, uh, the claim would be, of course, that history is <laughs> something that, you know, Spinoza could have or even should have thought about. And this is why they, these authors would push Spinoza's uh, thought to the very limit. And of course, you can make a mistake and then claim that Spinoza's God is a God that changes, which, you know, on a metaphysical level, is probably not. So I, I, I hope this answers your concerns. Um, the open history that I think Machere wants to defend is obviously uh, something that Machere wants to, um, Machere wants to deny that Spinoza was a fatalist. This is what, uh, what, uh, what Machere wants to do. Spinoza was definitely not a fatalist. And therefore, if we want to make any sense of, uh, of his political thought, we have to drop the notion that determinacy means that there is no change. Um, and uh, Pina Totaro on Wednesday actually found a really good, I'm not sure if she's here today. <laughs> oh, sorry, I don't, oh, hi. So she found a really good uh, reference in, uh, in uh, uh, Spinoza's letter to Oldenburg, where he says really directly, I am not a fatalist. When I talk about necessity of things, I am not a fatalist. I do not talk about fate. The, the world is not fated. And so, yes. It is possible to defend op uh, the idea of open history in Spinoza. I think. Uh, maybe if we ask um, two more questions, at least Zanon first, and then Alison. Uh, thanks, Gregor. It was really most of the evening, uh, and I enjoyed it a lot. Do you recall it as a crazy idea? I don't know. Well, I put it on, but it doesn't work. I don't know why. No. I think it maybe just takes some time. You hear me? Yeah, yeah. I hear m myself, uh, at least. Uh, since you were talking that it's a crazy idea that there could be a, th a thought of contingency uh, uh, in Spinoza itself. And then, after your thought-provocating presentation, I just asked myself, what would you think that maybe it was Deleuze who had a kind of uh, Spinoza's con contingency already? If you think that he even uh, like it, it was a vitalist contingent thinking uh, with Spinoza. If you just think how he thinks the virtuality, which is infinite, and how virtuality actualizes itself, and how the difference repeats itself, and this is actually um, a way of thinking contingency with Spinoza par excellence. And how would what you? Like, how, how would you relate? I would say absolutely yes. Uh, 
the, the only reason why I didn't go into Deleuze was simply because I did that years ago. So <laughs> I wanted to explore other authors. That's the only reason. But yes, of course, Deleuze would be a... No, 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 it's not your ignorance. It's, uh, I should have mentioned probably Deleuze is a good example of someone who also devoted his life work, if you want to say, or at least his doctoral thesis, you know, to try to pursue the crazy in Spinoza. Okay, uh, Anton? Does it work? Yeah. Uh, so I have a, one question on Hegel and another on Spinoza. On Hegel, well, I was surprised to, to hear you kind of initially said that yeah, he's a Parmenidian thinker and it, it appears that uh, contingency has no place or has no ontological value because, well, I mean, he's critical of Parmenides. He thinks Parmenides is, is at best the sort of first step, which, you know, like is of Gehoben. And as far as contingency, it's, I think it's everywhere in Hegel's uh, actual system, right? I mean, uh, you talked about one example uh, yeah, in the history, but it's also yeah, it's it's in nature. Of yeah, course. It's uh, the realm of contingency and subjective spirit, ob objective spirit, you know, like everywhere. So, yeah, that was a bit, like, seemed like, yeah, obviously, there, <laughs> there is uh, plenty of place of contingency in Hegel. And then even when he says, yeah, it, it's sh something that should be overcome theoretically and practically, that if we need to overcome it practically, it already presupposes that it is a, like it exists, right? It sort of gives us some kind of resistance. Uh, so yeah, he that's on Hegel, but I guess ultimately you sort of agree with it. Uh, uh, but Spinoza, I just want to clarify this concept of post-festum necessity, I guess. So what exactly does it mean? Um, so does it mean that some things are not causally determined, by determined by prior causes? Because I think then that would be wrong, uh, even human actions, like you said uh, many times, right? It's determined by prior causes which of which we are not conscious, right? So that's why we think we are free. Or maybe it can mean that uh, this chain of causes itself is, like some of the formulations seem to suggest that, uh, yes, yeah, so, the, the chains of causes themselves are contingent. So uh, that, then it would be some, a position, some sort of like uh, Edwin Curtis, right? That, yeah, he's uh, not a necessitarian, but a causal determinist, but the causal chains themselves are contingent, right? So something like that. Is that what, where you're going to or not? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Anton. So, yeah, I think you've responded your own question with regard to, to Hegel. My, uh, it was just the initial uh, push, like initial sort of thing to say. Like, I mean, there's a reason why, uh, why, why Hegel would say that the beginning is the beginning with philosophers like Parmenides who deny that contingency, like this is the beginning of science. Contingency is nothing. It is only in the second step that Hegel develops this thought a little bit further. With regard to Spinoza, so the way I understand this post-festum necessity, ultimately it would mean that you cannot reduce all causality to efficient causality, which of course, again, is heretical to think in Spinoza. Um, but yes, this would, be, this would be the idea. And of course, Spinoza shows really cl clearly how external teleology is basically ridiculous. But I feel that that's not a problem for thinkers like Kant or Hegel or any other thinkers who, who would nevertheless think about the divine providence as having some sort of, making some sort of sense. Um, so, and I suppose my, my, ultimate, uh, my ultimate claim would be, which is what I said at the end, that, you know, if Spinoza had heard of the Hegel, the specific Hegel version of divine providence, he might not necessarily be so much against it as he is against the ludicrous notion of, of divine providence. Um, this is all I'm saying. So post-fistum necessity already implies that there's, you know, that you cannot explain everything th merely through, um, through, uh, through uh, efficient causality. And uh, with regard to uh, the question of, you know, does that mean that there is some freedom or contingency on the level of, um, the very choice of the, of the causal chains? No, absolutely not. 
That would probably be Leibniz. Leibniz has this idea of possible worlds. Like once you have a world, it's strictly necessitarian. But there's possible worlds. Uh, Spinoza, no, absolutely not. So if you can talk about uh, causality, which is, uh, which is not reducible to efficient causality, I think you have to start talking about imminent causality. This is where, uh, this is where you can, you know, this is where you, you can find some the divergence from the strict efficient causality that otherwise he professes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gregor, again. So. Uh, so, welcome at the afternoon session. Our next speaker is Dauko Kobe, the professor of German classical philosophy here at the University of Ljubljana. He has published um, the Trilogy Ottoman Transcendentale um, on Kant and also another book on Kant called Three Studies in Kant's Practical Philosophy, as well as numerous articles, especially on Kant and Hegel. He's also the Slovenian translator of several classical works, including the Critic of Pure Reason, Science of Hegel's Science of Logic, and Elements of the Philosophy of Right. So please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I Ja, alle zuerst herzlich begrüßen. Äh, dann muss ich äh, aber um eine äh, Entschuldigung bitten. Nämlich, ich wollte meinen Beitrag äh, auf Deutsch geben. Äh, warum? Weil ich äh, denke, dass es aus kulturellen und politischen Gründen wichtig ist, dass man äh, in verschiedenen Sprachen spricht, sagen wir. Leider, leider, alas, habe ich aber keine Zeit dafür gehabt und so äh, bin ich beim Englischen geblieben und also mein Vortrag wird auf äh, äh, Englisch äh, gegeben werden. Dennoch, aber ich bitte um, um Entschuldigung, ich habe, okay. Uh, the title of my paper is The Political Form of uh, the Hegelian Concept on the Influence of Spinoza Political Philosophy on Hegel's Metaphysics and I will basically try to, let's say, verify this thesis. The thesis that Spinoza's, that it was Spinoza's political philosophy that may have influenced Hegel's conception or emergence of the Hegel's new conception of reason and thus um, his entire speculative philosophy in the late uh, Jena period. And I will do it in three steps with an, let's say, open ending. Um, it is not necessary, I, I believe, here to emphasize the massive presence of Spinoza in Hegel's formative years. Let us just recall three short points. First, the reception of Spinoza in Germany was shaped by the so-called Pantheismus or the Spinozismus Streit, as Jacobi famously declared that there is no other philosophy than philosophy of Spinoza. Hegel was formed under the, under the impact of this conviction, and he initially read Spinoza in the, uh, in the light of Jacobi interpretation. Second, all three Tübingen room, room, roommates, uh, Hölderlin, Schelling, Hegel, professed their sympathies for Spinoza. And this is particularly true of Schelling, who uh, in a letter to Hegel, 95, declared that he had become a Spinozist. We know that. And third, in uh, 801, when Schelling finally revealed, revealed, published his philosophical system, uh, the Identitätsphilosophie, this system was in form and content presented as a version of Spinozism. And I think that this has important implications for Hegel as well. For in the early Jena years, he was perceived and acted as a follower of Schelling. Even Hegel's procedure of Selbstvernichtung der Reflexion from the Differenzschrift is in this respect, I could say, uh, we could say, uh, a variant of Schelling's conception of cognition in which the finite is recognized as identical with the absolute. Considering the place of Spinoza in the early Hegel, we can say that Hegel became Hegel by distancing himself from Spinoza. 
distancing himself in a typically Hegelian manner by using a determinate negation. It is therefore no coincidence that in the place of strategic importance in the preface to the Phenomenology of Spirit, Hegel declared, we know, as kommt meine Einsicht alles darauf an, das wahre nicht als Substanz, sondern ebenso sehr als Subjekt aufzufassen und auszudrücken. The declaration obviously is so general that it lends itself to a variety of interpretations. However, it is quite natural to, re to read it, as it was done before, in relation to Spinoza. And in my view, there are at least two different ways of reading it in relation to Spinoza in general and Spinozismus Streit in particular. On the one hand, we must recall that according to Jacobi, any consequent philosophy necessarily leads to Spinozism or philosophy and Spinozism. But since he, uh, he presented Spinozism as a system of universal mechanism, it follows further that once the standpoint of philosophy is adopted, everything related to subjectivity, from freedom to art and love, turns out to be unthinkable and impos impossible. So, Jacobi continued, if we are not prepared to embrace such a consequence, we must also reject the premises from which it necessarily flows. And that is, we must abandon, we must reject the standpoint of philosophy. The alternative then would be either Spinozism or no philosophy, either substance or subject. Es gibt kein Drittes. Hegel basically acknowledged the pertinence of Jacobi's diagnosis. As we know, he said in his lecture of philosophy, Spinoza is Hauptpunkt der modernen Philosophie, and entweder Spinozismus oder keine Philosophie. Uh, one can add, es gibt kein Drittes. But, even if in his very early writings, Hegel rejected the alternative, asserting, es gibt ein Drittes, sagt dagegen die Philosophie, und es ist dadurch Philosophie, dass ein Drittes ist. According to Hegel, philosophy is bound to accept the universal validity of rational thought. This is, in a sense, the condition of its being philosophy. This is the other name, synonymous of uh, be, to being philosophy. Thus, philosophy cannot but start by assuming the standpoint of the substance, if it wants to be philosophy. It is of equal importance, however, that it does not remain there, but is able, from this very st standpoint, to produce the dimension of the subjectivity. The present task of philosophy would therefore be to remain faithful to philosophy, that is, to think through a substance, and yet precisely by insisting on it to succeed in thinking the dimension of freedom, life, and love, that is, to think the true also as subject. Let's say that this could be a material way of reading uh, our programmatic declaration with reference to Spinoza. But the question remains how to do it, how to think what, according to Jacobi, philosophy is incapable of thinking. How should substance, so to speak, subjectify itself? At this point, we must proceed to what I would call formal reading of the declaration. In Jacobi's and Hegel's view, Spinoza was not only the main philosopher of substance, but also a paradigmatic example of a certain conception of thought, of a certain mode of demonstration, which he called mos geometricus. In fact, the two go hand in hand. The problem is that on this model of thinking, the thoughts are treated as things, and they're held together by the same logic that characterizes mechanism. Nowhere is this more evident than precisely in Spinoza, who claims, we know, that ordo et connexio idearum, idem est ac ordo et connexio rerum. But if ideas indeed behave like the paradigmatic billiard balls, then we are obliged to accept something like mechanism of ideas, beside the mechanism of the matter. Or, 
to put it in another way, in this case, along with the usual materialism of matter, we should also speak of materi materialism without matter. And this is, this is how, uh, this is what Jacobi did, use this expression. And this can only mean that as long as this conception of thought, this conceptual, conceptual regime is in charge, we are still enclosed in the same metaphysics of substance. This is the formal definition of what is uh, to stand on the uh, in within the metaphysics of substance. And this is precisely, precisely Hegel's point in his programmatic declaration, I would say. In his view, Kant and Fichte replaced the traditional objective metaphysics with a subjective metaphysic. So, yes, they do that, did that, but otherwise, they left its metaphysical structure, its model uh, of rationality, the same, intact. And since this is the decisive point, they thus both remained at the standpoint of, the, of mere substance. Therefore, in order to think the true also a subject, it is imperative to develop a different comprehension of the logica logical, ein veränderter Ansicht des Logischen, über das Logische, a new conceptual regime that would enable us to think what otherwise, otherwise was unthinkable. In Hegel, the traditional mechanical mode of thinking is usually called Verstand, Vorstellung, and the new rationality is called Vernunft oder Begriff. The task of philosophy would therefore consist in replacing the conceptual regime of understanding with that of reason. Two very brief remarks, however. First, Hegel's declaration does not imply that we should abandon uh, understanding altogether. On the contrary, it demands that we must still begin by thinking the truth as substance. There is no other way. That is, that we must first take the standpoint of understanding. It is only on this ground that we can then proceed further to the standpoint of reason. How? According to Hegel, understanding is inherently marked by negativity that is bound to manifest itself in the form of open contradiction if only we think its thoughts in a truly consequent way. Hegel insists that in spite of the contradiction or in the face of the, this contradiction, we must still persist in thinking persist in thinking it through. And by this, what he called verweilen by negativen, transform the negative into the positive. It is at this point that understanding becomes reason. Second, on the formal or methodological reading, the access or elevation to, the, to reason involves also a gesture of subjectivation. In fact, in a situation of internal contradiction, especially if it is not arbitrary, it is impossible to find a solution by means of logical necessity alone. Resolution can only be brought about by something excessive. And this can only be provided by the subject in a gesture of subjective decision. Hegel was clear enough, I think, about this. In his discussion of the method at the end of the science of logic, he says, in diesem Wendepunkt der Methode, kehrt der Verlauf des Erkennens zugleich in sich selbst zurück, zurück und so weiter. He speaks about turning point. And this is a turning point, because at this point, the thinking must turn its scope away from the objective content of thought determinations to the subjective form of thinking itself. It is the point at which the subject is compelled to assume the task of thinking in the first person and, let us say, to force a resolution. It is at this point, I would say, that some sense subjectivize. Good. If, then, is in his speculative philosophy, Hegel became Hegel by moving away from Spinoza, what he perceived as Spinozism. We will now see that in the field of political philosophy, the progress was exactly the opposite. 
At the beginning of his philosophical career, Hegel was, was full of admiration for the Greek ethical life. He was conceived, he was convinced that the ideal political organization was realized in the city-state of antiquity, where each individual was animated by the spirit of the community so that the particular and the universal coincided directly. In sharp contrast to the present-day state, which imposes itself Hegel's day's state, of course, but probably our days, our present day state as well, which imposes itself as something external and treats free men mechanically, the Greek polis was living, Hegel believed. It was organic. As, as each citizen existed only within the whole and for the whole. And it was beautiful, as there was no need for external constraint Everyone, it, everyone did what was required spontaneously out of immediate feeling. Thus, even in the Differenz Schrift in uh, 801, he still praised the true infinity of a beautiful community, referring to the Greek uh, ethical life. And, Sittlichkeit, and in the system of ethical life in um, 802, he continued to write that in the ethical life, the individual exists in an eternal mode, adding that his empirical being and doing is something downright universal. So once again, the immediate coincidence of the empiric particular in its empirical reality and the universal. That was characteristic, supposedly, for Greek polis and for his idea of Sittlichkeit. Uh, but very soon, a year or two later, Hegel's position changed. On the one hand, he noticed that the Greek polis was not only beautiful, but also extremely fragile. As soon as a subject appear in its mid appeared in its midst, a subject that was prepared to insist on her, her particularity to the very end, as was the case with Antigone, the beautiful communi community was bound to perish. The problem was that there was no place in it for protesting. And Hegel said, es, find, es findet kein Protestieren hier statt, with an obvious allusion to the Protestantism. In this sense, the problem of the Greeks were, were, was, was that they were not Protestants. In this sense, the Greek polis uh, turned out to be uncannily close to Fichte's overregulated police state since they both weren't able to allow uh, for the subjective particularity. And this was one. And on the other hand, Hegel now realized that within the state, a space, or realized, affirmed, that within the state, a space for such autonomy had to be opened. As early as uh, 803, he asserted, I quote, der Mittelpunkt als Staatsgewalt, die Regierung, muss, was ihr nicht für ihre Bestimmung notwendig ist, der Freiheit der Bürger überlassen. Und ihr muss nicht so heilig sein, als das freie Tun der Bürger in solchen Dingen gewähren zu lassen und zu, und zu, und zu stützen, ohne alle Rücksicht auf Nutzen, denn diese Freiheit ist an sich selbst heilig. Now the epithet of happy people, das glückliche Volk, no longer refers to the Greeks, but to a people living in a state that maintains a space for free activity. Also, das freie Tun der Bürger muss, uh, muss uh, gestützt, von dem Staate nun gestützt werden. Hegel now sees the defining feature of the modernity in this higher divide, where one knows oneself as the essence, and although separated from the existing universal, is still absolute. Although separated from the uh, uh, univers uh, existing universal, is still absolute. The subject becomes absolute against the substance. What caused Hegel to change his position? As always, it was brought about by an interplay of different lines of influence, one of them being certainly the so-called new science of uh, political economy. However, 
as has been convincingly shown by Thierry Guin, the most uh, direct influence comes from Spinoza's political philosophy. Uh, it is known, namely, that in that time, Hegel collaborated with Paulus on his edition of Spinoza collected works. It is therefore certain that at least by then, he had become familiar with the Tractatus Theologico Politicus. That is clear, obvious. In addition to that, however, Kiregin has inventively demonstrated, to my opinion, that Hegel must have also read the Tractatus Politicus, and which is extremely important since the latter Tractatus Politicus inhabits a very different conceptual landscape. Interestingly enough, uh, the two treatises are uh, often treated uh, together, you know, in the, uh, in the both treatises. Now, there is a huge difference between the two, in, and that has to be stressed. Um, so, uh, Kiregin proved that he must have read Tractatus Politicus and that some of Hegel's formulations uh, comes, come directly from there. Indeed, not only the pronounced rejection of political utopias, even the model of substance and subject, this time understood in the political sense, can be convincingly traced back to Spinoza's treatment of the relation between the state and the citizen in his Tractatus Politicus. As we know, Spinoza scandalously identifies right with power, and since the state consists of the multitude united, multitudo una velutimente ducta, its power, and therefore, according to Spinoza, its right, over a particular seems to be unlimited, but only seems to be unlimited. Because Spinoza argues that the state cannot do whatever it pleases, for even uh, the state has something to fear. In general, the state has no right to do anything that would lead to its ruin or diminish its power. It is, for instance, obliged to follow the precepts of reason. If it acts against the precepts of reason, the power of the state diminishes, so it acts uh, actually uh, against itself, and this is not an action, it doesn't come, so, and, and so on. Further, it has no right to do anything that would arouse the indignation of the majority or set the multitude against the government. And most interestingly, according to Spinoza, the state has no right to do those things that no one could be made to do under any circumstances. For instance, Spinoza says, no one can forsake one's faculty of judgment. And this means that however powerful the state may be, it is still bound to recognize the subject's freedom of thought, or else the state would perish. This or would be bound to perish. This is why we can affirm that in Spinoza's political philosophy, the true should be thought not merely as an ethical substance, but also a subject. However, there is more, I believe. We have already seen that Spinoza's political philosophy had a marked influence on Hegel's political philosophy in the Jena period, and indeed, uh, and beyond. Indeed, Hegel's mature conception of the modern state is heavily indebted to Spinoza, even down to the very vocabulary. And my favorite uh, example uh, in this respect would be the use of indignatio in Spinoza and empörung um, in Hegel, or Unio in uh, Spinoza, and uh, die Vereinigung als solche in, uh, uh, in Hegel. And th th there could be a whole list compiled in this, uh, in this sense. Now, however, th this is then, let's say, clear. Now, however, we are going to suggest that this influence extended into the realm of, the s of speculative philosophy as well, even to the very form of Hegel's new conceptual regime. To this end, we must next turn to Spinoza's account of different political forms. 
Since for Spinoza, the power of the state is defined by the power of the multitude, his state is inherently democratic. The power always uh, stem from the people in uh, Spinoza. In his view, the various forms of government, and following the tradition, Spinoza speaks of monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. These various forms of go government differ only in the question of who is in charge of the state affairs. But it, the sovereign is always the same. The power comes always from the same source, from the multitudo una velotimente ducta. However, each of these forms has specific instruments and is exposed to specific dangers. And so Spinoza develops a dedicated model for each of them. Let's say a kind of ideal type in which its basic principle is consistently applied to all state institutions. Monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy are thus for Spinoza at the same time uh, three different logics three different regimes of political conceptuality. And let us now uh, briefly examine one by one. The, uh, first, democracy. And first, we must admit that, unfortunately, uh, we do not know how Spinoza's theory of democracy looked like. Some uh, indications suggest that he considered it the most perfect form of the government, since only therein the power is completely absolute, as Spinoza says. But it also seems that he considered it the most unstable form of government, since he believed that all states were originally democracy. But we see that by now they're not. So it's not the most stable and the no most powerful form of government. But be that as it may, uh, the chapter of the, on democracy remained, remained unfinished. As we know, composing it, Spinoza, a few pages too late, it was said, died. Uh, according to Spinoza, the difference between a democracy and aristocracy, to, who, to which we turn now, consists not in the number of those who participate in the government, but in the mode of their nomination. Whereas in democracy, they are designated by the law, in aristocracy, the so-called patricians are elected to the office. For Spinoza, aristocracy is primarily a system of elections in which the permanently elected patricians elect new members of the Supreme Council, which handles the state's affairs. In describing the inner structure of an aristocracy, Spinoza paid a special attention to the relationship between the Supreme Council and the people. He insisted, for instance, that the number of elected patricians should be quite large, so that every individual member of society could entertain the hope of one day be being elected to the Supreme Council. On the other hand, however, the fundamental principle of a robust aristocracy requi requires that the governing council Thank you. Should be, as Spinoza says, independent and completely safe from the multitude. Independent from the multitude. Spinoza justifies these requirements by the great number and composition of the Supreme Council. Since it is large enough not to be subject to ordinary human weaknesses, since it is diverse enough to be directly informed of every single matter, and since it is composed of the best, who are supposed to be guided by reason, it is safe to assume that the members of the council are capable of reaching the best decision on everything by themselves. And we could add, by themselves only. And so Spinoza claims, every declared will of the council must therefore necessarily be law. But in order to function well, it is essential that the Supreme Council is not interfered with or exposed to outside influences. Therefore, the patricians must be separated from the people. And aristocracy must be arranged in a such a way that, I quote, the multitude would represent a minimal object of fear to the rulers. 
The people would thus be, quote, debarred both from offering advice and from vo voting. They, they would be debarred from offering advice. No one needs in aristocracy uh, 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 advice of the, any advice of the people, not to mention the, vo the voting. And in general, therefore, the people would have no political rights. And uh, then at the end, monarchy. In monarchy, the exercise of power is in principle conferred on one, a prince, a king, or a monarch. But the power of one is essentially weak and precarious. Due to the inevitable limitations of human nature, one is unable to perform the task of governing alone, to have the knowledge to reach the best conclusions, or the strength to put them into practice. There is no figure more pathetic than a king thinking he's a king. His independence is, in fact, in inverse proportion to his um, supposed power, so that for his own safe, safety, the king must rely closely on the multitude. This is the uh, connection that, Hegel, uh, that Spinoza establishes in monarch, uh, uh, monarchy. Uh, I quote, the king is most fully in control of his own right when he is most concerned for, for the welfare of his people. From there it follows, first, that the monarch needs counselors or advisors to conduct the affairs of the state for the common good. They will govern in the monarch's name, of course, so that any decree they make must be considered the monarch's will and be subject to his approval. But on the other hand, and this is again uh, for his own good, the monarch will not have the right to express his opinion on anything that has not been submitted to him by his advisors. In Spinoza's well-ordered monarchy, I quote, all law is explicit will of the king, but not everything willed by the king is law. The monarch must also remain as, clo as, as close as possible to the multitude. Spinoza gives several reasons for this. For example, that in the event of monarch's death, the state dies too, in a sense, and the supreme power naturally returns to the multitude, or that the multitude freely transfers to a monarch only that which is absolutely beyond its capacity to possess, namely, I quote, a facility for settling the disputes and for making rapid decisions, the facility of, for making decisions. But be that as it may, Spinoza argues that a monarch is obliged to involve the people to let them participate in the state's affair as much as possible, and to conduct all the business with the knowledge of the citizens. And so, Spinoza concludes that, I quote, a people can preserve quite a cons considerable degree of freedom under a king, provided that it ensures that the king's power is determined only by the people's power and depends on the people for its maintenance. This is uh, monarchy. If we now compare, if we now compare the three different lodges of power in Spinoza, we must first admit that his death was indeed no, uh, no accident. As Balibar has noted, democracy is rather a name for a cer certain conceptual blockade. This blockade is closely related to the problem that the state is a mode of how the multitude establishes a relation to itself. How? Spinoza says, it keeps it within certain borders. Consequently, according to Balibar, democracy is a self-contradictory concept. And this is probably the reason why Spinoza speaks of it in hypothetical terms. And he says, for the absolute power, si quot datur, which is not certain, is really that which is held by the people as a whole. So, Putting aside the democracy, whose status is unclear, and which in the form of, the, of contemporary representative democracy resembles Spinoza's uh, uh, aristocracy anyway, the other two forms of government offer two different modes of governance. Let us say two different logics of power. 
The inner principle of the aristocratic regime require, requires that all power should be in the hands of those who, possesses, who possess the necessary skills and know the relevant reasons. Every conclusion they reach is, as such, law. The people would be of no use here. On the contrary, they would only disturb those who know best and prevent, prevent them from reaching the best conclusion. In aristocracy, therefore, the logic of power is self-contained, based entirely on objective reasons and external to those to whom it refers. In well-ordered mono monarchy, on the contrary, the task of governance is in principle split, divided between three different instances, the monarch, the councillors, and the people. In practice, the monarch's power exists in name only, while the real power lies in the hands of the councillors, or the government, who handle the technical side of the political job. They are the ones who possess the objective knowledge and skills. It must be remembered, however, that they govern on behalf of the monarch and that without his I will, to use this time Hegel's expression, their decrees have no binding force. The monarch has no right to act arbitrarily and is not allowed to pronounce any opinion on its own. In normal circumstances, his role is purely formal, one might say. Under certain conditions, however, the monarch's approval must assume a material role as well. Namely, if the councillors are unable to reach a conclusion, that is, if they happen to contradict each other, the final determination is up to monarch, who is supposed to supplant the objective reasons with the excessive moment of subjective decision. In this sense, the monarchical regime of knowledge is essentially subjectivized, as opposed to the aristocratic one, which is objective. At the same time, this regime of power is not external to the people. Since the independence of the monarch is itself dependent on the support of the multitude, it requires the political existence of the people. In short, in monarchy, as opposed to aristocracy, the logic of power is inherently public, imminent, and subjective. I think you see by now what my point and the proposed interpretation is. Namely, in describing the aristocratic and monarchical mode of existing uh, power, Spinoza developed the logic of a political and the political state. And a political state is in, 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 in uh, Hegel uh, Verstandesstaat and the political state Vernunftstaat. But, and this is even more important, I hope you will also see that Spinoza's logic of aristocracy and the logic of monarchy correspond to two different conceptual regimes, which in Hegel are equally called Verstand und Vernunft. So, if our thesis, just what, one final remark, about the influence of Spinoza's political philosophy on the genesis or development of Hegel's speculative philosophy in the later Jena period is correct, this would have some interesting consequences. It would imply, for example, that Hegel, Hegel managed to overcome Spinoza, his, that is, his metaphysics, or what was considered to be his metaphysics, with the help of Spinoza himself, namely, with the help of his political philosophy. It was Spinoza the political that helped Hegel to overcome, to overcome uh, Spinoza the a metaphys metaphysician, or what was considered to be such. It would also mean that Hegel's philosophy is not political in its applications only, but that politics constitutes its internal logical structure, that political is the very form of its concept. In fact, even if this influence could not be verified, finally, or uni univocally, uh, the conceptual analysis of Hegel's monarchy, for example, taking into account the status and institution of knowledge and the role of the monarch therein, would already prove, I, uh, I think, this overlap between Hegel's logic and politics. 
In any case, I believe this influence was real. To me, it seems highly unlikely that Hegel would fail to see the systematic implications of the recent changes in his political theory. We have already touched on the following passage from the System of Ethical Life, System der Sittlichkeit. I, um, in der Sittlichkeit is also das Individuum auf eine ewige Weise. Sein empirisches Sein und Tun ist ein schlechtgen Allgemeines. Denn es ist nicht das Individuelle, welches handelt, sondern der allgemeine, absolute Geist in ihm. Die Ansicht der Philosophie von der Welt und der Notwendigkeit, nach welcher alle Dinge in Gott sind und keine, äh, keine Einzelheit ist. Aber was ist also die Ansicht der Philosophie von der Welt und der Notwendigkeit, nach welcher alle Dinge in Gott und, sind und keine Einzelheit ist? Das ist Spinozismus, das ist Substanz. At least that it was conceived. Also, die Ansicht der Philosophie ist für das empirische Bewusstsein vollkommen realisiert, indem jede Einzelheit des, Hand des Handelns oder Denkens oder Seins ihr Wesen und Bedeutung ganz allein im Ganzen hat. So, in, two, in 802, Hegel's spinozistic, or spinozistically inspired metaphysics of absolute substance, substance in his conception of ethical substance, his metaphysics and his political theory were congruent, harmonized with each other. And we, uh, as we have seen, Hegel drew an explicit parallel between the two in the uh, uh, quote just quoted. So when his political philosophy changed, and that was around 803, this must have produced appropriate effects in his general philosophical system as well. That, that would be the thesis. Once he recognized that the individual must retain her independence against the ethical substance, uh, das freie Tun, welche, welches an sich heilig ist, this was bound to affect his overall view regarding the mode of being of the finite things. And the fact that thinking, thinking things to the end leads to an open contradiction, which in this case no longer produce uh, self-destruction as before, identity with the uh, absolute. It would rather call for a tearing with the negative, which would transform it into something positive. Uh, and we will leave it there. Thank you. Okay, so we have three questions and about 10, 15 minutes. So, please, oh, more questions. Um, okay, so please. Um, Zdravko, thank you for this um, great instructive talk. I uh, take a lot. And such a luck is that today is my turn. Yesterday, um, you were talking about the missing role of the state, and now it's my turn to ask uh, the labor. Because I think that um, Hegel says in the in the history of um, in the history of no in the philosophy of history that what allowed the beautiful democracy in Greece to flourish was the fact that the citizens were exempt from labor, and I think that it is it is a major difference that that Hegel wrote in a time in which Adam Smith already wrote uh, the Wealth of the Nations. And he, he he understood the role of the labor in the um, in the in, in the modern state, and don't you think that it is a major difference between uh, Spinoza and Hegel, or do you think that Spinoza also had a kind of uh, idea and uh, on the role of the labor in the modern state? What would you say? Oh, thank you. Uh, first, the role of the labor in uh, Spinoza. Uh, once, once again, I have to um, confess I'm not a Spinoza Spinozist. Uh, I have read many times Tractatus Politicus, but I don't really remember that there is a lot of uh, discussion uh, of this, and this is significant, but please correct me. Now, it, it, 
Yes, and, and uh, the, uh, so this is uh, this is a subject that is uh, basically absent in in he, uh, Spinoza's political thought. And in fact, it is uh, in interesting to go deeper into the reasons for that because. Uh, Spinoza was nevertheless living uh, in, in uh, Holland, which was a major uh, Handelsstadt, um, uh, industrial uh, and financial center uh, of the national capitalism. So this strange uh, missing link, the strange absence of the question of the labor is uh, relevant, and I would uh, thank you for that. Uh, regarding Hegel, uh, I, I said that as always in, in these changes, uh, there were a lot of different lines of influence, uh, different lines of thoughts that were effective at the same time. So uh, it's, it is always, always difficult to pick one. We do it to make the thing simpler, the clearer. Hegel said, for instance, a great event, and uh, development of Hegel's philosophy is a great event in the history, such as uh, French Revolution has always uh, multiple of co causes, and uh, uh, understanding can pick up uh, one of them and highlight it and determine it, uh, call it uh, the cause. But it's not the, the, the sole cause. So yes, there was the question of labor uh, involved as well. Hegel read the... English Scottish uh, philosophers of the new of, uh, science of political philosophy, and Norbert Waschek made a wonderful book to, uh, to put together uh, the references. And it is clear that certain mode of, modes of rationality, that is, the, even the list of, list of Vernunft, is basically a version of uh, market coordination. So, yes, this is, this is something that was definitely involved in Hegel's reception, I would say, of Spinoza. Not of Spinoza directly, but in Hegel's re reception of Spinoza. That being said, uh, there was also um, a curious to me, very, 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 very strange uh, passage, uh, passages in uh, early Hegel, where he, in 82, uh, I glaube that it's uh, about uh, uh, scientific ways of dealing uh, the natural uh, right, where he introduces uh, two different types of uh, two, two different types of Zitlichkeit uh, of ethical uh, life, the absolute and rel relative one, and he divides the political existence be between the two, and the he includes he includes following here probably. Uh, Plato in excluding the workers, not necessarily the slaves, but the workers, uh, uh, um, to the, uh, uh, as he says, politische nullität. So you're right. This, this, this line of thought uh, could be integrated, I would say, in this uh, narrative. Because, in fact, the, the, the solution proposed in that uh, uh, Nat nat natural light uh, right uh, shrift uh, was ob obviously defective, and Hegel Hegel was saw that that cannot stand stand in the modern world. Perhaps this is one of the reason why he then ad th 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 this is a guess now uh, why didn't he adopted something like uh, what I presented? Okay, so now we have uh, Professor Fivek. Just too many questions, and uh, ten minutes. Please be short. Uh, microphone. Okay. Yeah. Ja, vielen Dank. Ich habe eine Anmerkung äh, zu der These äh, Abwendung vom antiken Modell. Diese Abwendung beginnt von, aus meiner Sicht schon in Frankfurt. Das ist nicht äh, nur äh, die Jena-Zeit. Drei Punkte. Der Verfassungsentwurf, den du zitiert hast, der äh, ist schon in Frankfurt entworfen worden. Dann äh, gibt es schon in Frankfurt eine scharfe Kritik am Alt, an der, an der Polystruktur. Beispiel Altrömische. 
Polystruktur. Das ist also nicht jener Entwicklung. Und das System der Sittlichkeit, das ist nicht belegt, letztlich ist eine Beschäftigung, wird belegt durch äh, jener Vorlesung, eine Beschäftigung mit einem Denker, der hier äh, zu wenig äh, thematisiert ist, das ist nämlich Fichte. Fichte, der äh, beansprucht hat, ob äh, zu Recht oder nicht, dass er das erste System der Freiheit entwickelt hat. Und wenn das Zitat kommt, ja man muss äh, auch als Subjekt das auffassen, das ist natürlich äh, eine deutliche Be äh, Be ein deutlicher Bezug zu Fichte, zu Fichtes Denken von Freiheit. Also ich äh, bin etwas im Zweifel, ob da äh, 1802 Spinoza diese äh, entscheidende Rolle gespielt hat. Das geht schon Jahre vorher in Frankfurt. Okay, darf ich? Okay. Äh, es ging, natürlich, es ging nicht von äh, gestern nach heute und heute nach morgen, aber ich habe das äh, recherchiert und die Datierungen, wie sie stehen, heute, ich kann nicht dafür äh, persönlich stehen, äh, aber ich habe das nach, äh, nachgesehen und die Verfassungsentwurf ist nach der äh, äh, Referenzausgabe der, der, der gesammelten Werken eigentlich aus mehreren Schichten zusammengestellt und diejenigen, die von mir hier zitiert wurden, sind auf 803 datiert. Deswegen glaube ich, die Datierung und die Logik steht. Das alles, das alles nicht, nicht in diesem Sinne, das habe ich Okay, man, man kann das äh, nach, nachsehen, aber äh, so direkte Formulierungen äh, gibt es meiner Meinung nach nicht. Okay, thank you. One more question. Okay, two more. Uh, Miriam, Miriam, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Ah, nee, nee. Ähm, vielen Dank. Ich fand, fand das außerordentlich interessant. Ich möchte eine kleine Bemerkung ähm, zum Anfang machen. Du hast begonnen mit dieser Hegel-Jacobi-Spinoza-Konstellation. Und in dem Zusammenhang ähm, hast du gesagt, wir haben entweder mit Spinoza eine mechanistische Metaphysik oder gar keine Philosophie, in Adresse auch an äh, Hegels berühmte Formulierung, die er später gebraucht hat. Das ist nicht Jacobis Punkt. Ähm, es ist nicht die Frage, ob wir Spinoza haben oder gar keine Philosophie, sondern strukturell besteht die Herausforderung darin, die negative Beziehung, a negative relation, zu sehen innerhalb von Jacobis Doppelphilosophie. Er sagt Anti-Spinoza und er sagt später im, ähm, im Konflikt mit äh, Fichte, die, 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 die Dualität ist allein Philosophie oder Unphilosophie. Er sagt nicht Nicht-Philosophie. Nicht-Philosoph kann ich sein, indem ich überhaupt zu Hause bleibe oder fromm bin oder spazieren gehe. Aber wenn ich ein Unphilosoph bin, wenn ich ein Antispinoza, ein Vertreter des Antispinozismus bin, dann habe ich immer die Bezüglichkeit. Und das bedeutet, den Widerspruch zu denken. Das ist strukturell sehr wichtig. Und im Deutschen haben wir dazu das Wort Unphilosophie. Ich weiß nicht, welche Entsprechung man dafür im Englischen machen kann. Non-Philosophy äh, äh, erfasst das nicht. Deshalb habe ich mir auch erlaubt, jetzt diese kleine Bemerkung auf Deutsch zu sagen. Es ist eine Spezialität, die strukturell dann auch eine Herausforderung für Hegel ist, wenn er sagt, wir müssen eine neue Logik entwickeln. Danke. Okay, danke. Also es gibt so viele Variablen hier und es ist ziemlich schwer, das auseinanderzusetzen. Schon wenn man über die, der, den Spinozismusstreit oder Pantheismusstreit spricht, ist es ziemlich schwer zu differenzieren, 
also The Real Spinoza, Hegel Spinoza, Jacobi Spinoza, äh, dann wir haben in diesen Briefen nicht nur äh, Spinoza, sondern wir haben, und Jacobi, sondern wir haben auch Lessing und seine Argumentation. Dann wir haben eine, ähm, sagen wir, art, äh, argumentative Strate, Strategie, Strategie. Und was ich als, sagen wir, ähm, einleuchtend, äh, ein, das, als einleuchtendes finde, ist äh, Jakobis Weise äh, der, das, äh, der Argumentation, als er mit Spinoza gegen Spinoza argumentiert. Also mit der Philosophie gegen Philosophie. Alle die Konsequenzen. Ein Philosoph, äh, wenn, es, äh, wenn, wenn es konsequent ist, muss Spinozist werden. Das, äh, das, äh, das andere folgt von selbst. Mit Spinoza alle die Konsequenzen von einem Standpunkt zu entwickeln und da sie sich als, äh, 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 als unakzeptabel erweisen, kann man diese Position eigentlich nicht nehmen. Und in diesem Sinne glaube ich doch, dass solcherweise der Demonstration zu einer Alternative äh, 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 leitet, wenn das die einzige Weise der, der philosophischen Demonstration ist, entweder, äh, Philosophie, äh, oder entweder Spinozismus oder keine Philosophie. So. Ja, yeah, okay, ich weiß das. Okay, one more, please, very short question. Yes, very short question. Uh, many thanks for your presentation, which I find extremely convincing. What I am just missing is an explanation of Hegel's concept of power. Because you, thought a, you, you talked a lot about power, Macht, And that's a concept uh, 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 Hegel may well have taken from Spinoza. And behind Spinoza, there was somebody else who was Hobbes, but then, and, and, and usually quite often, uh, uh, commentators relate uh, Hegel's philosophy at that time in Jena to Hegel's political philosophy to, to, to Hobbes. But Hegel's concept of power changed at that time. So how do you see that concept at that time? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I must say that uh, in this particular case, it was be below my radar. Uh, I didn't follow it. I wasn't attentive enough. I know that later there is a Macht, Gewalt, uh, Kraft, and so on. But in that, yes, okay, I will, I will Look, look into it. Thank you. I don't really, I don't know. Okay, now Professor Litterati, very shortly. Okay, very shortly. Uh, I found uh, the contribution fundamental because I think that this reading that you proposed uh, gives us the possibility to better understand one of the most difficult topic uh, in the philosophy of right and the paragraph on the notion of the monarch. And uh, I wanted to ask you, in this paragraph, uh, I am referring to the paragraph uh, 279, uh, there are some uh, notions that, that are intertwined, uh, and I'm not sure to understand how to, uh, to, to move into these different notions. So, sovereignty is subjectivity. And then, uh, this, es ist dies das Individuelle des Staats. And then, we have to have not an Individualität, aber ein Individuum, der entscheidet. Und so, Subjektivität, Individualität, Individuum, Entscheidung. Wie, wie siehst du die Connects, uh, how do you see the connection between these 
uh, uh, diverse determinations in the light of your contribution? Oh, well, thank you. Um, uh, regarding the monarch, I think that uh, there is, in fact, even th 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 there is a conceptual parallel between Hegel's conception of concept and Hegel's conception of the state. This is, let's say, trivial. It must be so. Anything else would be against Hegel. Then that would mean that Hegel didn't hasn't hasn't accomplished what he uh, set set to do. Uh, but and I think that there are good reasons uh, that his conception of, of uh, monarch is as it is. It can in no way be uh, the, the case of um, uh, of, um, being compli complying to the to the uh, Prussian sta state. Mm -hmm. This line is completely, completely consistent from Jena to to all all the time. And okay, if to put just one um, to single out just one notion, this is individuality, ein individuum. I think that it's very important that the monarch in Hegel is uh, um, determined by birth that it is not elected, but given. Why? Because it is only in that way that the monarch um, functions as, as an ex exceeding element that is not derived, derived from the people. Uh, the other, if, if, if it was uh, elected, chosen as the best, then it would be expression of that people. Then there, there would be a concep conceptual linkage between the two. It would be a prolongation of the people. And uh, in his con conception, in Hegel's conception of the decision needed to overcome the contradiction, this uh, uh, decision has to be excessive. And this is why, you, 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 not that you don't need reasons why someone is monarch, you, you mustn't have any reason, it must, it, uh, it must be reasonless, without reason, pure positivity. And this is something that is given by nature. But there is uh, also other, uh, um, what is important is union uh, itself. Thank you. Okay, I think we need to stop now, thank you. Please, we're starting a session. Um, so the, the, um, he'll have the exactly um, the same amount of time as everyone, and so the pause will be a bit shorter then. So we're starting now. Um, Matteo Garau is a PhD student in history of philosophy at uh, Torino University. His doctoral dissertation, which is attended very shortly, deals with the influence of theological political treatise on Hegel's philosophy. So please. Also. Zuerst herzlichen Dank an die Organisatoren für die Gelegenheit, an dieser anregenden Tagung teilnehmen zu können. Die These meines Vortrags lautet, dass Hegels Denken vom theologisch-politischen Traktatus Spinozas beeinflusst wurde, bevor er sich ernsthaft mit der Metaphysik Spinozas beschäftigte. Ich möchte zeigen, dass Spinozas Traktatus eine wichtige Rolle in Hegels Jugendschriften sowie in der Entstehung der Dialektik und seines Systems spielte. <lacht> Meiner Meinung nach sind die Wurzeln von Hegels System tiefgreifend politisch und können nur verstanden werden, wenn man diesem Aspekt gebührende Aufmerksamkeit schenkt. Um meine These zu verteidigen, möchte ich zunächst kurz zeigen, dass ein relevanter Einfluss des Traktatus bereits in der deutschen Aufklärung spürbar ist, insbesondere in der lutherischen Theologie noch bevor Jacobi die Briefe veröffentlichte. Im 18. Jahrhundert entsteht in der moderaten offiziellen theologischen Aufklärung Deutschlands eine kritisch-historische Wissenschaft der Hermeneutik der Bibel, die sogenannte Neologie. Es ist ja unmöglich, weder eine umfassende Behandlung der historischen und theoretischen Bedeutung der Neologie darzulegen, noch die verschiedenen Positionen in dieser komplexen Strömung zu betrachten. Kurz ausgedruckt war die Absicht der Neologie, die authentische Offenbarung von vermuteten missbräuchlichen Nachträgen zu reinigen. Die Idee war, 
dass während der Geschichte ihrer Überlieferung die ursprüngliche Offenbarung, die an sich vereinbar mit der Vernunft sei, mit falschen, dogmatischen und willkürlichen Elementen vermischt wurde. Die Absicht gegenüber der Religion war dann apologetisch. Es gebe eine wesentliche Harmonie zwischen der authentischen, geoffenbarten Religion und der natürlichen Religion. Es ist für das hier betrachtete Thema wichtig zu betonen, dass diese Theologen einen riesigen Fortschritt in der historischen, kritischen Methode der Untersuchung der Bibel erzeugten, dass sie eine weite wissenschaftliche, hermeneutische Arbeit über die Bibel entwickelten. <lacht> Viele Forscher haben die These verteidigt, dass diese Strömung der Aufklärungstheologie in ihrer historischen Auffassung der Bibel und Religion stark und deutlich von Spinozas Traktatus beeinflusst wurde. Das theoretische Hauptproblem, das die neue Hermeneutik implizit vorstellte, war die Verbindung zwischen einer vernünftigen und natürlichen Religion und ihrer konkreten geschichtlichen Überlieferung. Man könnte auch sagen, die Verbindung zwischen einer absoluten Religion und der positiven Offenbarung oder auch, noch allgemeiner ausgedrückt, zwischen Vernunft und Geschichte. Dieses Problem wurde explizit auf einem philosophischen und theoretischen Niveau von einem der einflussreichsten Philosophen der deutschen Aufklärung ausdrücklich entwickelt. Lessing hat nämlich während der letzten zehn Jahre seines Lebens verschiedene Texte und Fragmente diesem Thema gewidmet und veröffentlicht. Sehr kurz zusammengefasst hat Lessing sowohl die deistische Position als auch die dogmatische in Bezug auf die Bedeutung der Bibel und der Religion wiedergelegt. Seiner Meinung nach ist die bloße buchstäbliche Bedeutung der Offenbarung nicht wahr. Das bedeutet aber nicht, dass die Offenbarung an sich ein Betrug sei. Sie hat wohl eine andere Art wahr zu sein. Die Wahrheit der positiven Religion sei ihr moralischer Inhalt, derselbe, der auch mit der Vernunft erreichbar ist. In diesem Sinn sei die positive Religion in Übereinstimmung mit der natürlichen es geht darum, dieselbe und identische Wahrheit der Vernunft auf verschiedenen Weisen zu vermitteln. Insbesondere eine Weise, die vor einer bestimmten Zeit geeignet war, in der die Vernunft noch nicht vollständig entwickelt war. Eine andere Weise, wie sich die Vernunft ausdrucken kann. Dieser vernünftige Inhalt, nämlich der Geist der Religion, musste sich in eine konkrete sinnliche Erscheinung verwandeln, weil die reine Selbstständigkeit der Vernunft noch nicht von den Menschen erreicht und vollendet wurde. Diese Idee ist klar und deutlich in der Erziehung des Menschengeschlechts dargestellt, aber auch in anderen Texten vorhanden. In diesem Werk stellt Lessing die Religion und die Erziehung gleich und behauptet, dass die Religion für das ganze Menschengeschlecht das ist, was die Erziehung für den einzelnen Mensch ist. Wie das Kind, bevor es der Autonomie der Vernunft und folglich der Freiheit fähig ist, der häuserlichen Autorität der Eltern bedarf, bedarf gleichfalls der Mensch davor der Autorität des häuserlichen Gesetzes der Offenbarung und der sinnlichen, positiven Religion. In diesem Sinn bezieht sich Lessing auf das Johannesevangelium und auf die dort gestellte Kategorie des Geistes. Er setzt eine Religion des Geistes und der Freiheit und eine Religion der Buchstaben und der Sinnlichkeit entgegen, insbesondere das Christentum und das Judentum. Trotzdem erkennt er an, dass das Judentum nicht falsch ist, sondern vielmehr eine Art, dieselbe vernünftige Wahrheit auszudrucken, die auf die geschichtlichen Bedingungen des hebräischen Volks in der Zeit, in der das Alte Testament geschrieben wurde, bezogen ist. Gerade auf die gleiche Beziehung auf das Johannesevangelium und die Kategorie des Geistes ist der Traktatus Spinozas bezogen. Auch in diesem Text werden das Judentum als Religion des Gesetzes und das Christentum entgegengesetzt. Der Zweck der ersten, 
sei es, einen weltlichen Staat zu stiften. Deswegen stellt Moses Gott als seinen König vor, der ihm und seinem Volk Gesetze vorschreibt. Im Gegensatz dazu sei die christliche Religion eine Religion der Freiheit. Im Christentum werde nur die Moralität, die Pietas und die Tugend als Gebot und Pflicht befohlen. <lacht> Nicht aber positive und häuserliche Riten und Zeichen. Trotzdem wird im Traktatus eine wichtige und notwendige Rolle der Vorstellung anerkannt. Imaginatio in Spinozas Worten. Obwohl die Religion Mosels als eine Religion der Knechtschaft und Sklaverei angesehen wird, wird aber klar und deutlich erklärt, dass sie nicht bloß falsch ist. Im Gegenteil, wird doch behauptet, dass die Weissagungen der Propheten des Alten Testaments einschließlich und insbesondere Moses wahr sind. Das könnte widersprüchlich ausklingen. Der Inhalt der Religion Moses ist als ein Produkt der Vorstellung bezeichnet, folglich etwas, was keine Verbindung mit der Vernunft und der Wahrheit haben sollte, und trotzdem wird ihn gleichzeitig als wahr anerkannt. Es gibt hier eine wirkliche Zweideutigkeit, nämlich wird eine Wahrheit des Falschen implizit theorisiert. Natürlich ist diese Art wahr zu sein nicht dieselbe der Wissenschaft und der Philosophie. Es geht nicht um Beweisen und Ableiten und trotzdem immer um die Wahrheit. Spinoza behauptet ausdrücklich, dass Moses Weissagung, die mit der Imaginatio und der Fantasie kommuniziert, denselben Inhalt der vernünftigen Moral mitteilt. Die positiven Elemente sind in dieser Religion wesentlich, weil sie nach den Bedingungen der Zeit und des Volks, in denen die Religion entstanden ist, gedacht, mitgeteilt und aufgefasst wurden und werden sollten. Anders gesagt, der reine Inhalt der Vernunft wird positiv durch die Geschichte. Oder auch besser, wird positiv durch ihre Geschichte, durch die Geschichte der Vernunft selbst. Es ist von höchster Wichtigkeit, diesen Punkt zu betonen. Spinoza theorisiert implizit eine Geschichtlichkeit der Wahrheit und der Vernunft. Die Wahrheit muss sich durch die Zeit entwickeln. Geist und Buchstabe der Religion können nicht als bloße getrennte Begriffe betrachtet werden. Wie schon Bollacker und Stockum behauptet haben und beweisen haben, ist es hochwahrscheinlich, dass Lessing seine Theorie der er Erziehung aufgrund eines bedeutenden Einflusses des Traktatus entwickelt hat. Ebenfalls war Lessing für Hegels das größte Vorbild des Aufklärers. Und sein Einfluss auf den jungen Hegel ist sehr, sehr bekannt. Es soll noch erinnert werden, dass die Probleme der Kritik der Bibel und der Geschichtlichkeit der Offenbarung auch bei den in Stift gehaltenen Vorlesungen betrachtet wurden. Es ist deswegen sehr schwierig, sich vorzustellen, dass Hegel keine Idee der Beziehung dieser Probleme mit Spinozas Traktatus hatte. Er las sicherlich das Buch in Bern, aber man kann nicht feststellen, dass er davor nichts darüber wusste oder gelesen hatte. Dagegen ist das Gegenteil sehr wahrscheinlich, weil der Einfluss des Werks innerhalb der Aufklärungstheologie sehr verbreitet war. Darüber hinaus wurde Lessing von Jacobi als Atheist und Spinozist bezeichnet, auch aufgrund der Ansichten über die Religion, die er während seiner Streite gegen den dogmatischen Theologen verteidigt hatte, insbesondere in der Erziehung. Meiner Meinung nach liest Hegel den Traktatus gerade um das Problem der Beziehung zwischen Wahrheit und Religion, Einbildungskraft und Vernunft, Positivität und Freiheit zu entwickeln und zu vertiefen. Noch vor seiner Zeit in Bern werfen Hegels Fragmente und Texte dieses Problem auf. Und zwar in eine sehr ähnliche Art wie in Lessings und Spinozas Denken. Während seiner Gymnasiumzeit in Stuttgart schrieb Hegel äußerst interessante Reflexionen zu diesem Thema. Einerseits ist sein kritisches Urteil über die positive Religion sehr hart. Er wirft ihr vor, den Aberglauben zu verbreiten, um eine politische Herrschaft über den Menschen zu erzeugen. Denn Hegel kritisiert schon in seinem Tagebuch, gerade wie Spinoza und Lessing, das Bild des Gottes her, 
der als ein König vorgestellt wird, der Gesetze vorschreibt und Belohnungen und Strafen vergibt. Dieser Gott, Herr, wird auf die kindliche Phase der Menschheit bezogen, in der es keine politische Freiheit gab. Andererseits erkennt Hegel an, dass diese Vorstellungsbilder Gottes sehr hilfreich sind, um die Menschen zu erziehen und sie zum Respekt vor der Moralität zu bringen. Es scheint nun, dass Hegel, gerade wie Spinoza, der in Bildungskraft auch eine positive Rolle zuschreibt. Denn er spricht über eine Aufklärung des gemeinen Menschen, die durch die Religion erreichbar ist. Und schon in, Stu in Stuttgart fängt er an, den Ausdruck Volksreligion auf diesen Begriff zu beziehen. Diese Ideen, noch im Keim in Stuttgart, werden stufenweise klarer und deutlicher, insbesondere in Bern. In, de te in den Texten, die dort geschrieben sind, können auch relevante Beweise gefunden werden, um die These eines direkten Einflusses des Traktatus auf Hegels Denken zu verteidigen. Ich habe diese Beweise sozusagen in drei Punkte zusammengefasst. Nummer eins. Wie im Traktatus setzt Hegel in Bern durch die Kategorie des Geistes das Christentum dem Judentum entgegen. Eine Religion des Geistes und eine Religion des Gesetzes. Nummer zwei. Wie im Traktatus stellt Hegel eine Theorie der Religionsfreiheit dar. Wie Spinoza behauptet er, dass die positiven Gebote der Religion und Kirche keine Geltung für den Staat und seinen Bürger haben und haben sollten. Nur die Gesetze des Staates sind obligatorisch. Gerade wie im Traktatus behauptet Hegel, dass die Gesetze Moses obligatorisch waren, nur weil sie Gesetze des Staats, somit politische Gesetze, waren. Nur der Staat hat die besondere Eigenschaft, Gesetze zu vergeben. Noch wie im Traktatus behauptet Hegel, dass die Gesetze über den Glauben und die Dogmen nicht nur ungerecht, sondern auch widersprüchlich und sinnlos sind. Denn es ist unmöglich, einen Glauben oder eine Meinung vorzuschreiben, dass sie innere Angelegenheiten sind, die weder kontrolliert noch erzwungen oder entschieden werden können. Wenn denn zwei Quellen von Recht und Gesetze zugelassen werden, existieren zwei verschiedene Staaten. Die Kirche verhält sich tatsächlich wie den Staat. Nicht nur stützt Hegel dieselbe Position wie Spinoza, sondern benutzt er auch denselben Ausdruck wie im Traktatus. Status in Statu. Die Kirche wenn sie Gesetze vorschreibt, verhält sich nach Hegels und Spinozas Worten wie ein Status in Status. Hegel schreibt diesen Ausdruck zwischen An Anführungsstriche, als ob er der Zitat eines anderen Autors wäre. Meiner Meinung nach sehr wahrscheinlich von Spinoza. Nummer drei. Obwohl Hegel die politische Freiheit in eine Ausschließung der positiven Religion aus dem Gebiet des Staates und der Gesetze gründet, spricht er über eine wichtige Rolle der in Bildungskraft in der Erziehung an Gehorsamkeit. In diesem Sinn, gerade wie im Traktatus, sucht Hegel positive Elemente, die vereinbar mit der Vernunft sind, auch wenn sie nicht eigentlich vernünftig sind. Die ihr betrachtete Zweideutigkeit ist klar im Begriff der Positivität. Hegel sucht eine Religion, die nicht positiv ist, aber gleichfalls gibt er zu, dass die Gesetze der Moral ohne eine konkrete positive Verwirklichung bloß abstrakt bleiben. Diese Zweideutigkeit bleibt auch, wenn Hegel anfängt, mit dem Problem der Causa Sui sich zu beschäftigen. Seit der Frankfurter Zeit wird die Positivität ein metaphysischer Begriff. Begriff. Es gibt Positivität, wenn Gott als ein transzendentes, überweltliches Wesen aufgefasst wird. Dadurch wird eine Trennung zwischen dem Absoluten und dem Relativen produziert. Diese Idee setzt Hegel die absolute Einheit zwischen Subjektivität und Objektivität, Geist und Natur, Mensch und Gott entgegen. 
Diese absolute Einheit, wie bekannt, wurde sowohl von Hölderlin als auch von Schelling aufgrund ihrer Interpretation von Spinozas Causa Sui entwickelt. Hegel wurde eindeutig von ihrer Sichtweise auf die einzige Substanz Spinozas beeinflusst, die das Vereinen von Denken und Ausdehnung, Geist und Natur jenseits des Subjektivismus und der Reflexion Philosophie darstellt. Trotzdem versucht Hegel gleichzeitig, diese Einheit in eine konkrete, positive Welt zu übersetzen. Während der ganzen Frankfurter Zeit und noch in Jena erfährt er den Widerspruch zwischen diesen zwei Bedürfnissen seines Denkens. Das Bedürfnis nach einer Einheit über die Trennung hinweg und das Bedürfnis, die zeitliche und geschichtliche Erfahrung des Menschen in diesem Absoluten zu integrieren. Einerseits spricht Hegel in Frankfurt über ein einziges trennungloses Prinzip, das keine Bestimmung mit der Vernunft oder Reflexion bekommen kann. Andererseits probiert er, dieses Prinzip in ein politisch-historisches Emanzipationsprogramm umzuwandeln. Deswegen spricht er vor einer Notwendigkeit der Bildungskraft und der Positivität, um die Identität eines Volkes zu bauen und zu festigen. Es ist sehr interessant, dass die Religion Jesus, die als Vorbild der Religion des Geistes anerkannt wird, wird aber gleichzeitig auch kritisiert, weil sie keine Möglichkeit hat, das Volk zu erziehen, gerade weil sie eine bloße geistliche Religion ist. In Frankfurt wird das Schicksal der Niederlage Jesus dadurch erklärt, dass seine Lehre keine positive Verbindung mit der hebräischen Welt hatte. So konnte sie nicht in einer konkreten politischen Welt verwirklicht werden und blieb deswegen eine abstrakte und unpolitische Kritik. In diesem Sinn wird Jesus nicht nur als Vorbild der Religion des Geistes und der Freiheit beschrieben, sondern und gleichzeitig auch als seine schöne Seele, die nur eine bloße, innige Moralität fordern kann. Diese zwei Aspekte sind mit ihrem Widerspruch weiter nebeneinander gestellt. Gerade auf diesem Grund fängt Hegel an, nicht nur die Religion Jesus, sondern auch die kantische Moral zu kritisieren. Das Problem ist, dass beides keine konkrete Versachlichung der Vernunft in der geschichtlichen Welt verwirklichen kann. Über dieses Bedürfnis nach Geschichtlichkeit ist der Text 65 sehr bedeutungs bedeutungsvoll. Dort versucht Hegel erneut, das Problem der Positivität und ihrer notwendigen Rolle zu skizzieren. Er versucht immer noch, die Vernunft und den Geist als etwa zu bezeichnen, was eine konkrete, positive Verwirklichung braucht, um aktiv und defektiv zu werden. Erstens merkt Hegel, dass bevor eine Religion als positiv bezeichnet werden konnte und zu einem natürlichen und vernünftigen Entgegengesetz, sollte ein, Anfangszitat, lange im Jahrhundert sich aus den Ender Stufengang von Bildung durchlaufen laufen sein, bis wann die Mannigfaltigkeit der Erscheinungen der menschlichen Natur in die Einheit einiger allgemeiner Begriffe zusammengefasst wurde. Ende Zitat. Aber die menschliche Natur, fügt Hegel noch an, ist nicht bewegungslos und ein für alle Mal gegeben, sondern, Anfang Zitat, Unendliche Modifikationen lässt der allgemeine Begriff der menschlichen Natur zu. Und diese Modifikationen sind notwendig, weil die menschliche Natur niemals rein vorhanden war. Ende Zitat. Man soll betonen, dass Hegel hier den Ausdruck Modifikationen benutzt. Derselbe, den er benutzt, um das Verhältnis zwischen der absoluten Einheit und ihrer einzelnen endlichen Bestimmungen zu bezeichnen. Wie von Franco Kieregin betont wurde, war dieser Ausdruck die buchstäbliche deutsche Übersetzung des lateinischen Begriffes Modus oder Modi von Schelling mit explizitem Bezug auf Spinoza benutzt. So benutzt Hegel diesen Begriff nicht nur im Sinne Schellings, sondern auch mit einer originellen Bedeutung, unabhängig von der Philosophie Schellings. Eine geschichtliche Modifikation, meint Hegel. 
Hier wird das Problem der absoluten Einheit im Keim mit dem Problem der Geschichte verbunden. Die endlichen Bestimmungen der Einheit sind nicht in den bloßen Absolut zurückgeschlagen, sondern als Modifikationen aufgefasst, die diese Einheit positiv und konkret entwickeln. Die Dialektik entwickelt sich aus diesem Bedürfnis, die Einheit und die konkreten Bestimmungen der menschlichen Natur zusammenzufassen, die letzte in der ersten zu integrieren. Gerade weil der Senkai Pan, wie von Schelling und Hölderlin interpretiert wurde, diese konkrete Erfahrung des Menschen nicht erklären konnte, wird im Geist aufgehoben. Die Substanz wird im Geist aufgehoben. Also in einem Begriff, in einem Begriff der auch aus der Philosophie Spinozas kommt, aber nicht aus seiner Metaphysik, sondern aus seiner politischen Philosophie. Um die Substanz aufzuheben und ihre volle Wahrheit aus ihr hervorgehen zu lassen, muss man sich, sie mit der Bewegung des Geistes, mit der geschichtlichen Erfahrung des Menschen auffüllen. Diese Bewegung wird nur in der Phänomenologie endlich und komplett dargestellt. Aber die ganze Zeit in Frankfurt und Jena ist dem Versuch gewidmet, sie zu erfassen. Die Phänomenologie stellt die endliche Widerlegung des Spinozismus dar. Aber es soll betont werden, dass es durch Spinoza selbst geschieht. geschieht. Die metaphysische Idee der einzigen Substanz ist noch und passend, die Wahrheit der konkreten Freiheit zu rechtfertigen, die Spinoza selbst im Traktatus skizziert hatte. Zuletzt, die Idee, die ich vorstellen wollte, ist, dass ohne den Einfluss des Traktatus wäre das Problem der Beziehung zwischen Geist und Buchstabe, Freiheit und konkreten Bestimmtheit, Vernunft und Vorstellung nicht von Hegel entwickelt worden. So, ohne den politischen Spinozismus hätte Hegel keine Überwindung des Spinozismus hervorgebracht. Es ist überflüssig zu betonen, dass die Aufhebung des Spinozismus stellt die Geburt des hegelschen Systems dar wie auch Hegel verstehen lässt und ausdrücklich sagt. In diesem Sinn kann man sagen, dass die spinozistischen Wurzeln Hegels Philosophie tief politisch sind und dass die Rolle der Substanz mit ihrer Überwindung in der Freiheit des Geistes nicht verstanden werden kann, ohne diese Wurzeln mit ihrem Bezug auf Traktatus anzusehen. Vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Okay, so now questions. Professor Koga. Uh, okay, uh, vielen Dank von der Vort uh, für deinen Vortrag. Um, eigentlich ist es um, aufwendig, dass du uh, nach anderen, durch den, einen anderen Weg zu ähm, ähnlichen Resultaten, als ich zuvor gekommen bin. Äh, die, deine Formulierungen am Ende sind sozusagen buchstäblich äh, dieselbe, äh, dieselbe geblieben. Nur, dass du äh, aus der Traktatus Theologico Politicus und ich aus Traktatus Politicus äh, ausgehe. Äh, das ist schon etwas betrachtlich. Aber was mir, als ich schon äh, selbst äh, die Vorlesung ver verfasste, sich äh, fragte, war, wie kann dann äh, so etwas wie eine U Überwindung von Spinozismus durch Spinoza geschehen? Was bedeutet das für Spinoza selbst? Wenn man also Spinozismus durch Spinoza überwindet, dann stimmt etwas nicht mit unserer Auf Auffassung von Spinozismus, das ist die eine äh, Möglichkeit. Und die zweite Möglichkeit, ähm, es stimmt nicht äh, etwas äh, zusammen äh, im Spinozismus selbst. Also weil, weil ein, äh, einmal äh, den, äh, der Spinozismus als eine äh, Philosophie der Notwendigkeit, sagen wir sehr, sehr generell gelesen wird, und äh, dann als eine Phil äh, Philosophie de der Freiheit 
gedeutet, gedeutet wird. Also wie siehst du diese Spannung? Ist das äh, etwas, das äh, aus Spinoza selbst herkommt? Oder ist das eine Folge von unserem falschen äh, Deutung des Spinozismus, metaphysischen Spinozismus selbst? Danke. Danke. Danke für die Frage. Also ich muss sagen, dass meiner Meinung nach diese Überwindung des Spinozismus durch Spinoza äh, geltet nur, weil äh, Hegel hat so Spinoza und Spinozismus interpretiert. Meiner Meinung nach Geist im Sinne Spinoza ist nicht Geist im Sinne Hegel. Hegel kann diese Kategorie quasi benutzen in diesem Sinn, also in dem Sinn, in dem er diese Kategorie benutzt, weil es gibt eine Mediation, eine Vermittlung von diesen Philosophen und Theologen, die ich hier betrachtet habe oder probiert zu, zusammenzufassen habe. Vielleicht, äh, ja, ähm, äh, ich würde mehr Zeit brauchen, um eine, klar, äh, eine, eine, Antwort, eine Antwort, die klar ist, zu, zu geben. Aber meiner Meinung nach, es gibt zwei verschiedene Ideen der Geschichte, der Zeit, der Freiheit. Was ich meinte, ist, dass Hegel probiert, diese Vorstellung in dem Absoluten zu integrieren, gerade weil er die, äh, ähm, die Bedeutung für die Geschichte äh, von, von dieser Imagination merkt, merkt ähm, weil er äh, den Traktatus gelesen hat. Aber meiner Meinung nach, Geist bedeutet in, Spinoza, in Spinozas Philosophie nicht, was Hegel meint. Weil äh, es gibt keine Anerkennung, äh, es gibt keine Freiheit im Sinne, im Sinne Hegels. Aber meiner Meinung nach ist interessant zu sehen, wie Hegel diese Kategorien benutzt. Ähm, ja, ich weiß nicht, ob ich gut deine Frage gut verstanden hatte und ob ich... Okay, okay another short question, please, behind. Vielen Dank für Ihren Vortrag, von dem ich inhaltlich äh, viel gelernt habe. Ähm, aber ich habe eine methodologische Nachfrage. Äh, Im Grunde habe ich äh, zwei, wobei mir jetzt die zweite irgendwie entflohen ist, aber jedenfalls die erste steht mir noch vor Augen. Ähm, und zwar, äh, Sie, haben eine, eine, Sie haben versucht, den Einfluss Spinozas auf Heges Denken ähm, zu skizzieren. Ähm, aber am Ende Ihres Vortrags haben Sie gesagt, dass ohne Spinoza Hegel gewisse Begriffe nicht hätte entwickeln können. Und ich frage mich jetzt, äh, ist das nicht ein, sozusagen eine Verachtung der Freiheit im Reich des Geistes? Da deuten Sie doch äh, die Entwicklung einer Geistesfigur ganz nach einer Naturgesetzlichkeit ist die Tatsache, dass jemand etwas in, oder in, aufgrund eines möglichen Einflusses durch einen anderen entwickelt, heißt doch nicht, dass es ohne diesen anderen nicht hätte entwickelt werden können von dieser Geistesfigur. Also deshalb meine Frage, können Sie etwas sagen über, über die methodologische Konsequenzen dieser entwicklungsgeschichtlichen Betrachtung? Ah ja, und die zweite Frage damit in, in Zusammenhang. Hegel hat verschiedene Arten, die Geschichte zu betrachten, unterschieden, wie Sie wissen. Äh, können Sie selbst, auch, das ist jetzt auch wieder methodologisch gemeint, können Sie selbst Ihre, äh, äh, Ihre Betrachtung einordnen in, äh, in, in Hegels äh, Unterscheidungen, diese vier äh, Betrachtungsarten? Also die erste Frage, können Sie solche, sage ich mal, naturgesetzliche Schlüsse ziehen, dass aufgrund einer Ursache A notwendigerweise ein Effekt mhm. B hervortritt? Äh, zweite Frage ist, wie würden Sie 
aus der Perspektive einer Methodologie ihre eigene Betrachtung angesichts der vier Arten, die Geschichte zu betrachten, äh, einordnen. Danke. Bitte. Also die erste Frage, also ich würde sagen, dass meine Behauptung nicht so stark war und nicht eine also so starke philosophische Bedeutung haben wollte. Ich wollte nur beschreiben, ähm, etwas, was also meiner Meinung nach ähm, festgestellt werden kann, also dass es äh, einen Spinozas Einfluss und insbesondere des Traktatus auf äh, äh, den jungen Hegel existiert und dass es ist zwar sehr wichtig ist, weil einige Ideen von Hegel auch aufgrund dieser Interpretation von Spinozas Traktatus ähm, ja, verursacht wurden. Das war mein Punkt. Nicht zu sagen, dass, also nicht zu skizzieren, ein Verhältnis zwischen Natur und Geist in der, Gesch in, in der Geschichte. Das wäre für, für mich. Zu viel, also die Frage war zu schwierig. Ich wollte nicht etwas so stark sagen. Nummer zwei, ähm, natürlich gibt es im Hegels Denken viele verschiedene Begriffe der Geschichte und das senkt auch von, von der Zeit ab. Ich wollte nur ähm, ja, betonen, dass ähm, in Frankfurter und jener Zeit eher will diese Modifikationen, die geschichtlich sind, die äh, in Bezug auf Imaginatio, Vorstellung und so weiter und so fort stehen, also in dem Absoluten zu integrieren. Also dass die Idee, äh, die Geschichte in dem Absoluten zu integrieren, kommt aus einer Interpretation des Traktatus, aber nur in dieser bestimmten Zeit. Deswegen aber ich nicht also die ganze Begriffe der Geschichte in Hegels betrachten, das wäre also zu viel und auch nicht notwendig für, für meinen Vortrag, meiner Meinung nach. Aber vielleicht habe ich missverstanden. Missverstanden die Frage, ich weiß es nicht. Okay, we have time for one very short question. Okay, Bojana. Thank you for your interesting talk. So this may be not relevant, I don't know to, to what extent to, to the topic, but I was just wondering because you compared Imago in Spinoza and then you were talking about Einbildungskraft in Hegel, but I mean, what's with imagination? You know, I, I think there is a difference be between Einbildungskraft in Hegel and imagination as uh, Zeichen machende fantasy as this capacity or power that uh, brings um, subjective representations of something through linguistic science and reworking the material of subjectivity through essentially getting involved into, yes, language. And then there's also the role of memory, uh, which is also a kind of, um, that depends upon imagination and it's also this sign recollection process. So this is in Encyclopedia Psychology, maybe it's not that relevant, I just, Wanted if you is is this the same thing for you or are you making a distinction here? So thanks. Ja, ähm, also ich habe eine Frage. Also die Frage ist wann, weil die Enzyklopädie wird sehr später geschrieben. Also ich spreche ähm, von einer Zeit, in der vor Hegel die Frage war über die Religion, über die Positivität der Religion, über die politische Bedeutung der Religion und der Religion in der Geschichte. Und in diesem Sinn benutzt er Kategorien wie Fantasie, Vorstellung und so weiter und so fort in Bezug auf äh, die Volksreligion zum Beispiel. Also ähm, in diesem Sinn, also äh, deine Frage ist natürlich sehr, sehr interessant und ähm, ähm, aber ich kann nicht antworten, weil ich nur sagen wollte, dass dieser Bedürfnis, die Geschichte in dem Absoluten zu integrieren, kommt äh, aus, dieser, aus diesen Fragen. Aber äh, es gibt noch keine äh, so starke und systematische Idee in Hegel, über was 
äh, eine Bildungskraftvorstellung als Fakultät sein kann oder ich würde sagen nicht so stark. Also ich habe in, äh, also über Bern am meisten gesprochen, also Jugendschriften vor, vor Jena auch. Bitte. Okay, so we're starting the last section, and it's a pleasure to announce under the auspices of uh, state apparatus itself, the next speaker, Goran Vranesevic, who is an assistant professor and research fellow. His main areas of research include German idealism, political philosophy, linguistics, structuralism, and psychoanalysis. He has written and taught on topics um, far ranging from aesthetics and cultur cultural theory to classical commentaries on ontological issues and so on. He's also a translator of uh, philosophical works, including one of the translators of Hegel's Encyclopedia into Slovenian. He's currently co-editing an edited volume on the idea of the good in Kant and Hegel and preparing a monograph on the concept of speculation. Please. Thank you. Okay, I'll just go straight to the point. As already indicated in the title, the talk, will deal with a topic of seemingly marginal concern in Spinoza and Hegel, sexual difference. This is a matter that could be tackled in various ways. In certain regards, sexual difference might be simply subsumed under the heading of the necessity to ensure societal reproduction. In others, one could try to wrestle this difference uh, from any form of natural conditioning. Or in a more contemporary approach, it would be, of course, possible to try to reinscribe the difference into difference. But why Spinoza and why Hegel? What both authors have in common is in fact that they seem to treat sexual difference as a fundamental ontological issue. As Materon paraphrased Spinoza, quoting him, sexuality is no more intended to ensure the perpetuation of species than, the, than eyes are made for seeing or teeth for chewing. And the same is true for procreation which is only possible because of sexuality, not vice versa. Spinoza's whole disposition of substance and attributes seeks to answer the question of how we can think difference within the absolute and the kind of difference that concerns the absolute. In formulating the sexual difference, we will not follow the justification of the two sexes on the basis of biological determinations or ideal states of masculinity and femininity, but after pointing out the structural discrepancies of the way each sex is inscribed in the social fabric, rather think of the underlying difference as a political problem of the relation between substance and subject. So why are Spinoza and Hegel suitable partners to confront this issue? Spinoza and Hegel have a surprising number of similarities. First and foremost, the belief that life under the guidance of reason is what is most beneficial for men. And although all men are committed to the freedom of mind, as Spinoza was found to point out, and Hegel similarly highlighted the virtue of thinking that separates men from animal, women are within their system always and everywhere in a position of inferiority. While Spinoza argues in the political treatise that, in quoting him, women do not have the same rights as men and must yield them, for Hegel, women are confined to the family, private life, and excluded from public sphere of work and politics. Quoting Hegel from uh, Philosophy of Right, uh, the sexes plainly are plainly in a hierarchical relation to one another, one the universal, the other the particular. They are not absolutely equal. Rather than simply rejecting such ideas, or vehemently defending them as Grotius did uh, in Spinoza's time, we will focus on the logical consequences of excluding women from un universality. And in this respect, it is interesting to note that with Spinoza, even the simple sexual drama of jealousy is essentially, quoting, played out between males. While women 
is just a distracting element. The sexual difference points to a split in the assumed unity or hom homogeneity of the two sexes, where each is ascribed a certain identity. But rather than indicating the substantive characteristics of each, each sex, we will, as already mentioned, First, explore the premise that sexual difference is really an indication of the exclusion of women from political participation. More precisely, sexual difference can be even read to give rise to politics as such. It is the undoing of the established social ties as inherent to their tying, which is what opens the space of the political. Both thinkers illustrate sexual difference as an authentic metaphysical problem. With Spinoza, this problem could be seen as a reflecting the impassibility of the boundary between the attributes of mind and body in the finite reason. The distance between both attributes is unsurmountable because there is no common space where they can come into contact. And this distance is only strengthened because, in fact, there is no boundary between them as they coincide in the infinity uh, of substance. Hegel was well aware of this ontological deficit of the negativity of finite reason. He did not resolve this impossibility of congruence in substance by bypassing negativity, but rather by pushing the resulting contradiction to its end and producing the subject. And in this sense, we can speculate uh, the sexual difference is nothing more than the subjectification of the problem of the substance of sex. But let us not jump to conclusions. By considering the influence of the political philosophy represented by Spinoza and Hegel, the issue of sexual inequality, to which both are exposed, is frequently raised in contemporary readings, as it is said to be even the central, understanding, uh, central to understanding the respective theoretical approach. On the one hand, we have Spinoza, who with practically his last words, justifies the unsuitability of women for political life and denies them rights associated with it. Interestingly enough, the heart of the argument put forward in the political treatise is not premised on an institutional barrier to equality, which would be more in line with the case he is making, but on a natural one. He even takes the view that an institutional barrier would not constitute a compelling reason for us to exclude women from governance. Instead, he uses the following reason, and I'm quoting Spinoza from a political treatise. There has never been a case of men and women reigning together, but wherever on the earth men are found, there, were, there we see that men rule and women are ruled. And since this is nowhere the case, one may assert that with perfect propriety that women have not by nature equal right with men, but that, the necessar that they necessarily give way to men and that thus it cannot happen that both sexes should rule alike much less that men should be ruled by the women. Since the highest happiness or blessedness can be, according to Spinoza, achieved only through perfecting reason, such a particular historically substantiated claim seems quite inconsistent with his general stance towards reason. In general, Spinoza sees reason and the strength of character dependent on ensuring intellectual capacity and freedom. And freedom, according to Spinoza, means the ability, quoting Spinoza, to exist and act solely from the necessity of its own nature. A pure existence that is, of course, reserved only for God. So the advantage of rational actualization of powers is clear to Spinoza. He argues that, quoting Spinoza again, that nothing is more useful to man in preserving his being and enjoying a rational life than a man who is guided by reason. Or in a similar fashion, quoting Spinoza again, Things are good only so far as they aid man to enjoy life of the mind, which is defined by understanding. Despite this clear metaphysical premise for rational actualization and freedom that comes with it, women are too, following Spinoza and quoting Spinoza, necessarily give way to men, as they are lacking the virtues of model citizen. They are destined to remain unfree, subservient, and unreasoned. Even their education is aimed at adopting them to a subordinate role. All these characteristics are not positive in the context of aristocracy, monarchy, as we might expect, but the completely absolute state, as uh, Spinoza put it, democracy. 
which is in a few short sentences, in a political treatise introduced through those who are excluded. And those who are excluded are, among others, foreigners, slaves, children, orphans, those who commit crime, and women. Interestingly, he's very precise in the use of legal language when arguing for exclusion from public affairs and freedom. Subjugation to imperio for foreigners, protestate rurum and dominarum for slaves and women, and sub protestate for children and pupils. But as already mentioned, and even more important for our argument, it is only in the case of exclusion of women that the possibility of an institutional barrier even comes up. So on the, un so on the one hand, the question of sexual difference thus emerges with Spinoza an, uh, as an inconsistency within his universal demand for rationality of human beings. But a similar, even related sentiment can also be found in Hegel. In the peculiar passages of the Outlines of Philosophy of Right, published in 1821, women are subject to identical treatment or logic. They are excluded from public sphere, affairs of the state, while their activity is reduced or subjugated to the realm of family. Quoting Hegel, the law of women, women is a law opposed to public law, to the law of the state. And Hegel continues in the additional paragraph, when women hold the helm of the government, the state is at once in jeopardy, because women regulate their actions not by demands of universality, but by contingent inclinations and opinions. And then further, Hegel ends his paragraph with a clear distinction in regards to the capacity of to acquire reason, quoting Hegel again, women are educated, one knows not how, by as it were, breathing in ideas, by living rather by, living rather by acquiring knowledge. The status of manhood, on the other hand, is attained only through the achievement of thought and much technical exertion. So Hegel. Hence the rather, of course, expect a critical attitude towards Hegel's philosophy that is present among various scholars. There are naturally also readings according to which the division that cuts across private and public spheres, so the femininity and masculinity, is merely a reimagining of the full social structure of the ancient Greek world, which is represented by Antigone's uh, familial principle on the one hand and Creon's political on the other. However, while the ancients were subsumed by nature, the modern social structure is thought to be subordinated to reason. All the logical tensions of Hegel's position are brought to the surface here and almost merge with Spinoza's thought on the unsuitability of women to be politically engaged. For both Spinoza and Hegel, it is precisely reason that is supposed to be the leveling ground for human beings. And for both, the structuring principle and the main concern was a society motivated to maintain a harmonious life and an empowered communal existence. And this requires a significant degree of civic engagement by individuals. Uh, this is the sole means by which the government structure can be maintained and seamlessly function for both thinkers. However, as we had already pointed out, this harmony also requires a certain amount of sacrifice, in this case accounting for at least half of the population. At least, of course, it's more. Spinoza clearly specifies that, quoting uh, Spinoza, both sexes live in harmony only on the condition that men rule and women are ruled. And while the legal determination of Spinoza's self-determination, and likewise for Hegel, can be achieved by separating from the parents, by becoming educated persons, and freely striving for our well-being, this does not seem to be universally given. The legal determination of majority of the population is quite arbitrary since there is no guarantee that the individual has obtained an adequate conatus or his or, of his or her own individual substance to act independently of other forms of dominion. And Hegel, so of course, Hegel goes one step further. In nature, which is itself made possible by internal structure of Hegel's own system and isn't merely given, the, quoting Hegel, the natural determinancy of the two sexes acquires an intellectual and ethical significance. So that the principle of freedom itself, in a sense, becomes differentiated. In this regard, it does not seem unreasonable to argue that sexual difference introduces into reason an impasse, an antagonism. The way Spinoza and Hegel address the sexual difference is internally inconsistent until both are read together and understood in relation to one another. In its poor form, if we set aside certain practical implications of the argument, 
This difference establishes a specific form of social bond whose function is to show that this pure form is missing. Let us now consider the preconditions that define the possibility of such distinction in both cases. The dividing features of both sexes are not clearly defined as they are situated at the intersection of questions of nature, questions of man, and questions of right. And first, let us turn to Spinoza. For Spinoza, of course, mind and body are not separable, as for instance, Descartes, as they embody the same reality in two distinct ways. This has, of course, practical consequences. Thinking of our thoughts also means thinking of our bodies. Body is not special sphere of a great significance in the larger schemes of things. It is embedded in the totality, the whole, the substance as one of its integral parts. And even though the same should apply to human beings, who should be regarded as a completely plain one of the elements in the totality of the universe, Spinoza nonetheless attributes to human beings a specific particularity. They are namely capable of dominating things. And in this respect, the most immediate justification lies in the ethics, where discomfort and resistance to animal domination are not seen as rational by Spinoza, but rather, quoting Spinoza, uh, the domination of animals is an empty superstition and unmanly compassion. This particularity, which Spinoza sees in human beings, despite his own denial of the special metaphysical status, is conditioned, conditioned by his insistence that the true virtue is nothing but living according to the guidance of reason. Any external justification or demands would only reduce man's power. Only a bond with men that have the same right conditions uh, that have the same right conditions their equal treatment, but the same does not apply to lower animals or other things of different nature. This is not an arbitrary decision, as Spinoza is quite adamant that it is done by necessity of nature, by the highest right even of nature. So what excludes animals to partake in the affairs of men is not the lack of autonomous rational will, but the recognition of a difference. If we take, for instance, Descartes, his founding of human community is tied to the rationality that surpasses the confines of the body and the difference that is bound out with it. Meanwhile, Spinoza introduces an additional layer in the form of feelings that differ between different natures. In this example, between animals and humans. And this distinct character of feelings expressed through joys, pains, brings humans together and apart. And in this sense, difference in pleasure is also a difference in nature. And by this logic, we can also infer this also uh, is true for women. As Spinoza put it, quoting Spinoza, if men lived according to the guidance of reason, everyone would possess the right of his without any injury to anyone else. But because they are subjected to the effects, the relationship between sexes is based on a difference, a distinctive character and emotions between both. These specific characteristics are then inscribed into the civil state which is based on a common agreement. Society can be maintained by trust in one another, which can curtail inconsistencies and changeability of men to which men are necessarily subjected. It is namely affinities and communalities that enable men or human beings to increase their individual potency. And while the perseverance of man is based on the premise that the more we consider man to be free, the less we can say that he can neglect the use of his reason, much of our freedoms consist in recognizing what is outside our immediate control and domination. Social norms themselves are, are namely born from the interaction of human desires, which means that there is a tension between the determining factors of our freedom and especially in regards to the question of on sexual difference, the ability to resist and, refer, and refrain from them. Understanding of desire and the effects is necessary to ethical and political flourishing, but crucially also domination. The human nature aims at man's preservation and benefit, but also stimulates the feeling of choice when being dominated. In both cases, we are concerned with desire, which animates our habits, fantasies, hopes, decisions, and so on. And in this way, the actual cause for subjugation and domination are obscured from our understanding, and more importantly, the natural power of right or right of human beings is thus limited not by reason, but by every desire. In Spinoza, of course, individuals can express full range of different feelings, for instance, joy, sadness, love, hate, and the like, which are themselves bound by diverse uh, species of objects by which we, by which uh, they are, are, are affected. 
This is further connected to desire, about which Spinoza famously argued the following. But desire is the very essence or nature of each man, insofar it is conceived to be determined by whatever constitution he has to do something. So while the desire is the very essence of man, it emerges in conjunction with power and as such constitutes right. If the basic logic of domination of men over women would be based on pure power of self-preservation, the common perspective would be practically ineffective. And it is true that according to Spinoza, quoting Spinoza, each man has, a much, has as much right as he has power. And the right as power is limited with God, of course, being the excluded predicament. However, however, it, is only, it only takes a slight difference in power, for the benefit, of course, of men, to make a real difference, to amplify immoderately through, let's say, edu educational practices, the initial slight difference between men and women into a constitutive inequality and dependence that make this very power possible, wherein women and servants are just alterus iuris. A similar basic educational model can also be found in Hegel. Individuals are brought into interaction with others through being brought up in living through social educational institutions, which are, as a whole, called ethical life, Zitlichkeit. Hegel envisions the required form of political organization to be one that education educates individuals to willingly adhere to the common good and which transforms individuals' entire motivational structure so that they can cease to be purely self-interested agents that they were from the standpoint of abstract right. Of course, Hegel's main principle within the system is known to be actualized freedom. This is a characteristic of spirit as such, which means that, the, that it encompasses not only the objective spirit, where we find the aforementioned argument about the singularity of women, who can only express the singularity through family, but also equally art, religion, and of course, philosophy. This also raises the question of whether, in Hegel's world, women are exclusively situated within the categories of ethical and political, political predispositions that we find in the outlines of philosophy of right to the family and so on. Of course, needs, passions, desires are also, all of them enter into Hegel's rational system and concretizes the structure of obligations in which freedom diversifies its demands. But as Hegel explicitly underlines, it is, quoting Hegel, only a thinking intelligence that the will is generally a will and free. The failure of such capacity lays the ground for the appearance of the slave. Following Hegel, quoting Hegel, the slave does not know his essence, his infinity, his freedom. He does not know himself to be essence and he lacks this knowledge of himself because he does not think himself. And a similar predicament bestows in Hegel also uh, women who are, quoting Hegel again, capable of edu education, but are not made for activities which demand universal faculty. And even this capacity of, for education is stripped down to a co coincidental breeding of ideas. Knowledge acquisition as such, which encompasses knowledge of the self, is available exclusively to men. Even the first social necess necessary condition for freedom in the form of private property is tied to marriage. This is also prerequisite for recognition to become possible, since others have to adjust their expectations and desires according to the property at hand. A woman is, un is unable to regard herself as free, as she is unable to infuse objects with freedom through usage, information, and, conse and consequently be recognized as equal among others. Marriage as a contractual or also non-contractual commitment is also a commitment to obey and serve in this regard uh, with Hegel. Within such social preconditions, any semblance of self-determination is lost. And now these parallel readings of both thinkers which is that would suggest that there is absolutely no space for redemption from this static traditionalist understanding of sexual difference. However, the decision and logical explication of their undertaking is premised on a quite simple political decision in favor of stability. As I already mentioned, since men are always subject to affects and passions, society is justified, in Hegel's view, to make uh, certain distinctions, 
as a constitutive assurance of the exercise of freedom of thought and expression. Society is not a corrective measure, but a stabilizing apparatus. This is particularly clear in the conclusion of Spinoza's political treaties. After having clearly defined the parameters within which women should exist, he gives a rather trivial but essential reason for, for this necessity. And I'm quoting Spinoza's here. This is actually his last words. If we further reflect upon human passions, how men in fact generally love women, merely from the passion of lust, and esteem their cleverness and wisdom in proportion to the excellence of their beauty, and also have very ill-disposed Ill men are to suffer the women they love to show any sort of favor to others, and other facts of this kind, we shall easily see that men and women cannot really rule alike without great hurt to peace. So peace is at stake with Spinoza. The rule of men seems predicated on the servitude of passions, which, which implies that for the sake of humanity, women are obliged to sub subordinate themselves, even if this is in contradiction to what it means to be human. But it is, uh, but it is this very contradiction that proves to be what makes us human at all, in his eyes. In Hegel's eyes, a male-headed family, for instance, also carries with it a stability factor as this establishes a genuine sense of community, of common interest, and so on. However, it is, also, it is always the male husband that extracts this common purpose as only he is able to pass into other spheres of ethical life where they are recognized as seeking common grounds with others. The decision to excommunicate women from this activity is conditioned by Hegel's institutional system. As Wood put it, different institutions require a social differentiation. Each sphere must have its proper representative. And if this distinction were conditioned on this alone, then we could also imagine a role reversal of both sexes, of course. However, Hegel being Hegel, he additionally introduces a physical characteristic as essential for sexual difference. And in doing so, he, however, this is, uh, I'll end with this. In doing so, he, however, he does not introduce an anatomical difference as conditioning social roles, but instead, assumes that nature or autonomy adopts itself according to particular reproductive rules. So he makes it the other way around. Okay, thank you. Questions? Okay, Gregor, please. Um, thank you, Goran, for reminding us that the history of philosophy is also a history of horrors. <laughs> um, so I suppose my question is, but what is your point then? I mean, we we've kind of we kind of know <laughs> we kind of know that Spinoza had very bad ideas, <laughs> that Hegel had some very bad ideas. But I was expecting, you know, at some point you will produce a kind of ha ha. But then, <laughs> no, that is just your naivety, <laughs> <laughs> I think. <laughs> no, no, the point is, uh, like I said in the beginning, I'm not trying to search for like this great answers that will satisfy everyone here and where we say we found a solution which will make uh, everyone glad that we are sitting here, we are all equal and so on. My point was, I think, completely different. It was that the logic that they use is infused in their own philosophical system. And their system, especially Hegel's, also Spinoza's, has some contradictions which usually are not brought up when talking about such specific uh, traits of their systems. And I think this one really shows where these contradictions come about. And these contradictions, I think sexual difference is really good where sexual difference shows, in a sense, maybe I can use this example, where the system itself is folding on itself. And I think when something like this happens, all these contradictions, uh, antagonisms, and so on uh, spring out, in a sense. And what to do with those contradictions? That's another question, of course. We can also talk about that. But I think that was what, was, um, what I was trying to do. Maybe just open up, opening up the space to see what is even possible. 
your argument was, okay, we see the horrible things that are happening. I was hoping for an argument to see how his logic is somehow embedded into such uh, predispositions. So. No, no, definitely. I would agree in that aspect. But we also, we did go just, just shortly beforehand, we talked a little bit that there is, in a sense, both for Hegel and Spinoza, there is a problem that they are, especially Hegel, when you look at Hegel, he's trying to not just adjust his picture on how women should be treated, that their role is in family, but he goes all the way down to philosophy of nature. He doesn't just go and say like in philosophy of right, you have like uh, this special place for women. He goes all the way down to nature and all the way up to spirit where every time that something happens with women, there's, it's a specific thing that happens. That's why I think there's some, um, in a sense, something going on there. I would agree, I would agree definitely that there's prejudice present, definitely, definitely. Uh, but there's also something else I would say. Even when, when Spinoza, uh, what was that? Um, treatise on uh, imitation of the intellect. I think there he says that, uh, in a sense, je ne, je ne sais quoi, that women have something. They have something, and he doesn't know what that is. Something in their nature makes them different, and he doesn't know how to adjust his uh, world picture or his logic to that. And he's trying, in a sense, to grasp that, and again, his prejudices are embedded in that, but he is trying to do something with that. And I think that Hegel is trying to do even more with that. And they're both wrong, of course. <laughs> okay, Professor Kober, then you're not. Uh, 
So it's interesting enough, not only the logic fails, I, I mean in, in the case of women, but uh, often, and in case of uh, Spinoza, I would say even, but in uh, and in uh, Hegel as well, um, the, the capacity to acknowledge the facts, the em clear empirical mm -hmm. facts uh, fails. For instance, it's not the case that when women rule, uh, the, sta uh, the state f fell of, uh, falls. It, just look at the uh, existing states of the time. There were uh, women monarchs around the world, and the states functioned perfectly. So even at this level of, um, so let us put aside reason, okay, in this case it was set off, but just l uh, use your eyes, observe the world, and you'll see that you're wrong. And still the logic prevails, the, lo the logic, the, the, the argument uh, prevails. This is, so, uh, it's amazing, and it, yeah. it, it does touches, touch something uh, real. Uh, but to, to return to uh, Spinoza and Hegel, in Hegel I see clearly that this is not just, um, let's, let's say, miscalculation, although it has the same results, but that it has something to do with his theory of, let's say, how the public space uh, how yeah. does, uh, uh, functions. And this is then even more serious, because in a sense, not that he's forced, but he has some arguments that are built up, built in into his system that uh, makes him easier to do that, which is, of, of course, uh, in his own view, a con contradiction. But, okay, you can see where it logically may come from. But in, in, in Spinoza, I can see it a, a little bit uh, hardly, because, you know, there is a, this identity of identity and difference, or identity of identity and non-identity mm -hmm. in, in uh, Hegel, which offers, uh, opens the door. And I see a little bit uh, more difficult, with more difficult, where that would logically, let's say, if we would search for that, uh, come in uh, Spinoza's case. But um, it was great, so not to, okay. <laughs> no, I would agree, I would agree. With Spinoza, especially because we still have time, okay. Uh, yeah. With Spinoza, it's, uh, I still find it like really fascinating that his last words are, this specific last paragraph is on the equal treatment of uh, women in democracy, and then he says, like, I quoted everything that he says about women in democracy, and then uh, at the end, like, the last thing that I didn't quote is that, is, that is enough of this, and then he died. He told everything about what is to, what he had to tell about uh, these discrepancies within democracy, and then he died. So there is maybe even in his being, his being wasn't able to adjust to the deficiencies of his logic. Okay, last question, Boya, now. Very briefly. Um, okay, I'll try. Uh, so uh, thank you, Goran, for your talk. Now, mm -hmm. this might be just a suggestion or a question, how do you see it? And I'm coming from the perspective of logic and um, Hegel. So now, uh, why, why sexual difference and why it is so important in Hegel? Well, uh, I would say the first thing that it is a specific kind of difference. Um, it is a difference um, where elements cannot be subordinated to each other or fused into any kind of higher unity. And we see that explicitly uh, in, the, in the Gattungsprozess. So, mm -hmm. so it's, a, it's a relation of opposition. It's not difference, it's opposition. And opposition is a stronger term and has to do something with preservation of individuality. So this is why it's important. Now, uh, to go a step further, uh, so uh, preservation of sexual difference is necessary because by uh, preserving it, we show uh, differences as differences. We are, uh, this is a kind of functions as a precondition to really grasp the difference in, uh, um, of an individual in her particularity. So, and then we could take uh, again, step further and say, okay, now we perceive difference as difference, and then let's start and ask ourselves 
what were the conditions, like political, social, that um, that triggered these differences, and upon and how can we change uh, this, or how new social bonds can be constructed? So this, just uh, yeah, what, yeah, what yeah. do you think? Yeah. A really nice comment. Thank you. I would agree, uh, just to a certain part. I know you, you remember that Hegel has, or he was influenced by, uh, in the 19th century, the one sex model was the prevalent model. So in this model, it is uh, stated that both sexes come from the same, like, the same oneness, in a sense. What happens, why the difference happens, is that, in a sense, one organs, uh, one of the organs of one sex, uh, not evolve, don't, don't externalize. That's the way he puts it. One of the sexes externalizes, the other ones uh, becomes embedded in it, and that's one of the differences he's trying to think in philosophy of right. But I'm also sure that it's possible, that it's possible to think within Hegel a different difference. This is just one of the differences that he's trying to explicate, and he's very adamant, and I'm, I think there he does make some logical fallacies to go to the end and adjust his logic to this traditional um, opposition between men and women. I think that's maybe one of the things that can be done with Hegel. Read his own position on how sex is structured at the beginning and see what is possible to do with that. Also through logic and so on. Thank you for the comment. Okay, thank you. Okay, we can start uh, with our last speaker. Um, so, uh, Vittorio Morfino is a full professor of history of philosophy at University Milano Bicocca, director of the Master in Critical Theory of Society. He's also been visiting professor at several universities in Sao Paulo, at, in Paris, at Pantheon Sorbonne, um, and in Cordoba, and so on. He's also the author of um, numerous books on uh, Spinoza, uh, Hegel, and especially lately Marx, as he tells me. Uh, for example, in te Il Tempo e l'Occasione, Il Contro Spinoza Machiavelli, Il Tempo della Multitudine, um, Temporal um, Plural, Temporality, Trans Individuality, and the Aleatory Between Spinoza and Altizer, Imagine Spinoza in Germania, the Leibniz and Marx, and so on. The latest one is Intersoggettività inter e Trans Individualità, Materiali per un'Alternativa, which was published last year. Um, please, uh, today the, um, the name of the talk is the Spinoza-Hegel relationship and the Altizarian path, please. Thank you so much uh, to the organizer for having invited me. It, uh, it, is, uh, it has been a great pleasure to be with you in these days. So, in 19, uh, 1979, Pierre Macheret, a French philosopher deeply connected to the Althusserian group, published an essay that constituted a point of no return in the interpretation of the Hegel-Spinoza relationship. If until then, as Manfred Walter writes, works on Spinoza and Hegel have simply reproduced, paraphrasing them, the verdicts pronounced by Hegel, with Mashre, a new perspective opens up. Summarized by the title of the preface or to the first edition, The Alternative. From a merely theoretical point of view, Spinoza is no longer a philosophical embodiment of the not yet of which Deepesh Chakrabarti spoke to acquire the full title of a now, of an alternative to Hegel. Of course, the terms not yet and now do refer to a simple and unique timeline of which Spinoza and Hegel would occupy successive segments. Proposing a Hegel-Spinoza alternative means not only rejecting the Hegelian reading of Spinoza as the locus of a misunderstanding, but also rejecting a unitary, evolutionary, and progressive conception of the history of philosophy. 
Hegel who Spinoza feel, feels a very special position within what we might call the Althusserian moment. It is the text that closes this period. The last text published by Althusser in Maspero Theory series. The series opened by four marks and in which appeared immediately after reading Capital. As is well known, the murder of Ellen Rittman, the 6th November 1980, condemned Althusser to silence and dissolved his group. Perhaps precisely because of its position, the book has acquired a kind of paradigmatic value of the Althusserian school's relationship with the two authors. The Althusserism is both Spinozist and anti-Hegelian. I proposed on this occasion to reconstruct Althusser's reading of the Hegel-Spinoza relationship while avoiding two possible biases. The first, that Machret's reading represents Althusser's position to court and without discrepancy, making the maître a kind of expressive cause of the pupil. Two, that Althusser thought is an eternal moment without becoming, which hasn't no deviation uh, or evolutions. I will propose a path through Althusser's writing, writings, from his doctoral thesis to his last writings, focusing on his use of Spinoza thought, of Hegel thought, and of their relationships, bearing in mind that at stake is not the historical philosophical reconstruction of the authors, but a remodulation of Marxism. Let us therefore begin with the doctoral thesis, Du contenu dans la pensée de Hegel. In a recent book, Jean Matisse devoted a chapter to the image of Spinoza's, the Spinoza in Althusser's dissertation. According to Matisse, Matisse, sorry. In this period, Althusser did not have first-hand knowledge of the Spinozian text. The source of his uh, image of Spinoza is precisely the Hegelian philosophy according to which Spinozism would be the philosophy of a substance incapable of becoming a subject, of an abyss in which particularity and individuality are merely dissipated a source reinforced by the Kojevian reading of Spinoza. I quote Kojev, I have already said that Spinoza's system is the perfect incarnation of the absurd. Why? Because he says that the concept is eternity. Consequently, Spinoza's absolute knowledge, too, must be eternity. That is to say that it must exclude time. In other words, there is no need of time to realize it. The ethics must be thought, written, and read, read in a trice. And that is the thing's absurdity, end of quote. In the Tulsarian dissertation, we find the clear traces of this twofold derivation. However, what is perhaps more interesting to emphasize is the fact that Spinoza's interpretation is constructed in polar opposition to that of Hegel. The dialectic of content in Hegelian thought draws, according to Althusser, a movement from void to plenitude, to the plenitudo temporum. In this sense, in Althusserian interpretation, one, Hegel thought is not teleo theological, since the place of origin is void. Two, it's not possible to distinguish method and system in it, a la Engels, in the way in which Engels distinguish it. Althusser Segel is thus a philosophy in which the void of origin constitutes the mother of the becoming of the content. On the contrary, Spinoza thought, I quote, begins with God and only develops a content that is already given at the origin, end of quote. Hegel renverse Spinoza, uh, Spinoza. Uh, I quote, the void Hegel expressly sets out to eliminate is not its own truth. The truth of the void is the very being of the void, 
It is the content of what is negated. In other words, negation itself has a content, it is negation of, and so contains the term it negates. In a, further, in a further passage, can be detective the influence of Kojev, a variation of the influence of Kojev. Uh, I quote, before Hegel, philosophy had not succeeded in including the philosopher in, the field, in its field of reflection. Spinoza, in any case, resolutely ignored the problem. So, the Spinoza that appears in the dissertation is not only a Spinoza seen through the lens of Hegel and Kojev, but also constitutes the Hegel's opposite pole in terms of the dialectic of content. Thus, in the dissertation, the Hegel-Spinoza relationship is posited in terms that are entirely internal to the Hegelian tradition. When exactly do the terms change? When Althusser builds a different image of Spinoza external to that produced by the Hegelian tradition. This different image is made possible on the one hand by the political, political break with Hegelianism, a, a, a Stalinist political break, and on the other by the 2D study, which presumably took place around the 50s, of Spinoza's philosophy attested by the presence in the archive of, of more than 600 fish de lecture. However, there is no trace of a different interpretation of Spinoza before the 60s. It is in the course on Machiavelli of 62, as, as Esteban Dominguez has pointed out, that we find the first traces of an original reading of Spinoza. In particular, in the, in the paragraph devoted to a theory of appearance, Althusser repeatedly emphasizes, emphasizes the proximity of Machiavelli and Spinoza's position on the issue of appearances in politics. The style is telegraphing as it is obvious for notes of, in preparation for a course. I quote, men judge by their eyes and not by their hands. Very Spinoza's category of imagination. Spontaneous appearance of man linked to the present, to the immediacy of the present. See Spinoza. Appearance of the second degree, religion, same style as in Spinoza, but not reflected. In Spinoza, religion appears as ideological reflection on spontaneous imagination. But the question of the imagination in its double epistemological and political side was a privileged access route to Spinoza's thought is confirmed by a lecture, Psychanalysis and Psychology, which Althusser gave as part of the 63-64 seminar on Lacan. Althusser builds there a fundamental alternative on the question of imagination through Descartes and Spinoza. The foundation of psychology depends in Descartes on the ego's possibility of not being the space of transparency that, I quote, constitutes it as a subject of truth, a subject of objectivity. In this sense, according to Althusser, the passion of the soul is a treatise of the theoretical pathology in which, I quote, the psychological subject becomes the place where the relationship between the subject of truth and the subject of error is played out, end of quote. Pivoting on the conceptual pair of attention, freedom. But what happens to the, this psychological subject in Spinoza once the subject of objectivity has been abandoned? In Spinoza, the passion of the soul, instead of opening up to a psychology, that is to a pathology of the subject of, of the objectivity, does not uh, open up to what we might call no, uh, sorry, open up to, to what we might call a theory of the imaginary, end of quote. Imaginary, that is, a totality in which psychological functions are inserted and from which they are constituted. It is interesting to remark that this real break with Spinoza's image in the Hegelian tradition take place in Althusser on the concept of imagination. However, both the course and the seminar remain confined within the walls of the Ecole Normale, 
The first significant public reference to Spinoza is to be found in Four Marx, in the article on the Young Marx. In a footnote, but an extremely important one, the question is posed precisely in, term of, in terms of an alternative between two different genealogies of Marx thought on the issue, central to Althusser, of rapture and change uh, break, uh, uh, la, la, la coupure, uh, change of terrain. The footnote is on Aufhebung. Aufhebung, writes Althusser, presupposes a substantial continuity of a process containing its own future in germ, in its own interiority. Hegelian supersession presupposes, presupposes that the later form of the process is the truth of the earlier form. But Marx's position implies, on the contrary, that science constitutes in its very meaning a rapture, uh, rupture or rapture with ideology and that it sets itself up in another terrain. Therefore, science can by no criteria be regarded as the truth of ideology in the Hegelian sense. If you want a historical predece pre predecessor to Marx in this respect, we must appeal to Spinoza rather than Hegel. Spinoza established the relation between the first and the second kind of knowledge, which presupposed precisely a radical discontinuity. Although the second kind makes possible the understanding of the first, it is not its truth." End of quote. This distancing on the decisive question of the Breck science ideology has also an impact on the question of the Hegel-Marx relationship with regard to the theory of history and society. Particularly in this article, Contradiction and Overdetermination, which is all about the antithesis, simple contradiction, overdeterminate contradiction, Hegel and Marx occupy the two poles of the antithesis. At center stage is the question of Hegel's reversal and the weight of this metaphor. Analyzing the postscript to the second edition of Capital, Althusser shows how, I quote, the metaphorical expression of the inversion of the dialectic poses not so much the problem of the nature of the objects to which the same method is to be, to be applied, but precisely the problem of the nature of the dialectic in itself that is the problem of its specific structures." End of quote. These differences in structure between Hegelian and Marxist, Marxist dialectic have their roots according to Althusser in a dif different theory of time. Now, in order to build this Hegel-Marx antithesis, Althusser make, makes use of the Hegel of the phenomenology of spirit and of the philosophy of history. In the phenomenology of spirit, I quote, the past is never more than the internal essence in itself of the future it encloses. This presence of the past is the presence of con to consciousness of consciousness itself and no true external determination. A circle of circles, consciousness has only one center which solely determines, determines it, end of quote. In the philosophy of history, all historical societies are constituted of an infinity of concrete determinations from political laws to religion via custom habits, financial, and so on. However, none of these determination is essentially outside the others, not only because together they constitute an original organic totality, but also and above all because this totality is reflect reflected in an unique internal principle, which is the truth of all those concrete determinations." End of quote. Althusser gives the examples of Rome in which its mighty history, its institution, its crises and ventures are nothing but the temporal manifestation of the internal principle of the abstract legal personality and then its destruction. Consciousness, consciousness in phenomenology and principle in the philosophy of history define the uniform quality of the temporality of an epoch with respect to which 
the past, I quote, is never opaque, nor it is an obstacle, but it must always be digestible as it has been pre-digested, end of quote. To emphasize the opposition, Althusser affirmed that for Marx instead, the past was no shade, it is a terrible, positive, and active, structurated reality. Past as structured reality, an expression that alludes to the theory of social totality as always given complexity in the essay on materialistic dialectics to which the Hegelian totality is opposed as, I quote, pure and sample development of one single essence or substance, end of quote. But this Hegel-Marx antithesis masks another one, the construction of an internal antithesis within Marx's own thought, the opposition between the Marx of overdeterminate contradiction, for example, uh, that of the 18 Brumaire, and the Marx of simple contradiction, the most striking example of which is the pages of the preface of 59. But what about Spinoza? He entered the scene in reading Capital. Both in From Capital to the philosophy of Marx and in The Object of Capital, Althusser re reserves a very special place for Spinoza in the history of thought. In the first text, he states that Spinoza, I quote, was the first in the world to propose at the same time a theory of history and the philosophy of the opacity of the immediate. End of quote. In the second, it tells us that Spinoza's philosophy introduces a theoretical revolution unprecedented in the history of philosophy. To the extent that we can consider Spinoza from a philosophical point of view, the only direct ancestor of Marx, end of quote. But as, let us come to the, uh, the core of the theoretical question. In From Capital to the Philosophy of Marx, Spinoza is used to mark, to mark the difference of Marxist epistemology on the one end from empiricism and the other from idealism. The central point is a distinction between the real object and the object of knowledge. I quote, against what should really be called the latent dogmatic empiricism of Cartesian idealism, Spinoza warned us that the object of knowledge or essence was in itself absolutely distinct and different from the real object. For, to repeat his famous aphorism, the two objects must not be confused the, ide the idea of the circle, which is the object of knowledge, must not be confused with a circle, which is the real object. Marx took, took up this principle, uh, rejecting the Hegelian confusion, which identifies the real object with the object of knowledge, the real process with the knowledge process, end of quote. On this basis, uh, um, Althusser, Declare, declares that the famous question of the relationship between the logical order and the historical order of the categories of capital is a known problem or rather an imaginary problem. This is interesting, for, for example, the fact that Backhaus uh, uh, make the same thing in Germany uh, uh, at the light of Hegel, uh, using Hegel instead of Spinoza. In the object of capital, uh, on the other hand, Spinoza intervenes to solve the fundamental theoretical problem of Marx's capital, which is the problem of the definition of a structural causality. Modern philosophy offered two models for thinking this efficacy. The mechanistic Cartesian one, which however, according to what said, did not go so far as to think the efficacy of the whole over its elements, and the expressive Leibnizian one, which dominates Hegel's philosophy through the syntax of the pars totalis. This, this is a, 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 a point that has been criticized from Gerard Lebrun, La Patience du, dans la Patience du Concept, and Beatrice Longness in Hegel et la Critique de la Métaphysique. Um, it is at this point that Althusser evokes Spinoza. 
I quote, the only theoretician who had the, the unprecedented daring to pose this problem and, and, uh, and outline a first solution to, it was Spinoza. End of quote. Of course, at the center of the theoretical scene is the concept of structural immanent causality according to the model whereby the effects are not external to the structure, nor are they an object or element, a pre-existing space on which the structure would stamp its, its mark. On the contrary, the structure is immanent to its effect. Uh, in short, the structure, which is only a specific combination of its own element, is nothing outside its effect." End of quote. It is precisely the attribution of this Spinozian theory, theory of causality to Marx that allows Althusser to draw a line between the Hegelian theory of temporality and the Marxian one. This question is explicitly addressed in the perhaps most famous chapter of Reading Capital, the sketch of a theory of historical time, in which Hegel is used as a relevant counterexample to show by way of difference the Marxian novelty. Again, behind Hegel's mask lies a part of Marx's own theoretical production, as Althusser himself will openly write in the following chapter, Marx is, in, is not a historicism, where he will construct a limit form of Marxist historicism using some passages of the introduction of uh, 57 and Capital. But as, let us return to Hegel in whose philosophy of history, according to uh, Althusser, a conception of time marked by two fundamental characteristics is at work. One, the homogeneous continuity of time. Two, the contemporaneity or category of the historical present. These two characteristics are nothing other than the two coordinates of the idea, idea succession and simultaneity in its sensible becoming. Of the two, by far, the most important is, according to Althusser, the second, the one in which Hegel's deepest thought is manifested. Indeed, the category of, con or of contemporaneity says precisely what the structure of the historical existence of the social, social totality is. I quote, the structure of historical existence is such that all the elements of the whole always coexist in one and the same time and are therefore contemporaneous. This means that the structure of the historical existence of the Hegelian social totality allows what I propose to call as an essential section, a coupe de sens, that is an intellectual operation in which a vertical break is made at any moment in historical time, a break in the present such that all elements of the whole revealed by this section are in immediate relationship with one another, which expresses their internal essence. It is then, according to Althusser, a matter of thinking by difference to Hegel, a plural temporality that allows each level to be give, given in its own and relatively autonomous temporality, relatively because it is articulated in the social whole. Uh, a social formation is thus an interweaving of different times of which it is necessary to think about the gap and the twist produced by the articulation of the different levels of the structure. In this construction, Spinoza seems entirely absent, except for an, enig an enigmatic sentence that closes the chapter. In fact, after criticizing the structurally synchronic diachronic pair, Althusser accuses a sense, uh, rescues a sense of the term synchronic. Synchronic not as the temporality of the real object, but as the temporal presence of the object of knowledge. He heads, I quote, the synchronic is the eternity in Spinoza's sense. Le synchronique, c'est l'eternité au sens spinoziste. End of quote. Obviously, this peremptory and enigmatic statement presupposes a distance from the classical reading of Spinoza's eternity as absolute 
simultaneity, absolute zugleich, to put it in the Hegelian terms of Glauben und Wissen. It is not uh, the annihilation of time, but rather the knowledge of the specific relation existing between the different elements of the structure, of the whole, of the relation of the dependence and articulation that make it an organic whole, a system. Three years later, in 68, Althusser returned on his reading of Hegel on the occasion of a talk at Jean Hippolyte's seminar. Of course, Althusser's gesture must be read in the context of the accusation addressed to reading capital of structuralism. Summarizing the achievements of, for Marx and reading capital, Althusser writes, we have found in Marx a non-Hegelian conception of history, a non-Hegelian conception of the social structure, a non-Hegelian conception of the dialectic. And he adds, everything we have published on Hegel actually leaves aside the positive inheritance to which Marx is indebted to Hegel. Marx has transformed the Hegelian dialectic, but owes Hegel this capital gift, the idea of the dialectic, end of quote. The first move proposed by Althusser is a reassessment of the Feuerbe Feuerbachian critic of Hegel, of which, I quote, Marx has long been prisoner, end of quote. In Feuerbach's case, one can speak of a reversal of Hegel, but a reversal that constitutes a theoretical regression. Basically following a classical path, Althusser asserts that what Feuerbach loses in relation to Hegelian thought is the fact that there is no trace of that theory of history that we owe to Hegel as a dialectical process of production of forms. Althusser considers that Marx is indebted to Hegel precisely for this decisive philosophical category. So far, we are on familiar ground. But Althusser goes further. Marx owes Hegel much more he owes him the concept of a process without a subject. Against Kojève, Althusser read, the, uh, read history as a process of alienation, but whose subject is not man. The process of alienation is not limited in Hegel to human history, with the respect to which the process has always already begun. Since history, I quote, is nothing but alienation on, of nature, which is itself the alienation of logic. End of quote. Uh, so, sorry, uh, I must continue. There is, in fact, a subject in this process of alienation without a subject, and it is the very teleology, teleology of the process. In other words, the only subject of the process is the process itself in its teleology. The beginning of the logic, the first triad, uh, triad, triad, triad constitutes precisely the, the key moment for understanding Hegelian thought. I quote, the origin which is indispensable to the teleological nature of the process must be denied the instant it is affirmed in order for the process of alienation to be a process without a subject. The beginning of the logic is the theory of the non-original nature of the origin. Hegel's, Hegel's logic is the origin affirmed negated. End of quote. In a 62 text, Elements of Self-Criticism, self Althusser returns to the two works of 65 for Marx and Reading Capital in a critical manner, identifying a theoricist deviation. However, he rejects the accusation addressed at him from many sides of structuralism with aptly with, uh, with these famous words. If we never were structuralist, we can now explain why. We were guilty of an, an equally powerful and compromising passion. We were Spinozist. And he adds, we made a detour via Spinoza in order to improve our understanding of Marx philosophy, to be precise, since Marx's materialism forced us to think out the meaning of the necessary detour via Hegel, we made the detour via Spinoza in order to clarify our, our understanding of Marx's detour via Hegel. A detour, therefore, but with regard to another detour, 
at stake was something enormously important, the better understanding, uh, sorry, the better understanding of how and under what conditions a dialectic borrowed from the most speculative chapters of the great logic of absolute idealism can be materialist and critical. In Spinoza, anticipated repetition of Hegel, we try to see under what conditions a philosophy might produce effects useful to materialisms. End of quote. The expression anticipated repetition is extremely interesting. It adds something new in relation to reading capital. It means that only after and through Hegel, it is possible to grasp the theoretical meaning of Spinozian repetition. It's a kind of nachträglichkeit. And yet, without the dialectical mystification of the telos. And this is as much for the real process as for the process of knowledge. Spinoza likes, li like, uh, he repeats uh, his reading of Hegel's system as circle without end and beginning, and uh, he writes, Spinoza, like Hegel, rejects every thesis of origin, but with this difference, that within the void of the Gillian being, there exists, through the negation of the negation, the contemplation of a dialectic of a telos, a dialectic which reaches its goal in history. But Spinoza, because he begins with God, never gets involved with any tale, with any goal, which even when it makes its way forward in immanence, is still figure and thesis of transcendence. The tutor via Spinoza thus allows us to make out, by contrast, a radical quality lacking in Hegel. End of quote. It is precisely this radicality that allows Althusser to see Spinoza as the first and almost only witness of a causality capable of accounting for the efficacy of the whole over the parts and the action of the parts in the whole, a whole without closure, end of quote. As a, for the process of knowledge, Althusser evokes the famous phrase from the treatise of the emendation of the intellect, abemus enim ideam vera assigning great importance to that enim on which the whole phrase, phrase rests, which means rejection of the criterion. Whether the criterion is external or internal, in either, in either case, the criterion can be rejected, for it only represents a form of jurisdiction, a judge to authenticate and guarantee the validity of what is true. Once he has set aside the idealist temptation of theory of knowledge, Spinoza then says that what is true identifies itself, not as present, presence, but as product, in the double sense of the term production. Wow, it's very hot. <sighs> Why, it's a physical... Uh, <laughs> Here again, we have an anticipated repetition of Hegel, but more radical. Hegel certainly did rule out any criterion of truth by considering what is true as interior to its process, but he restored the credential of the truth as telos within the process itself, since each moment is only ever the truth of the moment which precedes it." End of quote. At the conclusion of the paragraph on Spinoza in, in the elements of self-criticism, Althusser emphasizes the theoretical price paid for this detour. A Marxist cannot, of course, make the detour via Spinoza without paying for it. Indeed, you cannot find in Spinoza what Hegel gave to Marx, contradiction. And th then there is an explanation of contradiction in uh, ideology and uh, uh, I, I leave aside, uh, okay, I leave aside also, uh, it is simple to be Marxist in philosophy where uh, basically Althusser repeats with some variation the argument of elements of cell critic. In the second half of the 17th, Althusser no longer returned to the purely theoretical issues involved in the Hegel-Spinoza relationship. We, he was engaged in the political battle against Euro communism and in defense of the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat in the PCF, evidently. There was a discussion on this topic. 
In the 80s, after the murder of his wife, Althusser disappeared from the public scene. Some of the texts written during those years were published posthumously in 1990 and 2000. In the underground current of materialism of the encounter, Hegel and Spinoza are opposed in front of the concept of void, a concept that Althusser places at the center of the so-called aleatory materialism. The reference to Hegel is extremely brief and marginal. Uh, th there is only one occurrence of Hegel. The work of the negative is a false parole. Uh, uh, is in French, false parole, I don't know. A, a, a word, a, a fake word, a fake, was a fake. Uh, it is a mystification of decisive philosophical meaning of the void. The reference to Spinoza, on the other hand, is central. I shall defend, uh, I quote, the thesis that for Spinoza, the object of philosophy is the void. This is paradoxical thesis in view of the great many concepts that are worked out in the ethics. Yet, we only need to notice how Spinoza begins. He confesses in a letter that some begins with the world and others with the mind of man. I begin with God. It's not a letter, it's a note taken by Leibniz after a conversation with Chernaus. But it's not important. All, all of them take a path that leads to God. Spinoza shuns this, these detours and deliberately takes up, this position, up his position in God. Hence, one can say that he, he occupies in advance the common fortress, the ultimate guarantee and last recourse of all his adversaries, by starting with the beyond which there is nothing. Is, uh, so, sorry, by starting, uh, I cut all, the, the, so, so it's very difficult. <laughs> by starting with the beyond which the, uh, there is nothing, is itself nothing. Saying that one begins with God or the whole or the unique substance and making it understood that one begins with nothing is basically the same thing, end of quote. This beginning from the whole, which is a beginning from nothing, reduce to nothingness not only God, uh, according to Althusser, and the theory of knowledge, but also religion, morality, which Spinoza destroys down to their imaginary foundations. The text is from uh, uh, 1982. It's very difficult for me to read the number in English. Three years later, in the only text entirely dedicated to Spinoza, and except from L'Avenir du Lontan, the opposition seems to disappear. Hegel and Spinoza are repeatedly juxtaposed, if not identified. Spinoza and Hegel have in common the paradox to be dogmatic philosopher who produce effects of liberation. Althusser adds, the systematic exposition has absolutely nothing contradictory about the philosophical effects produced. On the contrary, through the rigor of the concatenation of its reason, reasons, it can not only bring the space it intends to open closer, but render its production more fruitful for the freedom of the mind. End of quote. In this sense, Althusser establishes a perfect symmetry between the Descartes-Spinoza and Kant-Hegel relationship. It's a, it's a kind of a, a, a retrospective view, but uh, he, he, in reality, he, he creates something new. I drew, uh, I quote Althusser, a close, uh, I've more or less finished. Um, I drew a close parallel between Spinoza versus Descartes and Hegel versus Kant, showing that in both cases, what was at stake and what was being fought for was a subjectivist transcendental conception of truth and knowledge. The parallel went a, a long way, no more cogito in Spinoza, cogito or cogito, but only the factual proposition homo cogitat, cogitat, man thinks. No more transcendental subject in Hegel, but a subject as process. No theory of no knowledge in Spinoza, no theory of, no lo of knowledge in Hegel either. Whereas Descartes presents in the form a divine guarantee, a theory of guarantee of all truth, while Kant, for his part, produces a legal theory of knowledge. End of quote. Finally, a full 
Ident identification where previous writings had emphasized the opposition. Returning to the theory of the free generalities, Althusser writes, I quote, in this sense, which will be taken uh, up by Hegel and Marx, every process of, con uh, of knowledge goes from the abstract to the concrete, from the abstract generality to the concrete singularity. In my language, I had very crudely called this in uh, the passage from generalities one to generalities three via generalities two. It's, uh, if you want, we, we can uh, speak of that uh, then. I was mistaken uh, that the reality aimed at by knowledge was that of gen a generality. It was instead a universal singularity but it was in line with Spinoza ins insisting with Marx and Hegel on the distinction between the real concrete, the, that is the universal singular, and the concrete of thought, which constitutes knowledge of the third genus. So I, 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 I make a little conclusion. To conclude, I would try to propose a periodization of the interpretation of the relation Hegel-Spinoza in Althusser. The first period, the relation Spinoza-Hegel is read through Hegel and Kozhev lenses, and Hegel thought in the light of the concept of void of the origin as motor of the content. The second period, the second period begins in 60, 60s. The period of, for Marx and reading capital, the relation is read as an alternative, Spinoza or Hegel, who, Hegel come, uh, as in the book of, uh, in epistemology and in the theory of history and time. Of course, what is at stake here is another alternative, Marxist historicism or Marxist structuralism. The third period begins with a new interpretation of Hegel, 68, that is, in reality, a re-elaboration of some elements of his previous reading. This new reading produced a new reading of Spinoza as anticipated repetition of Hegel, an Hegel without tele tele teleology, which allows Althusser to take distance from a structuralist interpretation of Spinoza that ends up with the quasi Leibnizian concept of combinatory, he used in uh, reading capital. The fourth, if the fourth period, we have the application of the scheme of interpretation of the first tri triad, 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 of the great logic to the first part of the ethics. This application produces an oscillation between the relation of opposition between Hegel and Spinoza and relation of identification. If I have one minute, uh, uh, I, 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 uh, no, it's not like Balibar that then I spoke for an hour. I, it's <laughs> really one minute. Uh, but wait, a, a, a quick remark. The objection Althusser address to Spinoza in the dissertation the fact that Spinoza does not justify, justify explain in this system the, po the position of his own philosophy, go through all the uh, theoretical elaboration of the 70s. 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 Of course, the Hegelian answer couldn't satisfy Althusser because uh, he was an answer for, for him that was a, a, a sort of uh, absolute historicism. He tries to answer through a, t a theory of society, of course a conflictual theory of, so of society, which includes a reflection on the position it occupied in the society, uh, of the position occupied in the society by the theory. So it, a theory of the society which includes a reflection of the position uh, the theory of <laughs> the, the theory occupy in society. I hope uh, it, it's clear, but I'm not sure. It is what Althusser develops under the concept of topography and under the protection not of Spinoza, but of Machiavelli. Thank you.
questions. Lea Kuhar. Uh, I have a question regarding Marxism. Um, because as you already mentioned, uh, Althusser's own theory and both like reading Capital Collective was a certain intervention on um, political situation at the time. It was a critique of like French Communist Party, the critique of like the Soviet model. Uh, sorry, I, I, I didn't understand the, the title of the, of the work. Uh, you said Reading Capital Collective. The like ah, Reading Capital. Yeah, okay. Collective, yeah. Like Mesurei, Baribad, si. uh, yeah, students. Si. Um, so, uh, but what was interesting in this critique of the like, existing Marxist practices was that they were not anti-Marxist, uh, as Al Jazeera uh, um, says uh, himself, like we have to reread Marx, but they were like trying to be more Marxist than existing Marxism. So my question is, what does it mean to be more Marxist than existing Marxism through the lens of this your reading, uh, the shift from Hegel to Spinoza? And uh, the second question, like, how is this possible or what implication does this have for Marxism as a specific discourse? If it can be just read through different philosophies, like you we can read it through Hegel or we can read it through Spinoza and then critique uh, like this vi uh, vision. Like, is there a certain surplus like in Marxism or it's totally then reducible to different philosophies? And like, yeah, it's just like in general epistemological dilemma of Marxism. How can you see that? So uh, 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 what you ask is, uh, is an enormous uh, I know. problem I know. and there are, there uh, I, I try to give a simple uh, answer. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the the uh, the goal of uh, Althusser and his group in in this period was to 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 fight against uh, humanism, and uh, which was uh, according to Althusser a kind of. Uh, uh, um, Marxism, uh, but for bourgeois. It's a kind of uh, Eric Fromm uh, or something like that. Um, and historicism, historicism. So, uh, 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 of course, uh, the, the problem was to, to, to make a space uh, uh, in historicism in particular, and not in Gramsci, uh, who was a, a great uh, Thinker, but for example, in the Gramsci of Togliatti, in the, the ideology of the Communist Party, the, there was a total uh, annihilation of a theory in the ideology of the party. The direction of the party uh, uh, give uh, the, the, the line, and then all the intellectuals uh, take uh, positions. Uh, the, the idea, it, it, it was to radicalize uh, Marxism against, uh, uh, from one end, uh, uh, the humanism of uh, a, a sort of Marxist bourgeois or la page, and uh, from the other end, uh, uh, from this uh, kind of uh, totally annihilation of theory in politics. So to, uh, to, to try, but... Uh, it's a, it's multifaced. For example, if you read Mashre, Mashre, a terrible critic of Althusser and of the operation of reading capital, he says that uh, the philosopher of the Col Normal make a theory of science and uh, a thing to change the world, but it, it changed nothing. So it, it's it's a real, <laughs> it's a, it's a enormous problem and. Uh, uh, for example, you can see in it, uh, uh, in uh, the attack to humanism, also a critic of Khrushchev, uh, uh, of the limited critic of Khrushchev to Stalin. Uh, Althusser says clearly it's, uh, it's not sufficient uh, a moral critic to Stalin. I, we must uh, understand why the society has produced uh, this uh, 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 phenomenon. So uh, we, we, I, I think we can discuss uh, a week on this. It's, uh, it's, uh, and uh, for example, I, 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 I've heard uh, Balibar say, say, saying uh, that uh, uh, in reality was a kind of Stalinist position against uh, other positions, so Italian and other, it's uh, because uh, Torres and Mao were uh, 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 near, uh, um, uh, near more Stalinist, and so against Khrushchev. So it's it's very complicated. But okay, Anton Sadeshkin.
ሰርተን እንደምን ለማራ yeah so i don't know much about aldosera i should say um, but uh, what you uh, the way you characterize some of his uh, some what he, what he said that marx owes to hegel just struck me as a kind of a pretty strong misreading of hegel <laughs> uh, i mean several things i guess but one one thing is uh, um, that uh, history is a process without subject because which might be true for hegel but i think that the why like you say that yeah because the uh, history starts before uh, man because uh, it starts sort of from transition from logic to nature and then from nature to spirit but then i think in hegel it's pretty clear that the, those transitions are not in any way historical and in fact not uh, not temporal right so he says that uh, about the transition from logic to nature pretty explicitly and i think it's also See, of course also nature to to spirit uh, well uh, he says it's not natural but i think it's like implied there it's conceptual basically it's not uh, somehow some kind of actual historical process so yeah that seems like i, I know j just what may maybe would say something about this uh, the, you, you want my opinion on the on the uh, uh, for example uh, uh, i think what he, he I think he understands very good of, of Hegel is that uh, uh, the, the substance must become a subject, but it cannot become a subject and then stop, because if it, if it stop, it, it became a substance. So uh, it, it cannot stop in this sense uh, to, to be real a subject. And so it's a process. Uh, th this seems to me, but uh, I, I will not use the same argument of Althusser. Um, I, I, I don't think that uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, useful to use, uh, uh, uses the, the first tri triad or triad, uh, I, I say the two, so in any case I, I will understand, uh, of, of the logic to, 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 to say that. I, I, I would use, for example, Wechselwirkung. Wechselwirkung, it seems to me, a real critic of Ursache. Ursache. Uh, th there is no more uh, a cause, but there is a Wechselwirkung, a causa sui. Uh, in the encyclopedia, um, Hegel uh, 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 used the two together, uh, if I remember. It's, uh, it's a long time that I don't read Hegel. But, uh, um, and also for, for, for Spinoza, I wouldn't say Spinoza begins with God. It's not true. Spinoza does not begin with God. Uh, Spinoza built God uh, in the first part of the ethics. Uh, uh, he, he builds God, uh, departing from the, imagi the imaginary tradition, uh, the imaginary uh, Theological tradition. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. I like to uh, underline one point of your relation and ask you if you can say something more about that. Uh, because you quoted Althusser twice and uh, uh, with a sentence starting with Spinoza. So Spinoza is on the one side the, anti the anticipated repetition of Hegel but on the other side Spinoza is the only ancestor of Marx. So this is stunning for me because on the one side, so the side of the anticipated repetition, of course we can see a contradiction, but the point is on the uh, anticipated repetition, what we see is uh, the attempt to uh, go against the tradition of philosophy as such, the history tradition as such, which we know is one of the most interesting aspects of Althusser's way of reading uh, philosophers. Uh, on the other one, um, if we see Spinoza as an ancestor, it is quite straightforward. So Spinoza is before, is uh, historically before Marx, so it makes sense in a different way. So if you can stress see, see, this see, difference. See. And the second, the second aspect that I'd like your comment on uh, is about Kojève, um, because uh, it is true, in fact, that uh, Kojève uh, thinks that uh, Spinoza's uh, beginning is absurd. But in some way, he thinks also that Hegel's beginning is absurd. 
there is this beautiful quotation, I'll, I'll go by heart. He says, Spinoza's beginning is impossible because it has to be, it is impossible that he has written the ethics si, si, because si. it needs to be God from the very beginning in order to be able to write down the ethics. On the other hand, Hegel has to become God to be able to write down the phenomenology. So si. if, you, if you'd like to, to comment on this, thank you. Allora, um, sorry. <laughs> okay, I, I, I hope not to have. But the the two the two um, uh, affirmation are of two different periods. Um, of, I, I've not quoted all because I was cutting all the night. So uh, um, when he say is is the only ancestor in uh, reading capital, uh, he says, but uh, Marx does not know Spinoza. Uh, knows very little Spinoza. So I, it's not uh, uh, a, a, a kind of reconstruction of Spinoza as a source, it's a, it's a gesture that uh, has a, 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 a sort of... Uh, uh, the, there is a kind of lyric about Spinoza in uh, Reading Capital. He, he says um, very little but in a lyrical way, he is a great revolution. And uh, um, a lyric of theory, of course, not. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, um, in, uh, in the second, uh, in, the se in um, elements of autocritic, um, is in my view, is reconstructing the past, but modifying it, of course. The, it, it is, is a, uh, uh, he's saying, I was doing that, but uh, he's changing the terms so to he was doing. Because he, he says, uh, in reality, what we saw in Spinoza, we, 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 we saw in Spinoza because uh, Spinoza is a repetition of Hegel, so only through Hegel we can um, we can see the true Spinoza. About uh, uh, I don't know what to say about that uh, about Kojev. Uh, it's yeah, it's uh, <laughs> Hegel. Uh, I, I say always to my student that it it can be. It can appear a little bit stupid for a man to say I'm the point uh, of the, de the the most high point of the de development of humanity, but it was the first uh, <laughs> that has said that, and he, he was the first that uh, puts himself at the highest point of uh, the Weltgeschichte. So he invented the the Weltgeschichte, and so it's it's not so stupid. Uh, the, it's a great uh, gesture. Okay. So, okay. I don't know. Is there time for one more question? Ci vorrebbe un. Okay. I just wanted to express my um, tremendous gratitude um, for all the organizers, um, technical crew, speakers, all the audience that was with us here, and uh, for all of those who were with us online uh, for, um, uh, for uh, working together these three days. And, um, it was it was wonderful and let's do some more work please thank you